and Fallen Aces. Those are games you should play. They're both published by New Blood. That's not a game. It's a publisher. Ultra Kills, the best FPS I've ever played. Uh, yeah, play it. Is it? No. I think so. Cheap, too. Not it's not finished game. yet, so hold off if yeah, that's a problem. Really what's uh, what's so Aces. cool about it? Hmm? Um, it's taking everything that's like neat about Devil May Cry and everything that makes like fast paced arena shooter gameplay fun and sort of putting them together into this environment that is extremely rewarding to experiment with and has extremely strong presentation. Well, all right. Ultra kill. Does it have a fun well, announcer like, that uh... says Ultra Kill? Um no. Oh, Oh, count me out. I'm sorry. Ooh. I was considering feels it. Like, uh, it one anymore. of the feels like an example of what is becoming more prominent, which is the that uh, in the same way that pixel art has kind of been embraced. Well, not even kind of as as absolutely been embraced as a uh, as a as an art style that um sort mm -hmm. of like the early you know nineties. 3D graphics, like the PlayStation graphics. That Does that sort of even thing feel like a novel thought there, Fringy? I feel like I heard you say that two years ago. I have, I have said it, but <laughs> I just want to be like, it. You're allowed to Fun. say things every two years. All right. Next, yeah. I'll see you in I'm two years. On... <laughs> it's the Gwimbly likes, you know? It is. I'm working, I'm working on some categories for a game award show, and in every draft of my categories, I have both a 2D art and 3D art award. Because I, I do think they should be in distinctly of... honored the art direction for a particular 2d and 3d game that yeah well like uh, the the art for those games in the uh, games nominated against each other in those styles specifically right, yeah. as opposed to technical and artistic which i was always like eh. You're, they're never talking about performance with technical which is why i hate it when they call that technical it's just which one looks the prettiest and is 3d and mm -hmm. eh. uh, i want to be a little more specific but you know it's still it's still doing rough well i mean there's a lot of ways that you would want better categories for the game awards <laughs> in terms of See giving I mean, winning best yeah, fighting yeah. game no <laughs> what, what was it the best game powered by fueled by mountain dew uh, that we, was, can't that rid, was, we can't get rid of that uh, one we have to keep that one and the game fueled by mountain dew yeah and then i think eventually because they didn't do mountain dew so much with the game awards but wasn't there the the shaving brand what was it the, the one where they had like the shake, yeah, yeah the that's Hydro right robot, robot. The, yeah the famous one Dude, <laughs> best that video shit. game to buy many bags of Doritos too. I mean, really, the, <laughs> the Game Awards has the fundamental problem that um a lot of people are there for trailers. They have expectations that are mm -hmm. really high. Like the expectation is that you're going to get like E3, you know, uh, like it's like E3 level. Oh, look at these big like game announcements. Whereas. Like the Academy Awards, I mean, I think they show trailers there, but like people are there generally to see who won. <laughs> like it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, it feels like a fundamental problem that the Game Awards is always going to struggle to uh, overcome because for as much flack as they got, and I think it's fair that they had to please wrap it up after like thirty seconds. Like, oh yeah, yeah. sorry guy, <laughs> you want to talk for a minute about this <laughs> game that you made and you poured your life into? Like as much as that's really um, embarrassing that they were telling people to wrap it up that quickly. They do have the problem that a lot of people are there just to see what games are going to get announced for, like, next year and the year after. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People it's like uh, Stutter and Craig, who runs Side Scrollers. John and I have both been on that show a couple times now, and, um, yeah, he's uh, he's doing a different model with it that doesn't involve yeah, ads. Good job. So, but yeah, so check that out if you want. But uh, my goal, though, is to make the categories not shit. Is your microphone any what weaker than usual there, Mark? He's a little uh, quieter. He's a little quieter. He's quiet. How's yeah. this? Is that better? I don't know. Because you said two words. Based off of the words of two words that you give us? Oh, Why I do mean, people I do that? that? I don't know, Rex. I don't <laughs> I, know. I don't well, know. But people well, always do it. Uh, I, I, I did have a reason for doing that. Because if I was too loud, I didn't want to keep talking. That's right. It'll blow ears. your eardrums out. Well, that yeah, and then you yell. would say, Why did you say less, Mark? That's what you'd be saying. Yeah, you should have said no words. Then there would have been and no risk at all. Yeah. Yeah. True. But no, no profit either. This is the power of moderation, aren't it? All right, sounds sounds good. I think I'll keep an eye on chat for uh, how people feel about ups and downs. But to address three enormous controversies: number one, where Wait. is Glidus? Well, I invited him, and I tried to make it work because he couldn't make it to today for a few days, either before, or after, or some other week. But um, I'm afraid he said he was maximized on busyness, the work he's doing. He did did give me a. Fair explanation of all the stuff he's up to, because he's 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 on his 
like 150 percent workload because this is his whole channel is game of thrones house of dragon Shleems. he's doing a lot of stuff with alt shift right, so. yeah now is the we wanted the him time, right? but we couldn't get him i'm so sorry but I, I said to him is it possible we can get him for the end of the season and he said you'll do everything you can to make it to that so hopefully Hooray. we'll grab him then all second right. he's made enormous... a promise that he has to meet you heard it here Second enormous controversy. Uh, where's Ryan? He's a House of the Dragon fan. Well, one, not available on Saturdays specifically, which I think is hilarious. Mm -hmm. um, sure. All right. I, yeah, know, I was going to yeah. say, all, all right. right, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jiminy <laughs> Willikers, all right. Okay. But secondly, um, I do a weekly show with him and Gary about House of the Dragon, so it, it feels weird to double up, I suppose, on a lot of the conversations that he and I would have already had. Uh, this is a whole new set here. Uh, excluding sometimes Fringy, if uh, if he if he graces that uh, that stream with his presence, but um yeah it, it, I think it makes more sense. And then the third enormous controversy: why is this stream happening now, when we could be doing a boogie cringe stream? Well, you know what? Maybe next week. <laughs> <laughs> we can't let him take House over and celebrate House of no Dragon. There's no match for Boogie Cringe. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many posts in like every forum like, you guys have got to be covering what's happened with him recently, right? It's like, ooh, well, <laughs> it's very tempting because uh, yeah, his, his latest blunder might be the worst of his entire career. I think it's actually safe to say it, it is. It might actually be. I, th I think it is Well, what would compare? I don't think there's anything that can. I mean, the the Boogie documentary was a big one, but that was mostly <laughs> telling us stuff we already kind of knew. Yeah, it was just him being cringe to himself, you know? Um, the, the lightest controversy is demonstrated, no, you can continue to fall, actually. Yes, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you've not hit rock bottom yet. He falls under the barrel, through the floor, into the core of the earth, and then just continues <laughs> into, the, into the abyss. There's something event. past the core of the earth that he's... Fell fallen into God is like, you actually passed the abyss. Nobody is supposed <laughs> to be able to do that. You're, you're further down. How'd you do you're that? clogging like... up the abyss. <laughs> God's like fr frantically trying to code something. Yeah. <laughs> I don't next. have anything down there, man. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. I got to get the Bogey... beta test for the last universe. <laughs> Pull, dredge those back up. <laughs> what if oh, God. He, he went naked live on screens. camera. He did. So that he, yeah. Well, to be fair, yeah. he went it naked in order to prove he had cancer. That makes sense. It didn't work out. I thought out. he went naked because he wanted to hop on the whole the Twitch thing with uh, <laughs> as long as it's censored, right? Didn't he do that? <laughs> well, the thing is, I feel like he doesn't need to get. We're naked confusing the times he was naked on camera. Um, this is madness. If not to derail us, but, but like he goes <laughs> naked, and then Mister Medicker is like, "Go the whole way, show your cock," and then he says, "Well, no, I'm not going to do that because I could get these guys in trouble," meaning he knew. That he could get naked and there'd be no trouble because you can't see anything because of the folds. Like it covers up everything. It's like a little safety shield. He knew that. That's why he <laughs> a did it. Safety shield. When you're so fat, you cannot be nude. Yeah, he cannot be. <laughs> <laughs> he can only it's like be naked. Peter with Griffin, that. whenever he has a nude <laughs> yeah. scene. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, and, you know, maybe in a week's time we'll have an ending to the story that we can talk about on the stream as well. Because uh, I don't know what the fuck is happening in these next few days. People, because you know the whole thing is like, when does he come back? And everyone's probably putting bets on it. Uh, you would have thought one day would be already too much, but uh, maybe it'll be, maybe it'll be two, maybe three. So he's he's gone radio silent. I think he deleted what? his Twitter, and the last I heard was oh, the. Really? Uh, I don't know if he's getting like Keemstar said he's getting another test to prove he has cancer, which the whole point was that he was supposed to have proof already. <laughs> like, I, I, I don't think know he, how he's you actually. Can be... So he's getting a biopsy, which which will be yes. like an actual definitive test. Well, his test size, he's going to need a triopsy. Nice. I think it, <laughs> that's funny. At, at this point, though, I believe he's on, the only positive, quote, quote, that he has is blood markers, which are more like potential for cancer rather than you Oh, well, we're not going to go over the full cancer. story now because we'll no. do it next week. But um, the, yes, there's, there's a lot of things to it. But the, the broad statement is Boogie lied about his cancer and it enabled him to scam his audience with crypto coins. It's in a weird a way that even sentence. if he does have cancer, he still did lie about it. <laughs> well, no, so th this is why it's uniquely tragic now, because he may he may have cancer and it won't help him in this, because that wouldn't yeah, change like that's, anything. That's what I mean. Yeah. So he, yeah, everyone just... believes that he's lying. He's already set himself up. He's put himself in a position where everyone thinks that he's lying with how he's behaved about it. 
Oh, I guess what I'm saying, Rags, to be absolutely clear is he could have cancer and we'd all say, yep, he definitely has cancer and he'd still be a liar because that would be post uh, yeah. him claiming he, he has it when he didn't have yeah, enough yeah, proof yeah. for it. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah, absolutely. So he's like, he's... He's the, already he, fucked. You couldn't have rolled worse. <laughs> like, he's got the... He got, he, the, the thing is, he got no... He, he got all of the... Uh, how, how to phrase it? He got none of the benefits of having cancer. <laughs> If he got cancer, you know? He, but my god, Rags, he tried to get all the benefits of having cancer. Boy, he sure did. I swear to you, what kills me is he's the kind of guy who's going to live to, like, 95, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> He'll yeah. be, like, Baron Harkonnen in his little mud, his yeah. little black school. <laughs> Not even like, pulling like a Randy Mr. Marsh Burns is going to save him at this point, where doorway. he sticks his head in the microwave trying to That's give all the himself beams cancer. Have been, people have been saying he's probably <laughs> spending the weekend putting his balls in a microwave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Also, like yeah, sorry, we we system. should be discussing, but what he said, his doctor <laughs> might have made up the diagnosis for clout. <laughs> 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 Jesus. That is now that's internet risking brain your rot. medical license for boogie clout. Blo boogie clout, yeah, man. <laughs> what could be sweeter than boogie clout? It's like a Doctor's sweet like, yellow tangerine, you know. <laughs> doctor's like vlogging on YouTube. He's trying to get his clout. <laughs> it's just stupid. Oh, and then the, uh, like, little clout man. The 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 conversation with Coffeezilla where he's screaming, "You liar, Adam! Like, you liar!" <laughs> if you know it's anything about medicine, primitive. you'd know he's lying in that interview because basically what he says, he's like, "So my kind of cancer, it's it's made a lot worse when you're overweight. So basically, to not have cancer, I have to get pills that help me lose weight." And I'm just like, "Oh, he's just trying to get a prescription for Ozempic." Probably. And saying it's cancer. Mm. I thought he did start Ozempic. I remember him tweeting about it, but you can't keep track. The, the amount of lies that well, man uh, tells. Well, maybe he's trying to pay for it, rather. So, yeah, maybe he lies. got the prescription, and these are the meds he's talking about. He's just talking about meds that prevent him from being fat, which uh, seem, it seems like they're working. Well, there's going to be a lot of the use of the word only joy in life next week, I think. Uh the comment <laughs> section in chat, but we'll see. I imagine that might be a 10 man EFAP. So many people are going to want to guess on that one because this, and you know, we're bringing ER back. Boogie's my <laughs> favorite House of the Dragon character. <laughs> he would fit right in. Could you imagine David meeting? Oh, Vigar. dude, if, if Boogie Lord, were yeah, uh, like the, the Lord of Harrenhal and, um, and, <laughs> the Lord and of David, David met him, <laughs> he cannot control his bowels. No one respects him. <laughs> His cock doesn't work. How is it you reach this size? Like, oh, it's a, it's a lot of it's a lot of illnesses. My... It's a lot of uh, genetic. Illnesses. I've got a thyroid uh, thing. I have I have all the thyroids. I have many thyroids. <sighs> it swells me up like a balloon. It does. <laughs> well, we should probably get started because we got around four hours to talk about. So think of it as a very long movie. Um, but uh, plenty, plenty of fun, fun scenes to discuss. Um, I was considering going with the whole, like, oh, what did everyone think? But I, I assume that'll become very clear the more we talk about it in detail and that everyone here thought it was pretty good. Is, is that different for it's, anybody? Well, it's no boogie cringe, but no. pretty good. That's true. It yeah. is very, very interesting. I guess a lot of us are probably thinking it here and then in the audience, but it's very strange to be watching this show alongside the acolyte mm -hmm. every week but in the same sense what a... it's not strange because last time around it was uh, against rings of power rings of power time. yeah you're right oh, arguably, yeah, you're right. <laughs> because that was like a what i say that's one to one i guess in a way you, there's comparisons to be made of the like we said there's this weird connections down to the episode numbers of events that um, take place I think the interesting thing more so is that House of the Dragon was um, essentially, in season one, it was fighting to establish itself. It was kind of, it was, you know, before they both came out, even though obviously people were a lot more negative in terms of their expectations for Rings of Power, it was a case of two shows essentially competing to establish which one was the premier fantasy TV show, yeah. House of the Dragon 1. <laughs> now it's like the reigning champion coming in, and then the acolytes coming to challenge it and failing. Can you imagine that? The balls of the acolyte being like, well, first off, yeah, I guess, well, Bo, the, there's, um, there's a, there was a lot of comparison between House of the Dragon and uh, the first season and Rings of Power because they're both like, they're both fantasy shows with some magic in there, some mythological creatures. We got our swords and our armor, and that's fun. 
And they're also sort of um, in the way that House of the Dragon is showing up also, uh, after a Game of Thrones. You have Rings of Power coming out trying to be like Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Uh, so there's another parallel there. So the two were very much easy to sort of juxtapose to against yeah, one another. And you could argue, I know this sounds ridiculous, but it was like almost a fair fight in terms of they were both given a huge budget, all the potential budget, they needed. Great and, IP. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and one of them comes I... from a beloved series of films that, that we all like had people sus on the show. But, you know, it's not the same as House of Dragon where I had to fight actual sentiment of fuck you. You're the one that came after season eight of Game of Thrones. Yeah. 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 I, and I actually think that that might have worked in both of their favors inversely. Because I think the people making Rings of Power are just like, we're Lord of the Rings, it doesn't matter. We can do whatever we want and it's going to be great and loved. Whereas House of the Dragon's like, look, we got to take this real seriously, okay? It They're does, yeah, this. I think you're right. This is bad. Yeah. There was a sort of, there's a sort of arrogance with Rings of Power that they could write whatever shitty story with shitty characters that they wanted to. And the, the, the what comes home to roost? Chickens. The chickens would never come home to roost. Um, yeah. Whereas... I think Cox. you are right. These uh, these Wings of Power guys, they were like, guys, we we can't fuck up. We got to really make this work. Because, yeah, you are fighting the Season 8 Game of Thrones uh, hatred, quite frankly, that has lingered to this day uh, as ultimately and unfortunately, but understandably, the defining element of that entire long series of television. Well, the idea of that show, like the acolyte, poses a challenge to something like House of the Dragon, is just <laughs> embarrassing. Like, like funny. They're, well, so they both look. Not you almost want to do away. High contrast. You want to do away with the pretense with the people who make this stuff. If you had them in the same room, like the you know Ryan Connell and uh, uh, Leslie Headland, you might you might want to be like you like you understand the difference between you two's shows, right? Both of you, and then he'd be like, no, no, no yeah, they're both really great exploration. And it was like, no, right, stop, stop. You understand, right? The the difference, like hers is a fucking laughable mess. And yours, you've worked extremely hard <laughs> to like, you know, I have my criticisms, but at the same time, it's just, you understand, it's completely different leagues. And I just, I really want them to be shot with the honest ray so they can both say, you know, like, there's no way someone who makes this can't recognize when watching the Acolyte, like, ugh, ooh, they really cut corners yeah. on this, huh? Just the difference in care for the craft, or like, passion for it, on display. Well. It's an element <laughs> of, um, it's like what we talk about with, um... I, I, a great way to contrast, you know, the Acolyte and uh, uh, House of the Dragon. Not to make this like this versus this as an episode, but it's really tough to not draw comparisons for a number of reasons. But we talk about opportunities in terms of what kinds of stuff you can do with the time that you have and with every interaction. And whereas House of the Dragon seems to be just completely filled with stuff going on in terms of subtext and what this means and this conversation, that conversation, establishing relationships, learning more about the world. Um, the Acolyte is kind of the opposite, where we spend huge swaths of time learning absolutely nothing, and half of the things we learn are just being reminded of stuff we've been told before. Correct. Uh, to get started, unless there's anything people want to say, just sort of opening it in general about House of the Dragon, we can get to more specifics. I think it's a and really cool television show. <laughs> I really I like neat. it. I am looking um, forward to seeing the episodes every week, and I'm excited when they come out. I suppose um, what we have here for covering episodes one through four feels like a... I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a good package, because the first three episodes of the season are definitely more, like, slower paced. They're trying to build things up. It's an interesting contrast between season one and two, because season one is jumping between different points in time that are like sort of flash points for important events happening and so in that sense all of those ones have a a greater significance compared to now in season two this is much more conventional of, of just seeing the story play out at a um and more of a regular pace and so the first three episodes are definitely you know building things up establishing important plot elements going forward developing the characters and then it all came to a head in episode four, which is um, one of the best episodes of the show. Like, it's competing with episode eight from season one as the uh, the best episode of the show. It was a really fantastic episode. Yes, it was. And we'll talk all um, about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, yeah, it's a pretty big uh, bit of praise. I would say that after seeing the fourth, it brings the first three into 
view as like a, I see one, two, three, four now as a pretty solid little uh, package, a nice hearty meal. I think so, yeah. And uh, they yeah. really do a great job establishing stuff. Yeah, um, it's gonna be fun looking it, back and being like, oh, that 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 thing, and that do that that. Even though there's plenty yeah. of things we don't know yet, because the season is only half done. Some people are like, oh why are you goodness. waiting for the full season to be done? Well, because that would too mean much we'd to have, talk about. we'd have eight hours, and that, but that point is is uh, Rings of Power coming out at that at that time then as well. Uh, it's coming out, isn't it? Coming out in August. It's, it'll be close, August. and then we've got uh, we're, we're behind on a lot of things, and then we come to our anniversary stream too. Basically, we're gonna try and get this done uh, half of it now. <laughs> we'll do half later, and that'll be a little bit more easier. But uh, hey, it's hey. Coming out in, yeah, it's coming out at the end of August. Damn. <laughs> can have some fun with maybe some speculation along the way you know oh agatha is agatha out soon no uh, i think it's september oh, what the God. fuck is an agatha i know oh, wait wait, wait agatha? I, keep, I keep hearing about it what? well i don't i i'm not saying we're definitely to. covering it i'm not saying that i'm just saying yeah, good. Don't, don't don't say that watch it. don't say that yeah don't yeah i'm not saying it's definitely yeah. <laughs> good so, you I think that's the one it. that went through a number of different title changes. Yeah, which was yeah, like, really cringe. Uh, <laughs> Agatha, they were gonna go Agatha, with the ooh, title ooh, witchy Wanda, woman. Let's face it. It's it's a it's a show about Agatha from WandaVision, and I like that the title's oh. called Agatha all along. Because if you ask somebody who's a big fan, you should ask them. What did she do all along? What what did what 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 was Agatha? <laughs> yeah, she had, like, what no did she do? <laughs> Ringy's oh. like ask it's people just, why the show's called that. It's just it's, it's so just, funny it's, from my perspective because I keep hearing about the show spoken in like hushed, disgusted tones, but I have no idea what it is. It's just this thing that's looming on the horizon well, that nobody cares one about. Of those, um, one of those Marvel projects that if they could make the decision on whether they would make it today, it wouldn't exist. It wouldn't yeah. exist. Um, no, no, no. It's it just like Ironheart's probably in the same position as well. It's just like these shows that they were in when they were announced, you know, it's like, oh yeah, exciting. Um, but now, now that Marvel is, uh, in a bad place, it's like, oh shit, all right, yeah, Agatha, woohoo, yay! <laughs> Agatha, she conjured the, uh, the speedster dude by just putting a necklace on a guy. Just gave him full-blown Quicksilver powers, that's, I guess, something. They're not gonna remember that, and it will never mm -hmm. pop up. Yeah. You saying that probably jump-started many people's memories into ultimately what came down to a, what was it, like a pun, a penis joke or something? Are we, are we oh, sullying House of the Dragon by even spending any time on I only remember it in the context of... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's probably. Right. <laughs> probably a little bit. Well, uh, first question on the docket, here we are, is... What did everyone think of the new intro? I love the new intro. It being a medieval mm -hmm. tapestry is so so very nice. I uh, think the last one was fine, too. I wish they would get a piece of music, but... I wish they had their own do? music, yeah, but... Yeah, oh well. what can you Coat do at this point? I guess? Do you think they... Do you think they could change it down the line now still, or do you think they've Well, like, well maybe the better question is, legally, they cannot change it. Uh, maybe it's... That's, maybe that's true. And, mm. uh, you know, it, it's it's gonna be in all the Game of Thrones or A Song of Ice and Fire content, maybe. Like, all shows will have that intro, which I think would be a shame. Uh, mm -hmm. Especially for tone setting but... and unique-ifying it. That's a word, don't check. Uh, so, mm. yes, this was... I was at first I was like, wait, what? And then I was like, oh, ooh, oh, okay, oh, wow. Because a lot of this is history that is like the lore of this show, even though this yeah. show acts as lore for Game of Thrones. I like it because uh, the show seems very thematically concerned with history, even if only through, like, not exclusively, but primarily through Viserys, it was at the time. And uh, tapestries like these are a large part of how history would exist. Mm -hmm. So. Well, and it's cool that all the threads are written with blood. It's a, mm -hmm. a neat little thing. And the fact that this that. tapestry is changing mm -hmm. as the season progresses is always going to be... That like, was cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is it? I do like to see that. Yeah. I'm stop skipping it the does intro. change, yeah. It's a great detail. They put so much effort into it. And it's it's quite eerie to see some of the, the season's more jarring moments be immortalized in a certain, you know... The stitching yeah, dude, the, style. The threads that go through uh, Jaehaerys' yeah. neck is just like, oh... Yeah. Oh well. Yeah, like that was a thing that happened, and you can't take it back. It's history now. Yeah, and it is. I think a, there's a bizarre feeling of watching, it's, you know, watching history unfold. But rather, like when it's in present and everyone's just taking action, you don't, you don't think about the dude in the castle who's writing this stuff in a book. 
it's, it's, it's all just sort of mm-hmm. someone's mm-hmm. writing it down it's yeah. all getting recorded it's so people remember and then that gets passed down Which and I guess told in and certain senses are because isn't the idea that the book it's based on is uh accounts of um of what happened oh yeah, yeah. i should probably saying... clear this up so that the the source this is based on is three sources put together two maesters and a, mm-hmm. a jester um their accounts of, of different things so it's unreliable as to what exactly happened and um as much as it acts as a companion slash a different version i think george has said it's different continuity like definitively they don't coexist um which i think makes sense and simultaneously you're not going to hear any spoilers for anything past episodes one through four of season two of house of the dragon however i can't account for chat you know they're free and, and i would just be careful about spoilers in there I've seen a lot of people like to discuss and speculate based on what is written in the Fire and Blood sort of histories. Yeah, it it would be a fun thing to do. But I have said, uh, in case anyone wants to know, and I don't know if everyone here shares this perspective or not, but I really want to enjoy this story from this format. I could go and Mm, read. I agree. But um, I'm very much enjoying the the intrigue and setup and speculation of this. If I knew a bunch of like, oh, did you know this person dies this way? It It wouldn't be that satisfying to me compared to seeing it unfold in this. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yeah, the you books are there. If we not... want to read the books, we can go and do that if we wish. Also, do not rewatch Game of Thrones. There is a there's a pretty big House of the Dragon spoiler in Game of Thrones dialogue. Well, there's a handful of them, I assume, in reference to. Oh, Technically, it's one, a spoiler. Like, direct, the second direct fate of a named character, though. It's not something you want to hear. Trust me. Well, what I'm getting at is just there's a couple of uh, spoilers inherently by seeing any event of Game of Thrones, the world as it stands. If you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Oh, I know. Like, I mean, that stuff's obvious because it's a prequel, but I'm saying, like, a character is talking about the the, the Dance of the Dragons as if it's a historical story, names one of the named characters on this show, and then it explains their death. So, it, like, it, it's, it will be a big spoiler, trust me. And if you forgot it, that's good. Well, anyway... Uh, um, another thing on the, the title sequences is, I think, like, the the idea of a or the visual of a drop of blood hitting fabric and then just spreading out and like consuming everything that's on the thing is such a, like a powerful, effective metaphor. Well, yeah, blood show. is infamously yeah. one of the, a very difficult thing to get out of uh, fabric. So <laughs> it would, you yeah. know, it works in a variety of ways. But a colorful. single drop of blood can cause very so much colorful. more bloodshed. Yeah. yeah. The writers have a lot to say on the nature of conflict and the way it escalates and consumes even the reasons it was fought, like it began in the first place, through imagery like that, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's an episode I would imagine it would be arguable the theme of it was to make that point that probably the whole show is making, but... um, I was going to say, the uh, season one's intro, I was still fond of it, just the... um, Having blood raining down of the model of old Valyria was was kind of cool, and and the uh, the easy way to draw that the blood is to represent blood lines, but also the the carnage to come, and that it is in season one. And um, man, seeing what happens to a certain a certain model in episode two is uh, very sad. You know, we'll get there in a moment. That is sure. sad. But, um, yeah, that uh, is sad. Hard to watch. Mm. Addy even commented on it on Instagram or whatever. <laughs> like, he posted yeah, a meme. He did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, in a meme. It was hard for you. Cyrus worked That's so hard funny. on that. He really did. He did. Well, all right. And so the show begins, and they give us our first scene in the North, which, uh, for those who have not seen Game the of North. Thrones, a lot of people were very like, oh, because the Stark theme comes on. It's been a while, you know, which is it's just <laughs> funny to me because it's got nostalgia value now. Even though back when season eight was coming out, there was plenty of fucking scenes classic in the North. Classic Game of Thrones. Yeah, you know, it, I, I guess it evokes classic Game of Thrones rather than newfangled, horrifying Game of Thrones, um, <laughs> which is nice. Back in the back in the good times, and uh, back before the dark, the dark times. Yeah. <laughs> the... And we see a kindly little raven who's probably holding the news that uh, a certain Luke is dieted. We're just catching up to where uh, Jake would be, which timeline-wise, I'm not even. It's. Uh, I think this would I be don't fine. I think we know because. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's 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 very much up to imagination of, of how exactly how quickly uh, he would have been found, or rather, how quickly they found because they didn't find the wing yet. They find that in episode uh, in halfway through this episode, I think. The yeah. flight would be a yeah. couple weeks. 
I think like like his journey from Dragonstone to Storm's End was about two weeks, I think. I think there was. Uh, so I imagine a raven back. would fly at a, a raven would fly at a comparable speed, though. I imagine, right? The like, dragon? I mean, the dragon? The dragon? No. Is that fair to say? I don't know. I mean, no, it's going to be way slower. The, yeah, I mean, so like I'm saying at a minimum, I'm saying there's no chance the raven is going to be faster than the dragon. Is that what you're so saying? How, okay, yeah. Well, however okay. long it took Luke to get out there, it will take more time to get back because we're the information is traveling via raven, not dragon. Well, and you went to the veil first um, with the consideration of, of how everything is mm. flowed out. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I don't know. It is weird seeing... You see the wall, you get the establish. They even establish the rules of how people end up there, and they clearly make it an important place. And the thing people were talking about was, um, uh, they 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 mention how dragons, when they first visited Aegon and his uh, sister, they they couldn't cross the boundary boundary of the wall, which is not something that happens in Game of Thrones, which is in the books. And so people started to like speculate of, wait a minute. Is this is this like a different oh, continuity? Actually, I was wrong about that. Apparently, it's four to six hours. I was totally wrong. That's okay. Forty six hours. Oh my goodness. Four to six. So oh, wait, wait that's shorter. I, I must be mixing it up from another dragon flight time given in four. Four to six hours on dragon back from Dragonstone to the north. Storm's end. Storm's end. Oh right. Yeah, how, Storm's end's much closer. Okay. Track. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Having me worried there for a second because I know that Westeros Sorry, is supposed to be like chat. comically massive. It's like the size of South America. It's pretty Apparently. big. Is that comically massive, South America? <laughs> uh, in terms of... To the English. If you, went to the, if you went to the... To all the South Americans in chat, Theo didn't mean that. All right? You're hey, fine people. I mean, in terms of... You live of, on a lovely <laughs> continent. In terms of a medieval domain, okay? Well, how big yeah, is... Uh, uh, how big is Middle Earth? Oh, you it's know. like Europe, right? About yeah, Europe-sized, like England, isn't it? isn't it? Isn't it supposed to be Great Britain? I think like it's like Europe-sized. Like land mast? What, Middle Earth? Mass? Yeah, Middle Earth is supposed to be like Europe-sized. I don't know about it. Is it? I don't know about that, um, but... Middle Earth also oh, isn't unified in the same way. Yeah. It, um, didn't he want it to be English mythology, though? Wasn't that the whole deal? I don't know that that means he wanted it to be exactly the size and length of... Yeah, um, I Britain. want to give oh, myself okay, some room to work with here. Yeah. Anyway, uh, he talks about how important the wall is, and he says it keeps out death, which uh, there's just so many... They are correct references and important foundational building for what will be Game of Thrones, but it's just, it's always sad to hear the references. Every time. Because you remember what it became. You're like, oh man. Uh, it's, like thinking, it's like thinking about a dead relative. These are the sort of call forwards that should be appreciated and like should work if they hadn't fumbled so very hard towards yeah. the tail end. It's almost it's so respectful of them to do it, even though all the audience is like, hmm. I mean, <laughs> I totally yeah. Props to him for treating it with respect yep. and dignity. Um, yeah. I I think that I, especially if you're in the position of you're writing a a prequel to something that has a sort of reputation, it's like well you know, what do you do? It's probably just the high road to treat it reverently that you should just generally just default to doing. I mean, even if you were going to make a prequel to the sequel trilogy, you know what I mean when I say that, um, but you would maybe want to, you know, at least treat it seriously. And so, I wouldn't uh, even characterize the, uh, the eighth season as a fumble. Like, they clearly, they were done, suicide. the showrunners, and they, they wanted, the like, it's like they threw the ball down. They spiked it down. <laughs> <laughs> and then the ball bounced right up in their face. <laughs> they gave it to, uh, they gave the ball to Boogie as he was descending past the abyss. <laughs> <They were> like, <laughs> uh, Boogie into the abyss! Said, That's how you're ruining me. <laughs> as Boogie's falling, he just sees something, and they hand him a ball, like, on like the way Elrond down. Elrond is saying, yeah. destroy it! No. <laughs> um, so, uh, he's... The Starks have promised uh, Rhaenyra Greybeards, which are old dudes who have kind of lost somewhat of their use at the Wall slash at the North and can be spared, but simultaneously are probably not to be fucked with because they're like super veterans. Very experienced yeah. and yeah. quite wise. Yeah. Old they've night, seen uh, some things. Unless they've recently been sent or joined there, um, if they're old, it means they've been through some shit. Yeah, uh, I I think there is actually more of a specific meaning than just old for Greybeards in the world of Westeros, but the point is we will likely see them in some way, shape, or form eventually in an important way. And uh, it was kind of funny, Jake, the actor for Jaceris, is like definitely aged in uh, the time we've seen him, in, which is technically weeks, or rather yeah. even a week. And it's just a That's reality. That kind of threw me off a little bit at first. Yeah. 
It's, it's something like this is why you have to because Gary uh, talks about how they need to make sure this show as soon as it starts a show like this is like yearly you want to do yearly uh, not just for the actors ages but for the the audience retention and investment and the build up the momentum but that is definitely a problem Stranger Things had this in spades it's so hilarious how the cast have completely aged out of the timeline but they're desperately trying to argue it's like yeah it's fine <laughs> if you just, if we just kneel down <laughs> when we film your scenes it should be okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess the, the the standard used to be cast like twenty five year olds to play high school students anyway. So I guess Stranger Things. Yeah, but then they age into forty year olds, like... and then it's like, hmm, no, it's yeah, pushing well, it. I don't know. Uh, Buffy was smart enough to have them like not be in high school for the whole show. No, the the trick is to hire like super young and then destroy their whole lives, and then documentaries get made later <laughs> yeah. on that you can make money from. Um. Yeah, the drugs will keep them youthful. So. With that news arriving, we go back to Dragonstone. Maylis and Rhaenys are arriving because they've been... The job they said they were doing was uh, patrolling the gullet, which is still just trying to cut off trade to King's Landing. All stuff that, as much as it might seem kind of just busy information, it's super important that I hope they maintain because part of what destroyed Game of Thrones was not respecting its world building. This uh, analysis we're doing, by the way, is all assuming you've seen season one and, you know... Kind of enjoyed it, I guess, because <laughs> we're not going to be like picking up every little detail from the past stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. What was enjoyable about this scene, though, is the uh, Damon gives her a bit of kick in the ass for the whole, you know, again, not taking yeah. the chance that she had to end the war where she did, which will play an important role in these four episodes, but also lost opportunity to. Uh... The fact that she didn't reply is endlessly frustrating well um <laughs> it's definitely something the show recognizes and works with going forward except uh for some reason they went with the whole ignoring the many people that she killed thing even though the whole audience has not uh i was talking to fringy about this but I, a comparison was made between rainies and catelyn stark as to their uh I don't know, ethical systems and which one, like, Rhaenys is clearly better, and it frustrates the hell out of me because Catelyn never did what Rhaenys did. And what's funny is some people compare Lady Stoneheart, like, we never got that shit. I would have been happy to get it, but we never yeah. did, so don't bring it up. But uh, Rhaenys, uh, they, they were saying, like, oh, God, let it go. Just move on. It's like, how do you move on from a massacre? <laughs> like, that's something a character does. It plays into literally every fucking last line that they say. And um, it's unfortunate they did not. We were hoping they would, but they didn't really register it in this season either. They're moving past it. They're going to pretend it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean they don't do some decent work for Rainies. I M O. Um, and yes, Agreed. Damon. She she just kind of starts off with uh, lower stocks than everyone else because of uh, well, episode so nine of last season. If we're being completely we fair, her and Kristen season. Cole do. They're both lower in our estimation than they would be had the writers been handling them as they clearly intended to. Uh, well, yeah, the, those two characters emerge from episode nine uh, damaged. Yeah, to be absolutely crystal clear, Amon and Damon are characters that are almost crystal good despite the horrors that they conduct because it's all clearly well established and developed and then the actions are very cause and effecty. Rainice and Kristen Cole from season one did things both in the same episode, actually, that we as a, as a as an audience were like, "What the fuck was that?" And it's like we don't really have an answer for you. That's that's the, it, we did it to facilitate other things we needed to do, and it's like, ah, cool. That's the thing with Rainice is it's so difficult to hear her try to take the moral high ground in any conversation now <laughs> yeah. after after all of that, and she's often framed that way, like. Not yeah, yeah, she's like, absolutely the moral center of uh, Team uh, Black for some reason. It makes episode nine seem just all the more like this bizarre fluke that mm -hmm. slipped into the show. It just seems so out of place. You see, it's, it's, it's also unfortunate because I think I would have liked uh, Rainey's a hell of a lot more, but that scene just, it just sticks in the fucking way. You can't forget it. Yeah. It's, yeah. Too, it's too bombastic and important and pivotal. And they and played it up so much. I think too you many have implications on everything that happens after it, too. You've got such a good opportunity to mitigate the damage or even potentially repair it by giving her an answer. Like, espousing a reason as to why she did what she did and yeah. didn't do what she didn't yeah. do. Yeah. 
Does oh, she dude, feel then... regret about it? Does she feel da da da? Like it, give us something that her expressing her state of mind. Give us something. Just gonna do an old fashioned. She goes to sleep and she has a nightmare about all the people she fucking stepped on, and then she thinks about it excessively and how it is like the worst thing she ever did in her whole life. But it was because she was gonna stop a war from happening. But then she didn't even stop the war, so all those people died for no reason. You know, like you can easily reincorporate. Yeah. You can you can try and catch up for lost time, but they. Uh, as was said, they they didn't even they didn't even catch it in season one. The um the writer of that episode talking about uh, we we've brought this up a couple of times in order to make clear what the issue is. Uh, the the writer said, Rainey's couldn't kill Alicent because she couldn't kill a fellow mother while she was stepping <laughs> oh, on not only saying. mothers but children more than likely. Yeah, just appeal to kin slaying. I, you know. Because yeah. that's really not allowed in the Game of Thrones universe. Well, and some people have said, like, why would you expect royalty to ever care about small folk when that's, like, the point that uh, George often makes? And it's like, well, because she explicitly says so East. many times. Yeah. It's our job to guide the men to keep things together. Yeah. Well, and also, I mean, it's it's a, it's in-universe, like, acknowledgement. When Damon steps on that guy when he goes to the Stepstones... That's the that's the writers conveying. Yeah, that's bad though, isn't it? Mm. Like, Damon's that's, not that's here really to bad. save Damon people. He's, he's there not, for exactly, him. Exactly, he's there for his own ego. Whereas the, with the Renice one, you meant to think, oh man, how awesome is this? It's like it's not. It's very bad. Especially um, when the episode you, very clearly shows people running away in terror and everything. Yeah, like, like I don't even know why they did it. I I truly I don't either. Like, well, if they weren't thing. trying to frame Renice this way, I think you could get away with it. I think it's. There's so many ways you could go about with this, but there's just like three or four jigsaw pieces that do not fit together here and haven't mm. been made to fit. Uh, Gogo just highlighted. She also said that slamming through the ground, the writer now was uh, they did it because it was awesome as a moment. <laughs> yeah, which I don't it's know. The, don't, like, make, don't make writing decisions informed by what would be awesome. Well, yeah. of course. <laughs> like, uh, awesome yeah, moments. don't. <laughs> just too just, rich of a production to stick to real life. If there, are, if there are like four things you could do that all work really well and two of them are awesome, I'd be like, all right, go with the two awesome ones then, I guess. Or rather one of the two awesome ones. But if you could like, we can have three things happen, only one of them is awesome, and that one is kind of the stupidest one. Let's just do it anyway. It's like, oh, God. Or how you don't. <laughs> the, the sad part is you can still... It's a... <sighs> It it frustrates me that bursting through the ground is like, that's that's all we could do for awesome shit with a dragon. You know how dragons just burst through the ground? Like Star Destroyers? <laughs> like <laughs> Star what a, Destroyers. What a comparison. <laughs> it honestly you know, probably would have been... It would have been a better call if she just got got uh, Melees out of there more quietly and then just burned the roof, because then that would force everybody to leave and stop the coronation. Well, if you, yeah, if you heard the banging on the big front doors and then you see two dragon claws reach into the crevice in between so, and pull it open, like that would have be, been like, that's holy an option. shit. The door was open from memory, so you have her exit the usual way from the dragon pit. You hear the screeching of a fucking dragon. It can interrupt Aegon's speech, right? And everyone would be like, wait, what? What the fuck? Wait, who's that? Then we get the shadow. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Oh, then, yeah, that shadow comes up. Lands at the front, yells real fucking hard, and then starts to stomp its way in. Everyone avoids it, and then, you know, or fly, even flies in and starts, like, you know, wind rushing everything. So all the people panic and run away until there's a clear spot for it to land, and then you get your scene still. There's so many ways to film it, it would be fucking awesome. And simultaneously, she doesn't have to kill everybody. <sighs> yeah, and the guards are like, what the fuck do we do? What can we do? What, what should do? we do? I don't know, man. I, oh, man, it's my lunch break. I thought the little uh, staircase for the dragon at this this point, this little uh, I don't know what to call it, but the the get on get off the station. Side pass it. Yeah, it's like it's like, oh, the, I like that. Yeah, yeah, where all the dragon riders would get onto their dragons with a, a lot of ease, well built. It's just like oh, which, nice. by the way, I really appreciate because we we actually do see it in this season, but we didn't see it in the previous season. No, you never really see anyone getting on or off the dragon. Because mm -hmm. logistically, it ha you have to do it a special way because of the shape of a dragon and how big it is. But they do they they do actually show Rhaenyra uh, getting off a dragon later on. Yeah, you go in a way that you're like it's believable and it shows that you know it takes a little bit of dexterity and finesse to do. The bigger they are, like when you have Vega levels, you have a whole net that goes all the yeah. way down the body. You have to climb up the whole thing. It's like yeah, that's how it would be done, I guess. So. Yeah, how else would you do it? I mean. They're... It's not you super easy up. to get on a horse if you don't know how to do it properly. Never mind a dragon. 
Yeah, well, they've uh, they figured it out, and yeah, they seem to be not shying away from showing more of it because uh, they had to be sneaky in season one most of the time. Uh, but yes, Damon suggests that he and Rhaenys take Caraxes and Maelys to go and kill Vega, which is pretty rash. You you wonder like, oh, we, that's just something we're doing now, are we? Um, that's what he wants to do. He's a little bit mad, and she says, you know, you ain't you ain't the king, bro. So uh, you ain't ordering shit, and it's because yeah, because uh, Rhaenyra's not here. Yes, Rhaenyra has been absent, and I did kind of appreciate the line. You know, she deserves time to grieve the loss of her son, and then he says the uh, the mother grieves, the queen shirks her duties. I guess two roles she does have to run, whether or not uh, any particular thing has happened, because they are basically at the. It's not quite war, but it is. It's it's it, it's you know, like right on the doorstep war. of it. It's I ready to. to yeah. I yeah. have to imagine it is so frustrating to try and run a Targaryen monarchy when they have these giant sky lizards that they can clamber <laughs> onto and disappear on whenever they want, seemingly. Yes. It's got to be such a headache for all of the magnates and all of the people helping them run their faction. Also, yeah, to clarify, he is the king consort, but it means he doesn't have ultimate authority. Just, uh, But yeah. he does have the most authority when she's not there, so... Which is why I thought it was a bit strange that he seemed to be anxious to get running off to Harrenhal, because it's like, isn't that kind of what he wants, is to just be be in charge for a bit? That is well, something we can his discuss. reasons going there, we'll get there. Yeah, because it's uh, I think it's complicated, as is a lot of stuff in this show. They they this is part of why I like it so much. There's a hell of a lot of layers running at the same time for a lot of characters. In fact, uh, maybe it's too early to say, but I wouldn't mind asking everybody who's uh, let's 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 see who's everyone's favorite character. Just if you have to pick a Ooh. number one, and if can we, has Ooh. everyone got the same number Discord one? Lineup? Actually, let me just. Uh, I think so. I think it's alphabetical, right? Well, yeah, whether so. or not it is, I'll oh, just man, post the image I have on stream so that you guys know. If we go left to right, favorite character, and you don't have to justify, you can just say their name. Uh, Otto. Wait, Viserys. <laughs> no, uh, we'll say we'll say living. <laughs> okay, Otto. Spoilers. <laughs> that actually makes it easier. I'm caught between Otto and Damon. I just I like Damon's attitude towards things. Mm -hmm. I like Damon a lot, but I think I gotta give it to Eamon. <laughs> Mine's Otto, but uh, second place is drawn between Damon and Eamon. Yeah. You know, I was about to say the same thing, where it's kind of <laughs> like Otto or uh, Otto or Damon for me, but I think I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with Damon this time. All right. I guess I get to be kind of the wild card because it might be Kristen right now. Yeah, I mean, yeah, oh, spicy, spicy. We Kristen will talk followed about by that. Aegon, I think. Ooh, ooh, but fair, well, fair I guess answers. Well, yeah, so if you came here for so asterisk on that last one. <laughs> if anyone in here, if they're like, oh, they're gonna shit on Kristen, ha, 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 you mm. might be disappointed. <laughs> just to be clear. Kristen has, uh, from Kristen's what the memes great. and stuff I've been seeing, yeah. Kristen is a great character. He's unfairly yeah. maligned. We will get to it, but uh, the reason I brought this up is because um, is uh, there's other shows that have this quote unquote issue. But if I were to list, I don't know when I would say Rhaenyra, and it's not really because I think she's a bad character in any way, shape, or form. I just don't find her as interesting as many of the other characters. I I think I'm more interested when Corlys is in a scene than when she is. Um, and he's had very little screen time by comparison. I'm like, so what's the problem? It's like, not really a problem, I think. It's just that... Um, oh, I think Alicent's more interesting than Rhaenyra right now. Yeah. Well, that, I mean... Is that... I think, think that, that makes... Might be a bit of an Alicent's had a lot of screen time, you know? Like, that would make some sense. Yeah, she has. Yeah. I don't know how fair this is to say, but it almost feels like Rhaenyra doesn't have much to do right now. Well, so it's also probably we have a lot because... of idea of, of how Rhaenyra thinks, because she's sort of the perspective character for a good chunk of season one. I think it's because so she's it... trying to not do things, if that makes sense. Yeah. She's trying to not, like, yeah. do stuff in a way that other characters are very much go, do stuff, do things, and she's like, can we fucking cool it before things get really bad? Um, and the scene at the end of season three, I think, is crazy good like for that topic. Well, uh, we'll we'll touch on this as we go through. I was just curious to get everyone's broad takes. Man, auto scoring high in episode two. We'll talk about why. Yes. <laughs> oh, mm -hmm. auto stocks are high. They really are. Uh, They're already high. And yeah, on the topic of uh, Rhaenyra 
Um, Emma D'Arcy's performance is fabulous in this episode. Um, yep. Obviously still backed by the end of season one. And, and just to be fair, the performances are pretty fantastic for, for everybody in this. It's not really... Um, it, it's it's almost expected when you have TV of this level. You wouldn't expect there to just be a suddenly an awful performance. They just don't typically do that. That uh, would be strange. You know in the way that the Acolyte has like, like several... Accent. Oh, it may be, but I was just going to say, you know like how uh, main character in Acolyte of Stenberg, or right? Amandla Stenberg, she's um, notably Genius flat. Amandla Stenberg? Flat and boring. Mm -hmm. And like just not being pushed role. to do anything, while they will tell us over and over again she is fantastic, she is genius, which is... Uh, <laughs> He's like, okay. <laughs> if you, if you say so. a loose application of the word genius. She does shout. They sometimes. they say those. Uh, they say all the. We should call them paycheck phrases. Yeah, little boy, bit. they say them. So, uh, moving uh, forward. If I could, sorry, if I can just say one thing about performances, I think that is one of the key things missing from the acolyte is there. There is no subtlety. layer yeah. of subtlety to any of yeah. the performances, and it's just so uninteresting to watch. Whereas with this show, like often characters are saying things that runs in contrast with what they're doing with their face in subtle ways or their body language or their actions in the scene or a scene later or a scene prior like they're there's an extra layer there to consider mindset yeah the accolade is completely devoid of that yeah it's like tell me tell me about tell us uh, acolyte actor actress tell us about your character feel free to go into as much detail as possible it's like you, you can't you just can't <laughs> why are you doing this to me you can't Stop much so yeah. if you don't even know that, then how do you expect that person to do a really good job acting out that person if they don't even really know who they are? Right. Exactly. Uh, so and that, that's not even like regarding the quality of the writing. It's just, it's just like the performances alone having that extra layer. Well, it's not it's just like, okay, I'm saying this, but I'm thinking, I'm really thinking this, or I'm doing this, which reflects what I'm actually thinking about this matter. Anyway, sorry. It's all good. Uh, we got Corliss is uh, healing up. He's getting better and better. And uh, this scene is kind of funny for those who maybe it m was smoother for those who know about the source material. But for those who do not, it was it was like, uh, you're the person who pulled me out of the water. Yes. And he was like, yes. And uh, the, the one thing about it, that I think that ties it more so as a, a story scene that we would get anyway, is the uh, the knife. A knife was also found and he says he had it made for his heir, which would be uh, Luke, unfortunately. Like you know, that works, I am you know normally, but this guy wasn't in season one, nor mentioned, and he's getting a lot of focus. And then, uh, you know, there's there's future stuff. But anyway, there's like this guy's Alan, gonna be important. Talking about? Well, I wasn't gonna go that far, but yeah, <laughs> it's my, my point <laughs> is that he is this guy, but he's gotten enough screen time that it would be like, wait a minute, what's uh, what's the dealio there, TV show? Because yeah, we all know how TV on? shows work. Like, what you doing? I don't even think this is the worst instance of it, because at least this one has, I would argue, more context than not. Uh, it's hard, it I is... suppose, to be completely subtle when you've got a limited amount of time. When you set up something as big as this world, I understand it, but at the same time, it's just like, so he's going to be important. Yeah, we're spending time here, so. Exactly. Mm. Uh... Yeah, and then, because uh, reestablishing the way everything works as well, we, when we go back to King's Landing is showing that they've got their defenses up and running now with the Scorpions and good old uh, Arik. I want to be careful how I say the Eric Arik, right? That's the difference. Arik. Oh, it's so hard. Yes. Uh, he's organizing. I want to say Black Eric and Green Eric. You could, but I think that might confuse people even more, maybe, if they're not familiar enough with the teams. Eric of the Black Blacks, Eric. Eric of the Greens. <laughs> um, now, Vagar is generally patrolling uh, King's Landing, so I, I do find this part a little bit funny, that they're like, oh my god, it's a dragon! They're like, oh, set it up, and they're like, oh, thank goodness, it's Vega. And I was like, you guys it's, need to have people funny, but... who can tell who Vega is at a distance. That's important. Like, and and Vega's not exactly hard to spot with the, the wings, as in, like, Super the damage big. to the wings. Yeah. yeah. They must and have also, some, like... someone who can spot from a distance what the difference between dragons. Do spy glasses exist in this universe? That's a good they question. They should, right? I would think I don't they would. think they do. Would. I'm trying to think if we've ever seen a spy glass in Game of Thrones. Because it's one of those, because a spy glass is one of those things where it can be in fantasy or it 
can't, and it's believable both ways. Um, so I, I didn't actually, I have no clue if it is or isn't. Um, but the thing I do like about the scene is that it shows that like, everyone's on edge about dragons, though you are right that they should be able to spot. You're like, oh, no, that's, that's, that's a good one. We're, we're all set, guys. Good to go. Um, instead of like being like every time yeah, they I'm see not... a dragon, it's like holy shit. Because on one hand, it's like you can't you can't blame them for not necessarily like they should always be prepared. And I'm like, no. What I'm saying is, you probably need someone who's good at that because of the fact that you will need to tell the difference between the good dragons and the bad dragons. That's going to be super and important. The sooner, yeah, the sooner especially you know, if they the get better. to fights and yeah. there's two in the air at one time, you got to make sure everyone's on the same page. It's just IFF, you know, basic stuff. Mm -hmm. Time is not your friend if it's an antagonistic dragon. No. You want to know that right away. But uh, I still appreciate the scene for just being like this. This is the the day to day now. Everyone's on edge. Yes. Yeah. So we get uh, our first scene with Aegon for this season, and he's already feeling a little different, and uh, not in a way that was any way breaking anything. Because uh, the last time we saw him, at least I think the last time we saw him was the big standing ovation, or rather, just just the whole audience appreciating him as he's inaugurated as yep. uh, the next king. And it clearly and had a like, profound hey, effect on him, yeah. Hey, this is, you know, huh. And so, specifically, what effect, we shall find out. But he does seem chiller. Does seem, and, he, and he's invested in getting his son for court, because he wants to uh, make sure his heir understands the role he will be taking. And, and that alone was already like, okay. Well, oh, all right. All right, yeah. That's different. I can believe this. I can believe this change based off of how we saw him at the end of the last season and how taking on these new duties and responsibilities and the kind of reverence he gets now, it can, I think that can absolutely kind of change a person's general outlook on a bunch of things. Yes. It's and pushed him in a better direction, in a way, almost. It does seem like it. Um, and he seems genuinely... Ironically, more power seems to have made Aegon yeah. slightly more of a chiller, better person, kind of. He seems genuinely kind of happy about it. He's not, like, aggressive... Uh, or doing it in a, some kind of seemingly selfish way. It just seems sort of chill. They even have a bit of levity at this scene where uh, Helena says she's afraid, and Aegon's like, we've got Vagar, it's fine. They're not going to send their dragons here. And she says, no, not of the dragons, of the rats. And they have this like wide shot of everyone in the room looking around the floor. <laughs> like, what's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's the like, rats. she's... Uh... She's got a strange mind, the queen. It's, it's fine, don't worry about it. Uh, which, yes, she's always been characterized that way. She's getting more this season yeah. than season one, which I appreciate as well. I always want to be nice to learn more about all these these people. But, yeah, um, in the last season, she was super minor. Um, so now we're... But the thing is, with a show like this, and a character like that, whenever she says weird shit, you gotta try and think in the abstract mm. of what she might be referring to, because dreamers are often going to be sources of uh, a bit of foreshadowing. She, mm -hmm. And she, she's not a very articulate one. So. No, <laughs> she's uh, she often has no idea what she's to do with the information she's saying. So uh, it happens. And then we get confirmation of something that a Ooh. lot of us thought was happening anyway. Allison and Cole are doing the nasty. They're getting up oh, to no good. Oh my goodness good. gracious! Oh my. my goodness. People have speculated because there's no confirmation as to when they may have started doing this. Some people wonder if she did it while Viserys was still alive or not. Um, the bigger piece of speculation for that was from episode... I want to say, is it six where Aemon loses his eye? Or is it seven? Uh, I think it's episode seven. Well, if it is seven, um, the the assumption is that Cole... Because he was supposed to be on watch that night and he wasn't uh, available. Remember, his, his excuse is I wouldn't have expected uh, you know, family to be killing each other. But the assumption might be that he might have been with Alicent as well that night. Um, Possibly. 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 I could see it both ways, because you, like, legitimately don't think that we need to protect the kids from the other kids. No, like, that's I, I get not that. Even a thing that even, yeah. uh, but at he the same time... He doesn't say he was asleep. He says he was a bed. Well, uh, you're talking about what season do you think one he, or two. Well, I mean, like, if he might have just wanted to not be literally lying in a bed, because he was in a bed, but he wasn't asleep. Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, I, I'm just saying that I don't know. We don't know for sure when this would have started, but uh, going by Alicent's character, I could believe that she would have started doing it after the series died and seen it as much less of an issue. 
uh, had she been doing I it agree. while he was alive. It's like, uh, that would surprise she me a little bit. She wouldn't have cheated on her husband. Yeah, I don't think she would have cheated on her husband with the way that she ha she was at that time. Um, I think that that would surprise me if she was. Yeah, it would surprise me as well, but uh, not impossible, I suppose. Yeah, not impossible. Um, And yeah, there's just a moment that I quite like in that scene where he asks her to pin his cloak back on, which... Of course, it's a symbolic uh, reminder of just how much both of them are not at all forward. following. Yeah, like they're, they're not they're, who they present themselves to be. Nor nor who they judge others yeah. uh, for failing the standards of. Right, like they'll they'll judge the shit out of everyone else, both of them, but simultaneously, like they are the hypocrites of the show they're for hypocrite. a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they, they have know a it. public costume too. They are very aware of that fact. Yeah, and it torments both of them. Yes. Um, oh, and she says, uh, "We can't do this again." He's like, "Yes." And everyone who watched that's like, mm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> "Right, yep. sure, upset, right definitely." <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a nice sort of continued detail that the that cloak is very representative of to Cole specifically as well as the audience of the the supposed purity of the king's god that he's just sullying several times. Um. Also, throughout the episode, it's really neat. You keep seeing that rat catcher. Uh, they have him like three different times in the yeah. background or, yeah. or even in the foreground. Just like, there he is doing his job. You're like, hmm. Nice not there catching well. rats. Yeah. Which I don't know if I approve of. I suppose so. It's not their fault, but, you know, I guess it's, yeah, it's, it's just a rough world out there, I guess. And just say, hey, That's rat. what I would do. Mm, yeah. That'd be my first move. It's like, hey, I could y'all, uh, you know, off you go. I love the alternative they use, which we'll get to a few episodes later. Oh, no you mean in catchers. the book? No, 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 do it it's in... in the show. It, this is in the show for sure. All right, if, if you're it? sure. I don't think don't they... so. Oh, shit. Wait, I don't know. It might have been. But, I mean, it already would have happened, so do you want to know something then that was in the book that wasn't on the show? Go ahead, Mark. No, sorry, I think I know what you're talking about. Right. Um, Otto decides to get a bunch of cats. He does. And the they thing is... like 150 cats. cats to play in the it's a miss for three reasons. One... It would be really cool to have Otto engage in throwing in a hundred cats into the castle to kill all the rats. Like, that's just a funny thing. Imagine the memes of Otto and cats. Exactly. There's so much <laughs> oh, you can use that'd that for. that'd be glorious. Uh, two, yeah, be everyone likes episode. cats. There's those you can do with having cats. People just like well, cats. You could have had cats. So it's a not? practical thing that seems very Otto-like. We have mm -hmm. a bunch of rats. Well, then buy some yeah, cats. Like, and then, like, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Let's just get some cats in here. They're fine. And then three, but then we'll have to find a cat catcher to like, oh, it's just uh, just bumping it down the road. Uh, the there's cats in King's Landing for uh, the the that Arya fucks around with in season one. So it would have been a nice sort of thing as to the origin of that would be this. That would be that would be cool as a little bit of connectivity. Oh, neat. Okay. But, uh, hey, you know what? It's fine if they didn't want to. I mean, ultimately they can just say that happened at any episode. So, um, we'll be fine. Anyway, this is the I first scene where Otto that. is back. Look at him go. Otto's back. He's got a Look map. He's saying things. Otto's he's just in his map. element, you know? Um, and yeah, what's uh, kind of fun about this is Aegon brings his son in, and while everyone's talking strategy, he's sort of just looking at him and smiling. And and you just get this distinct, like, what uh, what, what are you up to, show? Are you trying to make me like Aegon? What's up? What's, uh, what's happening? Interesting. Trying to humanize uh, him? Challenge accepted. Yeah. <laughs> Good yeah. luck. I mean, uh... Not against trying, but you know. And uh, another piece of appreciation a lot of people had for this scene, including ourselves, presumably, is the discussion of the transport of resources and the, just the nature of their resources in general. So that'd be money, uh, livestock, food in general. General the logistics. Yes. That yeah. facing. The day-to-day -day lives of the world. This is something that I wish way more... Um, stories would talk about because it's really important and it governs a great deal of the decisions that people make and it's also just interesting and it invests you into things when you learn how this world works i think yeah. it, it also puts you in touch with a lot of the the other people in the show that you're not seeing in a way that i think um is a, is a lot more effective than trying to have all those people represented as characters on the show actively doing stuff like if there was always a poor person, just who little had people to see the doing their jobs. Of. Yeah, but but like what I mean is giving being given that in the context of them overseeing it and just being able to infer that all that stuff is very important. 
doesn't it, it, like it doesn't really need to we don't need to have a whole set of characters that are in flea bottom you know and it because it keeps it more focused on what's actually important on the show well sure but by as referencing well as, yeah their jobs mm -hmm. and what those people do yeah. it's like yeah, yeah. Rem a reminder that this it, this kingdom is full of many 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 thousands of people who just keep things running it well, doesn't and, take a lot of effort. You can have it in a line of dialogue. Once you have enough of these scenes, as anyone who's unfamiliar with this world, you'll start to remember things, like when they reference certain areas and families that they're trying to get control or responses from or where they're moving for uh, efforts that relate to the war they all know is coming, right? Because they've got uh, the Baratheons, as part of Storm's End, are essentially like right on the cusp of being 100% with them as soon as Aemond completes the marriage pact that was mentioned in Season 1. Uh, the Lannisters are amassing strength in the West. Uh, Old Town is marching to the Riverlands, at least eventually. It's like, oh yeah, we've got all these different factions in the same vein. Uh, Team Black have the North and the Vale, as well as other resources moving around. It's just stuff to remind you and that these things will be relevant in future episodes. Uh, you know, Rook's Rest, I think, gets its first mention in episode three. You know, which will become super important in episode four. So it's like they they try to give you some space so that you don't get caught off guard entirely by crazy events happening. Um, and you have uh, Alicet asking if her letter to Rhaenyra as the bit of response to it, and the uh, the guy's like an apology for a dead son. It's like whoa, I don't think that's gonna go over. What kind of response would you expect? It's just like that was unfortunate. Anyway, <laughs> terms <laughs> like for not having war. <laughs> Anyway, so, you're still not going to be queen, by the way. Yeah, I know that sucks, but... <laughs> dot, dot, dot. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I guess, you know, it makes sense that she would ask. It's uh, a small thing about this show that I guess I try to ignore. It's just in terms of understanding of a medieval society. It is kind of bizarre how dead set both sides are on, like, avoiding conflict for a while. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Like... You have two sides that both perceive the other as usurpers to their throne. So they are, like, essentially already in open conflict. Um, but they spend a long time not being willing to follow through on that. And I think you can attribute a decent proportion of that to dragons, dragons being what they yep. are. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, even... when both sides have nukes, you're very hesitant to, oddly enough, they can keep the peace in a you know, bizarre kind of way. There's a reference here and there from different characters about how we, like, we don't need to worry about X thing happening because the other side would never do that because they know that if they did that, then we would do this and that would mean everyone dies. Like, uh, yep. Especially in reference to dragons. But it turns theory. Even in reference to... Um, uh, Rainy says that Otto would never have done the twin plan, which uh, is correct in the sense that he laughed at the notion of the fucking twin plan, <laughs> but he did suggest the King's God in Season 1 go and assassinate Rhaenyra, um, which... I don't know if Rhaenys was saying he'd never do that, but I would absolutely expect Otto to do that. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, yeah, you get the uh, the sort of interactions with Tyland, who in some ways sometimes feels a bit like the punching bag of this council, um, the, which is a fun contrast considering the Lannisters' power levels in Game of Thrones. For here, it's the Lannisters just simply aren't as important as any other family right now. At least in this story, I mean. And yeah. um yeah, he's getting like humiliated by Aegon and his son. And uh I think this was a fun contrast of Alicent basically says, Stop fucking around. And um Aegon sort of accepts. He's like, Alright, fine. Let's uh, actually talk about, you know, making sure we know what we're doing here, which stands to me in complete contrast with characters that would connect to him previously, namely Joffrey, right? From uh, Baratheon from good old yep. oh, I, I guess I should say Joffrey Lannister. What's correct there, Theo? <laughs> It's still Joffrey. Baratheon. That's that was Baratheon, his name. It's, I guess. It's his I name guess as it exists in the history books. Yeah. And Jeffrey Giraffe, right? Yes, Giraffe. For Aegon, I I like that we get this very quick and apparent sense of him being well intentioned and kind of like sinking into his role, but a bit boneheaded about it. Mm -hmm. I, guess. I think so it's we'll... he he likes certain parts of his role far better than he likes other parts of oh, his role. Yes. Yeah, and, and his patience is limited. Uh, when he's got plenty to spare, he actually comes across sometimes as semi-useful in the role. But when he's out of it, it's, it's, it's like he's completely worthless and you want him replaced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a lot of people. You can't really get them to engage with something they're not like interested in. They just want to be doing anything else. But if they like something and have an interest in it, they'll actually you know, like devote themselves to it. Uh, 
we have a really good moment where um, they're talking about how their current state is not fantastic in terms of options that aren't going to be dangerous. And um, it's said that they should have killed Rhaenyra when they had the chance. And Otto says, we lost our chance for surprise. We must play the board at hand. And it's uh, there's like a strong look from Alicent of, 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 of like it's all her fault for fucking that up when it is interesting to think about because you could say that's true but in retrospect if you see that scene again in season one it is crazy it's like so we're taking the throne it's like kill the bull she's like whoa <laughs> like, what? when did we decide the Sarah this died last night kill everyone yes it's yeah. you know <laughs> um yeah and, and there's another moment where uh they say Vagar is needed to deter um the attack as retribution for her son from Rhaenyra and um uh, Otto says, errors were made in the hours following Viserys' death. We must not compound them. And so, like, the interactions, even though they're non-direct between Otto and Alicent, are basically him undermining her by reminding everybody of who fucked up uh, this whole operation. Because the thing that I think isn't... I don't, think I, I don't think I blame the show for this, but a lot of people don't recognize this is essentially, like, a week since Viserys has died. It's a very short amount it's of time. very close, yeah. 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 When you could be, I think even by episode four, we get Allison saying like it's been like three weeks or something like that. It's not been long at all. I think you'd be forgiven for thinking as much as even months have passed because it's just it's yeah. just that feel between seasons. You expect a lot of time has uh, gone by, and it it is it this the time period does owe itself to just being a slower you know resolving kind of world it's not yeah. like you can just call someone up on the cell phone and hop in your car and whoop and go over there so yeah information just doesn't disseminate as fast but i mean if you're paying full attention then you'll be able to you know grasp the the time travel pretty well they do they do a good job like they did in season one of uh they don't do it so obviously as to have a character look at the screen and tell you they uh, you have to rely on where people are going what people are doing and what's been achieved or changed another thing and this will lead us to talking about a missed opportunity IMO. Eamon enters the room, and Alison's like, What's your business here? You don't have a seat on this council. And it's quite aggressive. Uh, and you'd be like, Wait, why is she so being so mean? It's like, Oh, well, of course, because. Oh, well, yeah. Eamon killed, uh, uh, arguably started the war, uh, as it will. Th th that's probably a pretty good starting point is in terms of you could put it at different places. Definitely but... ramped it up. Yeah. That's, that's very <laughs> clearly like an ignition point. And so, um, something that I think everyone would have wanted to see was his return and what he said to Otto and Alison. Uh, yes. Because it would be really interesting to see their reaction to that. Oh, his Vagar's mouth all bloody. About that. <laughs> um, yeah, so, the, funny story. The, you're going to hate <laughs> me for this. <laughs> You'll never believe this. <laughs> just, wait, just wait till the end. Wait till the end. <laughs> Don't the judge me until the end. Are, what, did, what did he tell them about mm. what happened? Obviously, he would have said what happened, but did he tell them that it was not yeah, the intentional, why. that he lost control of uh, um, Vega? Yeah, we get, hmm. we get the broad strokes of what probably happened, but we miss out on the performances, I would say. Which yeah. is a shame. And the specifics. I want to, yeah, but the, what Fringy said is right. What did, what, what would Eamon well, say about what happened? I think what, is what we're to character? conclude. What we're to conclude, I think, at this point, with uh, further references and and Allison's stated opinion on him, uh, well, I think his conversation with Otto. Can... I, I, I well, it's just I think I think we're to assume that he uh, he he didn't tell them that he lost control. Agreed. Mm -hmm. That was something he... that he kept from them. Huh. I for two reasons, I think he would say that one, he doesn't want to come across as if he can't control his own dragon, which he would yeah. he would not want anyone to think or know about him. Yeah. But also if he lets them know that I couldn't control my dragon at a very pivotal moment when it saw another dragon, they might like ground me. Yeah, well, the, the conclusion is that maybe he thinks that it's better for him to just say that like yeah. the he Chad yes is that shit. That he, kind of when in, he has motive. Sense, uh, the, um, yeah, the loss for of his, his eye. position, that that makes him more intimidating to everyone else on that council. And uh, he was yeah. seen but, uh, in front of the Lord of Storm's End saying, "You took my eye. I want yours, like as payment." So, yeah. no, so, <laughs> the, the, it, yeah. So in a sense, we miss out on the reactions that Otto and Allison would have had, which would have been really interesting. But at the same time, we got the 
subtext of like, well, he he probably lied about what happened, which is interesting mm -hmm. um, that he made that choice. Yes, uh, and entirely in character, and it's had now the pride of Amond because he probably would anticipate that they would bring that into all discussions of strategy for, in future. Like, we don't want to send you here or here because what if you lose control of Vega? Like, that would be something that would always be attached to conversations. So, yes, yeah. totally believable. And his pride in relation to that means now that he's completely damaged his relationship with his mum, which was already rocky to begin with because she's oh, Allison. Yeah, exactly. Um, to the point where we discover a way that she refers to Aemond at one point in the season is, you know what he is. Like, gee. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, I think it's recognized that those two have broken their relationship after. I mean, it's, it, it would be hard for her to, to love her son, even knowing what he's done, which is just... How old was uh, was Luke? Does anyone remember? He must have been like, young. what? 14-ish? I would have thought oh, younger younger than that. that. Yeah, he might have been like 12. Um, so, yeah, it just just cruel is how it comes across, but... Uh, and it's, it's so it, it, that's how it's so interesting about it to me is the fact that if she knew what actually happened, she'd probably feel a lot better about it. But he's, you can't let anyone know. It's an interesting bit of conflict and development. Well, how things may or may not work. But uh, he's showing a lot of interest in strategizing as well. Um, it's, more uh, so. Gradually increases over the course of these four episodes. Yeah, I would even argue that he's more into it than the show has let on, uh, and that we're going to see a lot of it trickle in to the point where mm -hmm. he has a better understanding of the geography of Westeros than Aegon by far. Oh, uh, he has a better understanding of basically most everything yeah. things than, than Aegon, as, we, as is made very clear later on in uh, episode four. And it's interesting, uh, Aegon's dialogue is much more related to let's crush them, let's crush them now. And they tell him the obvious of, like, if we get the dragons fighting each other, it's going to fuck everything up. And his response to that is just, mine are bigger. It's like, okay. <laughs> but I don't know if that's always going to be the, the answer to everything, but we'll see. Well, because part of the, the, the strategy talk is the idea that you, you need armies. Like, that, that a, lot of, a lot of it is, like, try to, try to use armies of, of men, not, not dragons. <laughs> because it's just such a dramatic escalation of the stakes. Yeah. Then we get uh... yeah. You need yeah. You just you need. It's the one thing infantry, even to this you know to modern day and probably well into the future, you need infantry to hold locations and enforce your presence at locations. Um, you, you can't do that with a dragon. The kingdom of Ash. Yep. Uh, True. What a Daenerys. She decided. Nah, that oh. sounds pretty yeah. cool. To me. Actually, like, you know, that's, yeah, that's fucking Ash is cool. badass. <laughs> Let's make every castle look like Aaron Hall. Uh, so we get an update from uh, Mr. Feetman, in, and that has multi-layers to it. He's, uh, Laris, the not-quite-whisperer yet, but he'll get there, is asking uh, Alison why, why she was unavailable. And I think what they want us to grab from it almost immediately is he knows exactly what she's doing with Cole. And, uh, through expressions and subtlety, it's very clear that Otto knows that she's doing something with Cole as well. It's, um, probably something you could keep secret if you did it once. But not how consistently they're doing it. It's uh, it's become pretty obvious. One of them doing open what? Secrets. What do you mean? Uh, playing chess, which uh, is forbidden. Oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. that's right. You can only play chess with people you're married to. Exactly. Because it's such a because right. of the nature of the game. That's right. Uh, Laris says he's replaced the castle staff with basically every one of his people, which uh, is mm, both yeah. good news and bad news. I'd say <laughs> it's uh, well, it's, it's uneasy it's news. Fun tell what his agenda is very but much it so. seems like he's uh he's moving to get more and more power and he's and he's being very successful in doing so yeah he um he's reaching pretty far and it seems to be pretty successful uh with each step so we'll see how that all turns out uh and then the wing that was left of uh, i think it was arax was the dragon um, has been found. This would be Storm's End, and Rhaenyra uh, goes down to confirm, because they were saying that this is too big of an event for her to just accept and, you know, start strategizing on top of. She needs proof. And you get yeah. um, a pretty excellent scene again. Her performance in this episode is fantastic. You even get the dragon Cyrax showing a bit of um, sorrow as well. 
Because correct me if I'm wrong, that's one of Cyrax's children, the uh, the dragon there, I think. It's uh, complicated to exactly figure out whose mums are whose, but you know there's sheets out there that go gotta... all the... <laughs> yeah, because it's hard enough to keep all the people straight. When exactly. we start throwing dragons in, I'm like, oh, fuck me. Um, but yes, very sad, and not even the saddest scene of the episode. We'll have uh, at least one goated oh, scene yeah. per episode, okay? But this this is uh, yep. this is up there, but this isn't quite the one for me. And uh, I'll be curious to see what you guys think as we go forward. Which ones do you choose? For this episode? Yeah, sure, why not? Everyone. Uh, oh, um, Rhaenyra and Jace, for sure. That's the one I was thinking of as well. Mm -hmm. That's probably the one I would go with, too. That was... It was quick and very effective. Um, and yeah, just not wasting any time. This is super important to, you know, for her to confirm, see the pain she's going through, it's going to inform future decisions, etc. Next up, we get a nice little example of Aegon being king. And uh, a fun thing is his friend announces him as Aegon the Magnanimous. And he just goes, Magnanimous? And you find out he's like, not even 100% clear on what it even means, or rather that people would know what it means. So he's actually yeah. trying to figure just... out what name yeah, he should like, give himself. Shrugs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, it sounded good. Um, and yeah, there's the, again, throwing me off, right, as to exactly what kind of character we're getting here. We can be more definitive the more episodes we get, but he uh, entertains the first request and the guy struggles to say his name and Aegon says, there's no reason to be nervous. What is your name? Like, and how can your king be of service? It's like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? Like, what, what's going on here? Like, are you are you gonna do like an assholey thing, and you're just being a jerk now by pretending to be nice? What's going on? What what's your what are you playing at here? I saw the first season exactly, and well, and I, it's, a lot of people have seen how they do these this shit these stories sometimes, and so you're like, is you gonna do a shock thing where he just he just fucking cuts the guy's head off or something horrible? But uh, no. The nature of this scene is Aegon is sort of stretching his muscles as king and entertaining the, the people, like we get a bit more on this later, he recognizes that being loved by the people is important, so he wants to try and solve their problems. And it's just a fun, almost tutorial on being king. It's like, guy comes up and oh, says... Oh, especially with that. Yeah, I was just going to say, guy comes up and says, we need X, and then Aegon is like, X you will have. And then Otto is like, yeah. okay, well. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, giving them X is, X is complicated, yeah. sir. <laughs> These people need stuff, clearly. Well, I, the, uh, I yeah. think here that um, what uh, Aegon is finally, he, he is able to finally be a king. He's finally able to do stuff as king and get respected for it because he's not getting that respect elsewhere. But here, when he's talking to the people and he's sitting in the big chair, he's like, ah, fine, I could just be king. I could just do king shit. People could just respect me, and I could do stuff. I could just be king here. He seems to have no understanding of economics at all, nah. or no concern <laughs> for it. It's no. Well, he it. wants the sh the short term success of being able to say yes to everybody. Like, oh wow, what a great king! He's given me this. He's given yeah. that guy that. Well, I'm the, the whole, one with the Otto power. Otto knows I'm he's doing. Can have this. Otto knows he's doing none of the math <laughs> that would make any of this a reality. He's also, just constantly, like, rolling his... <laughs> Reese Funds is one of the kings in the show of fucking doing tidy expressions. He's so memeable. The amount of little... Like, when Aegon agrees to give the guy the, the first thing he asks for, it just cuts to Otto and he looks so in pain. Like, oh, he's like, God. ah, <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay, here uh, we go. Makes his way up the I stairs. Have to explain, <laughs> yeah, I have to explain why this is dumb. Yeah, and uh, basically just the the dragons need the livestock. I don't know what you do it here, but that th that's kind of just we need we need them. And then Aegon basically just says, "Yeah, uh, we need them." Sorry. And then next, it's, <laughs> the it's once again very sincere and airheaded because yes. he's in a position where it's like someone asks him to do something. Like, yeah, sure, why not? That that seems like a nice thing to do. Why not be a magnanimous king? It's like, oh, I have a lot of reasons not to. Oh. Yeah, he really. I guess that sucks. Like he's so base level king. Like he knows nothing about what he's doing, and you can tell Otto is like, oh, I've got a lot of work yep. to do. And uh, the next one says, you know, with the blockade, uh, salt has become incredibly valuable or oh, well, hard to acquire. And he just cuts him off and says, Vega will destroy that blockade next. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> no, I mean, well, I mean like, okay, <laughs> that's great. What if, what if Vega doesn't? That's he so will. Definitely, I think he says like that traitorous blockade. It's just yes, it'll be destroyed. You're fine. Oh, Don't you that worry. pesky blockade! Oh, 
Um, yeah, and then the next one says the uh, iron costs have grown and they're struggling to be able to create the scorpions and general defenses and weaponry for the the crown and that they're going to need advancements on pay. And then Aegon is like, okay, you, you've got it. And then Otto does the same sort of, uh, and slowly makes his way up. But uh, Aegon says, it's, uh, it's important that we do this. Our victory depends on the efforts of the small folk while slowly looking at Otto. And then Otto turns slowly and walks back down the steps. That was great. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, yep. It's right. such a great way to show that uh, I think that's Otto saying, like, fine, you do, you don't misunderstand everything. Like, that's fair. We'll allow that one, sure. <laughs> uh, try to, you know, let's, let's play a bit of bouncing back and forth instead of just treating you like a complete baby. Um, yeah. Really good scene. And again, uh, just, you know, usual fun and interesting shit from Otto. Nice to see more common problems that relate to the uh the resources the you know for trade and travel all getting fucked up and more for Aegon. which i think a lot of people's takeaway from episode one was just like man they've definitely changed their approach with Aegon, or rather they really want to make sure we understand that something profound happened at the end of the season one he's got uh many dimensions now or rather maybe just ones that we're understanding better perhaps uh, not the same who was what was it, watching, like, bastard child combat in Underground Rings? Good was God, that... yes. that's uh, yeah. That should follow him forever as a, a thing. That was, that was, was horrific. It was very strange as an element that was included at this point. Well, uh, I guess they want us to take in the... He didn't yeah. have outlets, right? It was, he didn't was have being... outlets or structure or really anything. It's, it's interesting because yeah, yeah. the difference between him and Eamon, they both treated all arguably the same way except Eamon's a second son so feels a lot less in the spotlight but they had different reactions Aegon lashed yeah. out and did crazy shit that wasn't what he was expected to do while Eamon almost went hardcore into what he was supposed to do and became almost like arguably the perfect king um, at least by comparison with those two, the knowledge on High Valyrian, having the most powerful dragon, being an expert swordsman, having knowledge of the geography of Westeros to a point where he can strategize with the Lord Commander of the uh, King's Guard, like pretty respectable and uh, pretty smart too. And so it's an interesting comparison. But we also get Laris doing some more naughty shit, where he basically oh, just says, "You know that Otto guy? He was Viserys' hand." Doesn't have to be your hand. He, he said, "Yeah, he was Sneaky. like he's he was the the hand for two kings before you, you know." And uh, yeah, he, he he treats kings as very pliable, you know. So you, you know, yeah, just uh, just sneaking a little worm in the ear there, just getting a, getting an idea in his head. Um, I quite enjoy a lot of Laris's dialogue, and I also like that Otto would never have expected a move like this. Probably wouldn't even see why this would even happen. Which uh, keeps Laris in a position that's rather questionable. He's, quite, he's like the Riddler. We don't really know what he's up to. Riddle me this. Except he's telling riddles. And so, yeah. Uh, we get Allison and Otto having a little chat. Having a reconvening of their goals. Because she lets him know, you're kind of fucking me over in the council. And uh, if you remember, they had like a competition in episode 9 of season 1. Where they were both trying to reach Aegon first. To better direct him in the way that they thought would be more effective. Mm -hmm. Neither, of course, treating him like a, a beloved family member, just treat him as a, a tool or a piece on the board. Um, and yeah, Otto says things are not going to plan. We have the uh, Aegon being eager, Aemond being angry. Um, and I think it was, yeah, it's mentioned that Rhaenyra's son took his eye and was never punished for it. What he did, however vicious... The Caprice of Youth, I think it was, uh, it's described. Caprice of Youth. Which is <laughs> generous. That's true, but... Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess so. Uh, it's just that you should avoid having the Caprice of Youth controlling one of the oldest and most powerful creatures on Earth. It's a delicate word for, for what, what, what went down. Yes. Um, and yeah, they basically conclude that there's some difficult work ahead some violence to probably be done but you know let's not get crazy let's not have people die randomly for no reason and otto's like yeah of course we want to be in control of who dies and when exactly and <laughs> quite frankly yes um 
So then we get the blockade at presumably the gullet. I don't even sure exactly where this is in, in the old ocean. Uh, the white worm is picked up. She was a stowaway. Now she's been captured and she's sent to Dragonstone. If you remember, she's the lady who kind of acts as a... I was trying to think uh -huh. of what an equivalent would be in Game of Ed, Thrones. Uh, Chief Snitch. Yeah. Uh, she really is. Uh, she, <laughs> yeah, maybe this one is. She's kind of, if Laris and her occupy Varys and Littlefinger, um, I think this show would argue Kinda. she's the good one, uh, though we have things to talk about in that regard. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we do. Um, but I would say it's fair to say that she's She's certainly the good one compared to Laris. Yeah, yeah. She's, yeah. yeah, you want her around you and not Laris. With, with Laris, you know you're just going to fucking get something shenanigans. With her, there's, it's still a maybe. Mysaria is her name, the White Worm, and I Mysaria. have consistent issues with her dialogue. Let us begin, shall we? Um, yes. So, Damon says, I didn't think you would flower a traitor, and she says, you speak of highborn games, the implication being that you guys backstab for all your power and shit. I was just trying to survive. I don't think I care uh, whether or not you did it because you felt you had to, right? She, The, the thing he's talking about is she sold secrets about uh, Damon and the Greens, uh, sorry, the blacks to the greens, mm -hmm. which to me, which it's lucky like, she's still breathing right now. Um, yeah, there's a lot yeah, of different ways to survive, okay, mm -hmm. that don't involve doing that. Well, yeah, and I just only making a living. It doesn't really matter if it's like I did it so I could eat. It's like, okay, but now you die. <laughs> like, that's yeah, this, all right, this yeah, and you ate. Society, you did eat. You got to eat. Society is sort of predicated on loyalty in a way. So once you make yourself treacherous. Yeah, I don't know. You don't really have anyone who's on your side anymore. Yeah, uh, if I can't trust really you and seriously. you can do anything, mm. Th this is a war where they're about to start fighting their family. So yeah, I mean, I, I feel like he probably doesn't have strong enough feelings for her that he spared her life. Just well, we can sort of address as we go, right? So he says, "How long do you sell secrets for?" And she said, "For as long as Otto had money." Not a good answer, by the way. Not yeah. a good answer. <laughs> Um, he she said, been, you should have been like, oh, not that many. Oh, it was just, like one he, time. <laughs> yeah, it, was just, it, was a, it was a once off, you know, I learned my lesson. It'll... And so uh, something I'm going to do when we go through her lines is be very clear on who knows what, right? So, so she says, uh, he says, you delivered Aegon to the crown. She says, he would have been returned anyway. I simply sped the business along. You blame me because you can't reach those you hate. I did not have loyalty to the High Towers, and I certainly don't now. I have nothing of value. I have like seven issues of what she just said, okay? So first of all, <laughs> you had Aegon, and no one knew you had him. You could have killed him. That's, that's like a Damon's whole point. You could have killed him. And she said, no, nah, you would have made it back anyway at, at some point. It's like, no, you had him no, captured. No, you could have kept him... Yeah, you could have done anything you wanted with the guy. You could have sold him off to somebody... You could have used him for ransom. You could have exactly. done all sorts you, of stuff. You could have just, delivered him to the Greens. Failure of imagination. You could have, yeah, and been like, hey, Rhaenyra, you're all right. Looky, look what I've got. Oh my gosh, it's Aegon. Look at that. How'd he get here? Anyway, let's uh, let's have a well, chat about how cool I am. Something that bothers me about this is that um, I think there are things to talk about and ways to answer these criticisms of her, but Damon never gets to him. He sort of just gives up. She keeps giving these answers, and he's like, oh, darn it. Good point. Like, no, not good point. Bad point. Um, As if what she's saying pertains to anything. Exactly. And and he wouldn't... Why would he believe that she would say what she like she said is true? Why would he believe... All he knows is that she had Aegon, and she sold him back to the Hightowers. Of course she could have killed him. What do you mean he would have gotten back anyway at some point? That's not an answer. Uh, not at all. And then she says, you blame me because you can't reach those you hate. It's like... I blame you because you were the one that could have done the thing and you didn't do it. And now, yeah. to be fair, uh, Damon you know, is... Like Damon's angry at her. He's angry at um, uh, Sir... I was going to say it's Eric, right? Is on his team, I think. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to bear with me on those ones. Um, but, you know, uh, Damon's mad. He's, he's very mad because things are not going his way, right? I get that. But she also still sold out the greens to the blacks. Sorry, vice versa. Um... The, yeah. the thing that frustrates me about it is, like, she keeps slithering away for arguments that are valid in different contexts. So I was just like, no, that's not right. And she says, I, I, I didn't have loyalty to the High Towers, and I certainly don't now. It's like, you, 
you may as well, well you like you got paid. Not, uh, <laughs> There's so yeah. many things. things. First of all, you did have loyalty to him. What do you mean you didn't? You you had you he, sold them the secrets. You, you had the relationship into transactions with, them. with him. Yeah. Secondly, like I certainly don't now. It's like saying, hey. after mm -hmm. they tried to kill you, you don't. Sure, but then That's thirdly, crazy. of course you wouldn't That's admit normal. to having loyalty to the high towers in a fucking Damon Targaryen prison. <laughs> Why would you? <laughs> it's like, yeah. Obviously. Damon, you know those guys you don't like? Boy, I sure don't like them <laughs> I'm not loyal there's to some, those guys. Some, oh boy, if I could, I'd just, oh, and I'd kick her, sir. And then, the final statement of, I have nothing of value. Yes, you do. You have loads of information. Still has a huge For network. years, arguably, well, you really? were the merchant, the secret merchant whisperer lady of Knowledge. King's Landing. Yeah, and he knows that. And something that really bothers me is he knows it so well, he comes to her later to make a deal for information. So he knows that she has information that he needs, slash wants, and she's like, I have nothing of value. Yes, you do, liar. <laughs> you liar! <laughs> You're a liar face. Liar! So, uh, yeah, not happy with that whole conversation. I was just like, why is she getting away with all this crazy shit? Especially against Damon, who is pretty good at picking apart people who are bullshitting him. And I, I've heard the defense that he had a relationship with her, so he's a little bit blind spotty with her. I was just like, that's boring. Yeah, I don't buy that. He's uh, I, I don't I, like he's killing family members here. Yeah, he's or, like, pretty I ruthless. Mean, I don't to. think I, I don't think he's sparing his ex girlfriend. I'm sorry. No, I don't think so either. Um, yeah, and uh, the knight outside the door says, "Forgive me, but she was no agent of the High Towers." I don't even know why he's saying that. He couldn't possibly fucking know. He knew nothing about the White Worm and her relationship with uh, Otto. Um, the idea that Otto tried to kill her does not mean she wasn't his agent. I think in the world of Game of Thrones, you kill your own people semi-regularly for all kinds of reasons. Um, yeah, and then and then Damon is like, well, you should have killed Aegon yourself. And then he's like, we were sworn to defend the royal family. And at this point, I was like, okay, Damon's just very mad. He's just lashing out. He needs to calm down. He needs to go home, drink his milk, whatever. Can't just calm down. Um, and Rhaenyra comes back, and we get her only line in the entire episode which is that she wants Aemon Targaryen. Which is kind of neat, honestly. It was a bit of uh, restraint. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's I know what I want, and it's pretty understandable why, and we're going to have to see what becomes of that, won't we? Oh, um, because Gogo's bringing it up, and I, I think it's fair to say, so should Damon kill her, my answer is no. Torture as much information out of her as possible. Yep. I think the most, the, the best, if you want to be the, if you want to portray someone as being the kindest and yet most reasonable, you keep her under lock and key at all of the all the time, and you use her for every bit of juice that you can get before you even begin to think about letting her go. He needs or to find out like that. how much she is compromised to the greens of the blacks, and then he needs to be like every weakness you're aware of with them. I need it. Every name of a person you can trust to affect them in any kind of sub subterfuge way, I need those as well. And maybe I'll allow you to live forever in this cell <laughs> if I'm feeling fucking <laughs> kind. Uh, but no, she gets some serious plot armor uh, from anything like that. And instead, uh, he walks into his cell again, like I said, separated by one scene. And he just says, you uh, accumulated spies in the Red Keep. And she says, scheme with someone else. And he says, okay, fine. Knowledge in exchange for freedom. Why? You have all the leverage. What? Yeah. What the fuck can she? It should like... be. It should be knowledge, 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 knowledge. In exchange for you might be free one day. You might be able to walk around Dragonstone with a knight next yeah. to you. Yeah. Also you could. Clarify, we are not. We'll extend the boundaries of your cell if you're very well behaved. It's um. Damon will definitely like cut cut hands off and stuff. We we've seen him do that. Absolutely. But what's frustrating about this is. Everything, Missaria's story is frustrating at almost every chapter in this, so to speak. Um, and it does, it starts the second we meet her, uh, in terms of the, the story bends and twists to benefit her when it shouldn't be. Uh, and it won't stop doing that in future scenes. But for now, he wants information on people he can use to do his evil plans. And he's saying, if you give me that, I'll let you go. That's crazy. They've just got someone who is like the leader of a spy network that sold out secrets of his team. You keep her forever. It does have... Yeah, you... 
I, you got to do something until the war is over, until we're sitting on the throne, until you can personally guarantee blah, 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 blah. That's if you even want to go down the nice-ish route with her. Yeah, I don't know. This world, uh, I don't know what's happening here. I feel like she would have been tortured already, even if she didn't have information to give because of what she's done. Even if her reasoning is why I had to eat. It's like, that's that's great. So many people do all kinds of crazy things for that reason. It's, uh, you know, there's just repercussions for that sort of thing. So Yeah, it's like, well, I hope it tasted good. But yes, he promises her freedom in exchange for the information that she earlier said she absolutely does not have. And then she says, okay, fine, here it is. So, um, Which would have been a fun little bluff thingy by Damon to be yes, like. Yes, if he had know, said, so you do I, have information. You <laughs> jerk. You are a lying liar face. Liar. Uh, then we come to the, the goated scene where uh, Rhaenyra's son returns with information regarding the Vale and the North. And halfway through explaining it, his, uh, his voice breaks and they both share a hug because of the death of Luke, which is very sad. Can't really say much acting. in terms of analysis. I, the acting, crazy. yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that it helps to sort of com. Like, it's kind of like um Damon's words to Rhaenys earlier in the episode when he says, "While the mother weeps, the queen shirks her duties." There is this uh this parallel that's being drawn between your official capacities and your you know your personal concerns, and you know him coming into the room. And, uh, you know, given his report to his mom, when, you know, obviously the unspoken thing is like, oh, shit, you know, our son slash brother's dead is, you know, it, it's, it's always there. So it's that duality of their, you know, their, 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 their personalities and their concerns, I think, is really, uh, you know, really, really well expressed here. He was yeah, good he performances was really... and uh, great uh, writing, because, I mean, the, the writers know that there are things that these characters need to discuss, but... They also know they're both just torn up by this loss. And they both they just need to take a beat to hug it out. Like, yeah. They both have they to play their in. roles. They both recognize that. But ultimately, they're both alone in the room, the mother and son. And so the, it breaks the uh, you know official duties into personal yeah. ones. He was, mm -hmm. he was trying so hard to prioritize being a knight telling information about the war to a queen. And he just couldn't do it ultimately. Yeah, and you know, you get to watch, uh, not like in a really thorough way, but you, you, we've known his life, so to speak, up to this point, and uh, you got some scenes with him uh, and and Luke in the previous season, and it's just like, yeah, there's there's enough here to make it hit quite hard. It's just a sort of, oh, that that's that's rough, but uh, done very well. Absolutely. So then we get his uh, funeral intercut with Alicent praying. In the, uh, I think that, that's a Sept of Baylor, correct? Theo, you'd know, right? Or Mark? I'm not a huge Game of Thrones What about me? It, it, would, it likely would be. I mean, she's in I assume it is, yeah. That'd be the guess. Unless it's just like an altar inside of the Red Keep. I'm trying to, it's, it's funny, I've just been opening up old uh, memory storage for the world of Westeros, thanks to this show. Uh, a previous show kind of sealed it all Oh, up. okay, apparently it wasn't Bill yet. The Dragon Maybe Show. about that. Oh, yeah, hold on. Where did they find um, Aegon in season one in the, in the episode we don't like? Where did they find? Oh, that's where they are, right? Like, it's I that thought that set. was the Sept of Baelor, was it not? Oh, Baelor, not, Baelor isn't uh, even born yet. Okay, there you go. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> oh well. <laughs> that's why I thought it was weird how he was just like under that little altar in the middle. I was like, what happens if he like doesn't want to be there anymore? And he, <laughs> like, what? Is what? He this is where you hit him up? here. <laughs> Oh, that's a good suggestion. It might be the Sept of Gaylor. I'm not sure. It might be until <laughs> it along. So, that but, sounds yeah. about right. <laughs> you said Sept. <laughs> uh, Twist, there was another man under there with Aegon. So uh, he's burned along with... I saw someone post this. I don't have it, unfortunately. But I think I did send it to at least Fringy. So you can confirm it's real. But uh, they burned him along with two... Like cloths that he was uh, like used when he was a baby back in the actual episode he was born. It's, it's just like some continuity shit that's really fucking cool. They yeah. kept his clothes like they kept Kalnaka's rags. Uh. They, uh... <laughs> How dare you <laughs> <laughs> reference such a show? Um, and the other really strong bit of this scene is Alicent's prayers reflect. Uh, she's got she mentions her mother Viserys and uh, Lucerys Targaryen. But yeah, you can't do anything but appreciate. 
Alice. I think that they do. That. Yeah, and and I think as as the episodes go on, you'll see it uh, more so. But between both Allison and her father, this appreciation of Viserys and how he held shit together, and now that things are going on the way that they're going on, there's you know it's, it's very very clear in their minds. Oh, the good old days. The other last month. Oh, the good old days. Yeah. So, Damon uses his influence with the gold cloaks to organize, along with the information Masari would have given him, two guys, a rat catcher and uh, one of the gold cloaks, to assassinate Aemond Targaryen. A bold scheme, but it's obviously uh, him expressing his utter frustration at not being able to do anything necessarily, and also thinking, if I get this done, it's going to really make Rhaenyra like me. And it, it's a pretty good move, because Aemond as we will come to learn over the next few episodes, is something of a thorn in Damon's side, uh, his psyche. I'd have to imagine it connects to the fact that he controls Vega somewhat, which... Uh, yeah, I mean, tactically speaking, if a, a someone who can ride a dragon is obviously someone that is a, is a prime target for assassination. Yes. You want to get them while they're obviously well, not on their dragon. Thinking about it, if Melis and Caraxes are on the same team... The only dragon that can threaten Damon that is currently being ridden is Vega, right? I think in a one to one, because Caraxes is one of the most threatening dragons alive, um, but kind Probably. of dwarfed in size by Vega. So yes, Vega's got an instant advantage in that regard. Yeah, definitely on Damon's mind, and so uh, organizes this to happen. Offers a whole bunch of money. So uh, you get half, uh, you know, now and half later. And uh, it's left ambiguous as to his order of what happens if they can't find Aemond. Um, I also, he has a line where he says, um, I understand Aemond's quite good in a fight, you might want to take caution. Which feels to me like the most he would ever compliment Aemond. He's quite good in a fight, yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's like, he wants to make sure they understand this guy is a fucking demon to deal with. But I don't want to appear like I think he's actually threatening, so... <laughs> you know, I don't he's... want to make it sound like he yeah. scares me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then we get a scene that I never thought we would get. It's uh, it's Cole and Eamon strategizing. It's like, wait a minute. That's hey. how involved he's getting, which is kind of neat, to be honest with you. It is. Talking about moving different people, different places, using their power to the best of their ability, and uh, Aemond makes it clear that uh, Alison is kind of soft, and that this council they've got with Aegon in charge is not doing what they should be doing. Which, um, if you've seen all four episodes, it's kind of like, ah, what were they planning, if not the very thing that we see? Kind of neat. And uh, Aemond says, Alison's love for the enemy makes her a fool which I can't imagine isn't inspired somewhat as a feeling by their recent relationship issues. Same with Cole, to be honest with you. Him and Allison don't seem happy. They are. But, but, but like, he'll stand up for it somewhat. And then we get... Seems more like a coping mechanism than anything else. Yeah. And then we get a scene that we all have wanted, but never thought we'd actually get. Otto and Eamon together. Yeah, because like, once they are together, you realize they actually have not had a conversation with each other ever yeah. uh, up until this hmm. point. Not that we've seen, anyway, yeah. Well, not that we've seen, because the only thing that we got in terms of like a much more direct interaction between them, and even that, it's, it's funny to say it's direct, was um, the looks that Otto gave when uh, Eamon said, you know, I may have lost an eye, but I got a dragon. They're kind of like, hmm, that was actually mm -hmm. very impressive and astute. Yeah, um, and the broad point of the conversation he wants to have with Eamon is maybe chill out a little bit. This is probably um, because of the conversation he had with Alison. He's like, you'll get all the vengeance you want. You are essentially the most powerful person in the entire world. Uh, so maybe chill out a little bit, get a grip, and uh, especially help me with Aegon, because he's even worse for impulses, which... I could go for, you know, 10 hours of these two talking to each other, but that's about all you get, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You gotta take what you can <laughs> exactly, get. Exactly, take right, what you can. Uh, the interactions between the best characters in the show. Um, and then, as if you hadn't been provided enough, we see the uh, the rat catcher and it'll be blood and cheese, they're heading in, the lads, and we catch a scene with Aegon and Pals just chilling out, having possibly one of, if not the most relatable scene he'll ever have, where it's just him and the lads having some drinks and chatting shit. It's, uh... 
kind of neat. They're they they're making jokes yeah, about what his name should be, know. and um, one of them says, "How about Aegon the Strong?" And he says, "My nephew took that one," which is actually a pretty cold and funny joke, uh, yeah. considering the whole the strong issues. Oh. Um, and he said, uh, another one says, uh, Aegon the Generous. He says, oh, I like that. That dragon heart. And he's like, that's even better. And then dragon cock. And he says, uh, that is, that is the top, top dog choice. And I guess what I like about it is just that it feels so normal. This is clearly him and his element. This is what he actually wants out of life. Much he more. He to pal around with his buddies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He doesn't Must want to so agonize in his on his throne or in like a private chamber thinking about the affairs of the kingdom or relationships with other factions. He just wants to get fucking wasted with his friends. Every night. He also <laughs> describes Aemon as loyal as a hound, which he is, does. You know... Awkward, but fine <laughs> for now. Well, like, you know he's that's how he feels. Line, right? you know? Totally true. Oh uh, it, yeah, it's back. So he was the one that put uh, Aemon on the council. I think he said right that he's uh, his yeah. closest blood and. Controls Vega. It's uh, interesting to think about, especially when Hi uh, Otto was talking to Aemond about Aegon's impulses. And it's someone else's impulses that might be a, a bit of a concern as well. But yes, uh, it'll have to be addressed. There is a dog getting kicked in this scene. I don't know. Uh, oh, no! Yeah, it's oh. Uh, quite horrible. The internet I don't like that. was set aflame by this disgusting event. I hope yeah, that fucker dies. Do that. You know what, yeah, Rags? Well, <laughs> you might be in yeah. luck with that one. Uh, you know, it's a, it's, at least it wasn't a real dog that got kicked because that would would never happen. Actually, like on a on a production like this, it was a CG doggo. Good God, yeah, they get in so much trouble if Still they kick the dog these days. Absolutely. Although if it were the 70s, well, yeah. they would have kicked the shit out of a real dog for sure. If it was the 70s, they would have kicked a real dog, but fortunately yeah. we don't live in oh, a time The dog would have been on drugs, so it wouldn't <laughs> the even dog would have been no dog, cocaine. <laughs> dog, no, dog suffer here. no suffering for doggos allowed on set. And so, yeah, they access uh, the same room we just saw Eamon in with uh, Cole and Otto. And a little detail I like is they're moving through the room and they're like, oh, no one's here. And it's like, oh, we've got to keep looking. And they spot the coins on the table and the uh, blood just starts pocketing them, which I was like, yep, that's absolutely what people would do. Um, I prefer it when you see little things like that instead of just ignoring yeah. it all. It reminds me of... Um, yeah, like you're just walking through this royal room yeah. and it's just made of money and you're just a guy, basically. You're basically a, a slight step up from a guy because you're in the gold cloaks. This is just money. You're putting that in your pocket. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and he says, uh, gotta get, gotta get ahead, no head, no gold, and there's a little shot uh, that I quite like where Cheese spots an image that is, uh, I believe it's Harrenhal getting destroyed by Valerion the Black Dread. It's a cool little image. I probably have that on my wall. Yeah, you know? it's really tough to stick that in your pocket, but man, you'd yeah. want to try. Well, it looks like it's actually on stone like uh it's not like a tapestry so you can't even take it down oh yeah you're right it is kind of yeah it's like part of the wall like a like you're a what are they called like a that. fresco a fresco yeah hmm. no no the fresco is like that's like a that's something that, that's like a drink that, isn't, isn't it? it i thought it was like a like a mural on a building a fresco, fresco right pretty sure i thought fresco <sighs> all right let's fresco is the drink i was right a fresco <laughs> oh, is the painting does it... oh it is fresco okay Oh, yeah, enough. Fresca is like sparkling flavored soda. And so now, if they had Fresca <laughs> on the wall, I'd be taking one of those as well. Because I'm like, man, all this killing and sneaking is making me parched. We haven't done any killing yet. Well, it's in their mind. They're it's the process. It. It's on it's the, the process. It's I the. Guess, it's yeah. part of the process. Is yeah. yeah, yeah. So <laughs> they bump into Emma Stone very clearly. You must get that reference right. At least one person in chat. Emma oh, Stone, uh, yeah. I know the actress. You're gonna have to. Is that that newer movie she's in? She Poor things. Looks like that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. I've heard of it. I haven't seen it. In any case, uh, I kind of like the. You know, it's, it's very awkward. It's like, wait, what the fuck are you doing here? And he does play it chill. He does like this is the plan. He just goes for the rats, and sort of moves. But another thing I like is I think they're showing yeah. that she keeps an eye on him, and he starts to pretend to place a trap, and he kind of fumbles with it. 
like as though it's clear he has no idea what he's doing, and then she disappears, as though that Another was the tip off. Detail: she was also in the room when um, when Helena said the thing about the rats, mm -hmm. and she kind of gives her a weird look. So she's like, um, "I'm getting suspicious of a rat guy," and I know that she's not always wrong when she says stuff like this. Well, and it's also uh, it's pretty sus anyway, and then. It's, it's, uh, I think it's a matter of seconds, and as soon as he realizes she's not there anymore, he actually draws out a knife, so it's just like, oh fuck, everything's falling apart, probably. As you do. And so, uh, he tries to find, well, anything at this point, and uh, he sees that Cheese has caught up with Helena, he's gone into her room. And don't worry, we'll go over the whole sequence of events, I'm just sort of trying to summarize them first. And, uh, they want to figure out if they, he says they've got a son to deal with here in the room, but she's got, uh, two kids, one son, one daughter, which is different from a book. I'm putting that out there, I understand that, but we're going to, you know, go for what the show does. And so the back and forth is essentially, which one is your son? And she points, and, uh, uh Cheese is convinced she's actually telling the truth. And so they cut off the boy's head, and the sound effects are pretty grim. And she picks up her daughter and moves down into Alicent's room, in which she accidentally stumbles in on Alicent and Cole doing the naughty. And so, yeah, what an awkward night. Yeah, not great. And uh, that's sort of where it ends up. So, what did everyone think of this? Uh, this this final shocking scene. Um. Well, I I think they could have done it a lot better. Um, it's effective in a way. Uh, and there's some parts of it that I like, but I feel like logistically, uh, we gotta we gotta do some tightening up here. I think unfortunately, if if I was blood and or cheese, well or cheese, I wouldn't be both. I could be bloody cheese, I suppose. Mm. It, I think I have that kind of. I think I've got enough drive to be both. But if I was one of those two guys and that was my mission, um, there would be things that were done differently. That's for certain. I um, might not make the same choices they did. I would make different <laughs> choices. Um, yes. I think that the biggest... I think the biggest issue here is probably that they let her leave the room. Well, I was going to say, if we rewind, let's get all the way back to them entering. Uh, I think everyone is fine with the rat catcher having intimate knowledge of, you know, this, that, and the other thing for getting around the castle, yep. sure. And then you have 100%. the combination of both of them doing this for the kind of money that I assume means they're going to be leaving King's Landing. At least that's probably the smart yes. thing to do. Yeah, uh, you could do it. With... made forever. Hopefully, yeah, you're yes. basically all set, yeah. Because this, um, this, the one thing I was surprised by they didn't have in their dialogue that I think should have been included is a recognition that this is the kind of job that will change your life in terms of the this money, the but also job. the, uh, yeah. This is, this is the one <laughs> last job that they've, uh, that we hear of so much. And so, um... <laughs> When they get upstairs into that first room, I'm already like, uh, feels a little feels a little empty. Now it's it's fair to say the King's Guard is quite significantly fractured. We lost, was it like half of them to the split of the of the kingdom or whatever? But we also because like the twins got split. I I'm trying to remember which ones have even died or been sent away. But um, we've uh, like we're low on level, yeah. We're lower on King's Guard than usual. Um, and then you got one being Cole with Allison, one is with Aegon. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure exactly where everyone else would necessarily be, but I don't know that that's fantastic as an explanation for why nobody's around, as opposed to an explanation for why there would be people of lesser trust around. As in, would they not have replacements anyway? Even if they don't, well, Laris got... would have replaced yeah. the rat catchers, right, with his own so, people. Or this is an interesting angle. Um, I was just going to bring up first that I would have thought Cole would make it so that they get, uh, you know, people people in. Uh, anyway, it just seems like something he would do, uh, especially for the security of the royal family. That's the whole point of having the king's guard in the first place. However, Laris allowing, like this rat catcher was working before and after he said he made the switch on the staff. So there's theories running as to whether or not Laris kind of maybe allowed this to happen when he could have stopped it. I guess maybe we don't know. it's just um maybe the extents uh, maybe the extents of the staff was such that he didn't consider rat catchers to be like even really like worthy of worrying about um or 
uh, maybe it was just maybe he maybe he was in the clear. Maybe he was like Lara says had no reason to think the rat catcher was anything of importance in terms of being swapped out, so he didn't bother swapping him out. I think it's um if we're supposed to go with that's why there's basically nobody around to prevent them from doing this is is all that I just I feel like that's kind of weak. Um, I think it's worthy of lines or setup if that is the case. You need quite a few people to keep a castle going. Not only that, you need quite a few people to think, okay, yeah, we just want to have guards for a few days. Like, that's just... Uh, yes. You know? <laughs> so, I, I mean, needed... Especially, especially where the children are sleeping. Like, if you, even if you just only have one yeah. king's guard, like, that's where you would probably put them. Yeah. Um, so there's that. Then, you know, dealing with that, they come in and they, uh, they have her, and they, just, they say they need a son. They don't want to kill both kids. Uh, this is something I brought up on the first stream me and Gary did on it um, over on his channel, but why wouldn't they just kill both instead of fumbling around with figuring out which one's which? These guys aren't um, exactly high of moral character, you know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe, it was the, maybe Damon was very specific. Like, do not kill and more than one? Do, it's just one for one. Like, the, the, the arrangement is specifically this, or you don't get paid. I think that's acceptable. Uh, I can Im If there's no dialogue to reflect it, I guess we can imagine that's something he said, because well, even Damon would well, want to be... Say, didn't he say... Didn't one of the guys say a son for a son? Oh, sure, but I'm saying that these guys are so one... disgustingly reprehensible, I could buy that they're not going to fight in... Fix over which every second counts, right? So if I just kill them both, fuck it. I could totally see them doing that unless they felt that doing that would fuck up their whole deal with Damon. That's how I read it in my head. It, mm -hmm. it was a one for one, and another more than that would forfeit the payment. May, well, my that, issue that's... is why didn't you just check which one's male? The old. Oh, so I was going to move on to that's way? that's the then that becomes the next problem. Uh, they even say it out loud, just check for a cock, and then he's like, no, she can point it out, and it's like, bro. These bro, yeah, it, why? It, what, yeah. it, being, being indignant with him is the least of your concerns, considering you're about to kill them afterwards. You've just literally taken it its head off, I think. Uh, yeah. You, you know, and that very much felt strange. Uh, it's like, these guys, <laughs> these guys wouldn't do that. You're like, okay. Um, I think that the the way to fix that might be to have them sleeping in separate places and they only have time to check one of them or get one of them and the mom they have to trust the mom as to which ones in which like nursery maybe it's so strange but um it's... i think to rely on her testimony and you know what what blood says is true he says she wouldn't she wouldn't give up the heir to the throne like that is actually a really good argument helena is a very different character than one might expect for what she would do and how she why she She's would very do it. but like motherly yeah without any context for who she is i think blood is correct it's like i don't think we i should, think so too we should go Can't on what she's pointing chance. at and they could have fucked up the whole thing by doing that right like kill a, the daughter and then damon's like the fuck you it's, killed the, the it's a coin flip <laughs> yeah like there's a 50 percent chance you not only don't get paid but you kill the wrong person mm-hmm so yeah, I don't buy that Which they is, would have wasted any. That time would on come that. across as so fucking spiteful <laughs> if you had assassin sneak in and kill the young daughter. They're, they'd be they'd be like confused. It's like, wait, why? Well, Dude, what, imagine, what the imagine they killed both and Helena and brought all three heads to uh, Dragonstone. Could you imagine? She'd be like, you Holy killed this, you killed three of the most innocent people. <laughs> like what? <laughs> what the fuck? It's the opposite of what we asked you to do. It's achieved literally nothing. We Thank only you wanted so you to kill one purely innocent person, not <laughs> exactly. three. Well, yeah. Amon was a purely I mean, innocent, right? Kill Amon. Well, the kid, the, yeah, the yeah. son, was on the Just he was on the chopping block. Um, he scratched his head, so we're not getting paid then. Mm. Uh, so yeah, and then and then to what Rags is bringing up. Uh, the way she sort of just slithers out very easily because apparently the two of them are needed to chop the head off what I believe is like a two year old just seems weird to me. It's, yeah, uh... she ain't leaving. Yeah, if it, if it's the one life rule, which is I, I'm gonna operate as if that's the case. I think that is what was kind of agreed upon here. It's, it's just I'd be like, no, nah, you're here. You're getting tied up. We're uh, we're 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 gagging you. We're putting a blindfold yeah. on you. Where we're, we're tying up your hands and your feet, and you're not leaving until someone finds you in the morning, and we'll be gone. The so, impression I got was and... this is the tensest fucking thing either of those two guys are gonna do in their whole lives. They're gonna make sure Probably. everything goes as right as possible, which means 
some I, I I see that as a chance for some unfortunate things to happen, including but not limited to potentially killing Helena. Like they might do it just because they're scared of her, you know, screaming or something. Anything could happen. Yeah. But the idea that they would just lose interest in her entirely and she's able to pick up her child and simply leave, it's 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 very odd to nope. me. It's as if they lack object permanence. Because bit. she's right there. And then of course she is and, right and blindfolding her isn't enough. Like she has to go. Because as soon as she leaves the room, so that yeah. like she's going to identify them, and then they must know that they're going to be hunted to the ends of the earth, potentially henceforth, yes. and they're probably not going to succeed. They're probably going to die. They're dealing so. with dragon riders, right? Like Aegon, if he gets woken up and then gets on Sunfire and goes immediately to the docks, I don't even know that they could escape in time, in theory, before they lock everything down. And then, yeah, it's a matter of her f identifying their faces. But as we know. They're captured, or at least blood is, before he can even leave the castle, right? Or he's trying to get through the gates, and they got him. Because he was holding a sack with a prince's head inside it. <laughs> which is You like, retard! That's <laughs> gross. Bad idea. I mean, um, might want to try something else. Of all the heads to have in a sack yes, that day, yeah. that oh, is dude, the been worst so funny. head to have in a sack. Opens up the sack, and it's the head of someone else. They're like, oh, that's fine. <laughs> oh, okay, carry on. We're looking for the prince's head. Off you go. Yeah. I honestly kind of wonder, like, what would make the head even necessary, though? Like, wouldn't it be pretty easy to find news. out? The... Well, I mean, like, that news, I think, would spread pretty fast, regardless, right? Yeah, like, that's, like... If you need, like, I'm, I would go back and be like, "Look, I killed him. You'll, you'll get the, you'll, you'll get the news in a few moments." I couldn't walk around carrying the head. Oh, I would drop I'm the shit. I'm fine waiting. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I would chuck that shit out the window or whatever. But I'd be like, the, yeah, I, I'm fine not getting paid until there's confirmation. I'll wait here it make, for it because it job's makes done. way more sense to be scared about uh, to have to have proof of a private citizen who c no one might ever see than the heir to the throne who is obviously going to be the only thing anyone's talking about for a while. Um, yeah, I, uh, I think if, if it were me, I would have dropped the head for sure. And if it, if it was a matter of proof, like you said, it would, it would spread pretty easily. But, uh, anyway, that, I mean, that's just on blood for deciding to do that. He didn't seem like a smart, smart dude, I suppose. Uh, the other thing was going to be, uh, that all these different things happening leads to her bursting in on Allison and Cole, uh, doing something that could get them both in serious trouble. Door is not locked. Um, that's a choice. <laughs> I would lock. I lock my door when I, and I and, and I live alone. So mm -hmm. you know, you it's, gotta you gotta take. You don't want someone just barging in and being like, "Hey, oh, what are you doing over there?" Uh, I would, if I were them, probably be taking the kind of precautions like backing something against the door so it cannot be easily opened if you can't lock it. I'd be doing... You, you guys want to be well, careful. Yeah, otherwise, Homer might kick down the door to show you his chainsaw and hockey mask, and exactly. you don't want that. <laughs> Does he be like, you want to see that. my new chainsaw? Like, <gasps> you oh too! My God. A horizontal hokey pokey! Worry about to everybody. <laughs> don't take a look. And so, uh, yeah. This scene... I appreciate it, but I have plenty of issues, and it's sort of uh, it's a bit wonky. Could use could use some gearing up, maybe, maybe some WD forty and some tweaking. Just tighten them screws here and there, uh, and then you find out what the book version is. Which to me, when I was told, I think the first line of what the book version is, I was like, oh, that's better. Um, but they've they've had to change it because they don't even have the characters right now to be able to create the scene that the book version has. So Is that the reason? Well, so it's the thing is I can't really know what I would assume the reason is from a storytelling perspective until I've seen either the whole show or at least the end of this right. season. Um because it's going to relate to how succession works for sure. But Helena and Aegon are supposed to have three kids. Oh, that word's giving me flashbacks. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but uh two sons, one daughter and the scene involves them telling her to choose which son, and uh, when she makes the choice, which uh, she offers her life first, which is something they didn't keep in this vision, uh, she does choose a son, and then they do the opposite of what she says, just to cruelly make the one that she chose to die uh, live through the experience. Which, I was like, man, that sounds really effective in terms of the that's horror of the scene. Real, that's a real jerk move. Um, you know, that and then there's rough. just... Other elements that makes it awkward that wouldn't have if if they work the same way. The whole like find out which one the boy is wouldn't be a thing. Um, 
And uh, the way that they do it is uh, because of security, they sneak up through... I forget exactly what it was. It's like into Alicent's room directly. And they capture her and wait until Helena comes to see her with the kids before they go to sleep. And then they capture all of them and then do the uh, do the deed. I think that's how it runs anyway. And um, you see depictions of it in animations or uh, summaries of like lore. And it seems like it would have been way more effective. IMO. I it just agree. seems like the way they've changed things to work introduces so many problems that they didn't need to deal with. And so, because I'm not even explaining it very well, you can go check it out on uh, YouTube to see the book version. It's I just was struck by how much better I thought it was, and so until I see why we did all these changes for sure, I can't speak to exactly whether or not this was something they had very little choice in, but for now it feels as though they... Uh, didn't do as good a job as they could have, uh, especially because it got built up quite a bit, and so the fans were a little disappointed with this, uh, book fans anyway. It's yeah, I can imagine why. Not quite what they were looking for. They were expecting something a little different. In any case, that was episode one. What did you guys think? Wow. Um, Overall, I liked it. I think it was a good start. Uh, obviously, the, the, the assassination stuff at the end, pretty weak. Uh, I think the Masaria stuff, also weak. And I think we need to get uh, a bit more on uh, Rhaenys. And those are kind of the three things that sort of stick out as sore spots for me. Uh, but I, I think that its strengths are uh, enough to where I was not put off. But yeah, definitely need to tighten those areas. It's a pretty strong reintroduction to the series, and it did a lot to, like... Yeah, help me stop being worried about the fact that Viserys is gone. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> I was somewhat concerned about how the show would be doing in terms of character without him around. But yeah, uh, this shows they have plenty going on in terms of development on all sides and plenty to work with. Yes, I think I'd agree with that. We're still of a very high quality level TV show and that the mistakes they make actually stick out a hell of a lot more because you don't expect it. You're like, wait, why would you guys do that? You know how to not yeah. do that. Especially talking about the you know assassination at the end. It just seems that uh, we actually it, it kind of reminds me of a, an odd in an odd sort of way with the um, with the Halo show uh, when we were watching oh, Halo. God. And um, it, it's that oh, element God. of you have something that you can use as a blueprint which makes it extra strange that you deviated from it in a way that was just decidedly worse. Um, mm -hmm. It makes you wonder kind of like, why did you want to feel like you didn't want to be beholden to the books on every detail? Did you want to like, what, what was the reasoning behind that? And I don't know. I don't know. I can't say, but uh, yeah, from what I hear, the book version sounds way better and more interesting, but I only know that because the, show version wasn't good i i imagine if the show version was really good i might not have n ever heard of or been told about well in the book version da, 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 so yeah i actually i'm inclined to agree i feel like they not only could have done the book version but they could have done their own version better so we're kind of exactly, losing both yeah, aspects it, there yeah if the core concept because they kept the element of the mother making a choice but we need more than that to make it a meaningfully effective choice in terms of the logistics and how characters would actually behave. Um, so, yeah, because it's not as if this is causing problems because it is like asynchronous with some causal chain that is being adapted one to one from the books. This is this has got problems because of the way it was constructed in isolation, yeah. right? So this isn't some adaptation problem. Well then, on to episode two, unless uh, anyone else wanted to say anything. Well, it's, yeah, it's a strong start to the season. I liked that uh, uh, Rhaenyra was MIA at the start, and you totally understand why, because she wants to find what was whatever might have been left of her son, and just to have that moment of grief, and then she comes back, and that was all good, and uh, I, f I think a forgivably weak ending with the thing i mean to be charitable to it like i guess you could argue that they're not the brightest bulbs in the drawer and it was such an intense situation that they weren't really thinking and you know i imagine like the two of them doing the thing at the bed and then one of them sees the woman leave and he's probably like uh should we 
let this happen and then she's like what whatever let's just get this done and then we'll figure it out we'll figure it out like we'll we'll stay alive we'll go into hiding if we have to and then not not really thinking it through but like Killing children a is a group pressure. activity, is what I've learned from mm. this episode. Which <laughs> I guess you I could agree, justify it with a, a mixture of, of. I think you could justify it with a mixture of pressure and just them not being that smart of guys. Twice but. as fast and half the guilt if you have a partner. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I think the the weird thing about this scene to me that I don't think we really touched on is it didn't really even seem like they tried to find Damon. Like, yeah, I think it almost implied that the rat catcher was just like, no, fuck trying to find Damon. There's a son right there. Let's He's just pretty good in a it. fight. So from what I hear, I yeah. thought that the justification they were giving us was that the handmaiden had spotted the, the blood. So he was like, all right, we're on a timer now. Just take whatever we can sort of thing. Um, but doesn't, mm. doesn't cheese already have Helena before, before blood gets to him? Like, oh yeah. He going I'm to just saying him, that. Like, hey, we, uh, that since that is happening, Blood's like, well, let's do it then. And and to be fair, that is the first person she's came across, right? Instead of Amond. You're right, though. They didn't mm -hmm. spend much time looking for Amond. Uh, but they wouldn't have found him. Yeah. Because he wasn't there. Womp, womp, womp. Womp, 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 womp. Well, here's an interesting question, because I've seen several people in chat sharing their opinion uh, of, of the peeps here. Is episode two better or worse than episode one? Hmm. Hmm. I am going to reserve judgment until after we discuss it, because I'm not sure off the top of my head. Also, because it's a little difficult with the way that my brain works to like. I remember all the events, but which episode things happen in is sometimes just fuzzy with me. Um, I might... think that episode two contains. Ah, oh, there's a really good scene in it. I really <laughs> like. Yes, there is. <laughs> Is That's this the twins-centric one? Yeah. The, yes. The one with the twins? Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. I thought that was obvious when I said episode two. Two twins, twins, two <laughs> gods. <laughs> twins, <laughs> one of, one of spirit, two of body. I am me, 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 me and me and you. Or whatever they say at the Boonta Tree. Fuck it. I don't, I think, I don't know. I think episode two's highs are higher than episode one's. Yeah. I'm just what thinking the about the lows, lows now. Yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't feel like I ha I've picked apart the lows enough to really have a solid opinion because my instinct was to say two was a lot better. <laughs> and I yeah, feel my, like I'm my intuitive not think that by the end of this, my, my intuitive assessment is that the lows are about the same. I I'm think not so. Sure. I think so. Are we going to count not having a scene where Alicent and Eamon talk about what happened? Are, are we going to consider that a low of episode one? Technically, it wasn't I, in there. I guess but... the thing is, uh, is, is Miss Potential a low in the same way that a thing that played out in a way that was um, disappointing is a low? I'm not I don't sure. Think so. I, I don't think, think so. I think it... I think it is fair to hold missed opportunities against the writing to a lower degree. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's fair, yeah. Well, this then. is episode two has a scene that I, because I think my the best scene in episode one is uh, Rhaenyra and Jace. Um, that's probably the best scene. Uh, but the best scene in episode two features your boy Otto. Your boy. <laughs> hey guys, what's up here? It's your boy Otto Hightower. It's your boy Otto coming Otto at you with another watch. great piece I would of absolutely advice. watch Otto Hightower on Twitch. Like, Otto yeah, Hightower, Hightower saying Hightower saying exactly that introduction in his manner yeah. of speech. Oh yeah, yeah. His intonation. <laughs> he does angry reviews of NES games, all right? And SNES oh, sometimes. Oh yes, that would be really good if he talks about why he loves Super Mario World. <laughs> he sits down. <laughs> He's in like the old medieval room, and it's, brilliant. it's 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 all period accurate except for the TV with the NES except on the it. TV, but yeah. otherwise, and, and it's completely normal. And you look behind it; it, it doesn't actually be... like plug into anything. It's a CRT <laughs> TV, okay? It's it's an old like <laughs> old 80s school, CRT yeah. TV. Yeah, that's right. When I'm not giving the king my wise counsel, <laughs> I'm in my room enjoying the <laughs> the Nintendo Entertainment System. Before we begin <laughs> this review, I'd like to talk about <laughs> better help. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. He would never do that. 
Oh, Even the hand of the like, king needs help sometimes. I'm now like imagining <laughs> Allison walking in to ask him something and then he runs over and slams the door shut. <laughs> it's just like, anyway, what was I saying? All right. It's either that or there's that awkward pause where they just kind of stare at each other and what? she's I'm thinking the of the Professor away. Psychotic thing. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking of now. <laughs> just him. And then Allison, yo, you're being incredibly loud. People are trying to sleep. <laughs> 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 it's not even that late though. I mean, oh, it's 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 my volume, is it? Yeah, yeah, your volume. <laughs> Allison, it is nine p.m. Who the fuck goes to sleep at nine p.m.? Normal people, Dad. <laughs> There's no normal people in this family. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the episode begins with the everyone in the house staff being rounded up. Naturally, gonna want to make sure we know who the fuck was behind what. Um, and, uh, we see Aegon is going nuts, saying, uh, I'll kill them, I'll kill them all, I am the king, and he's smashing, uh, he uh Viserys' Lego set, which is very sad. It's very, symbolic. very sad, and yes, it's pretty symbolic. <laughs> well, so, yeah, I would, so the primary interpretation I get is that Aegon will be part of the bigger reason that Viserys' long-held and well-built peace will come to an end. I think it's interesting, actually, considering what the best scene of this episode is, that it begins with this happening, because the end of the episode, or close to the end of the episode, is the acknowledgement of Viserys' legacy, which I think, like, season one the whole time, hmm. it's, it's always dealing with all of the problems. I mean, even he says, like, will I be remembered? Because, you know... My uh, my reign was, like, not very eventful or anything, and it's like it all kind of... Yeah, that's what you You start want, to think, like... <laughs> Well, that's nope. the thing, is is that him destroying it, it's like, it's kind of your first reminder of, man, things are already, like, way worse after mm. he's gone. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, you know, destroyed by worse. the wrath and rancor of family against family. <laughs> Which, Which all he was doing when he was alive was yeah, telling them to stop mm -hmm. doing. <laughs> he's like, please, it's like the <laughs> one thing you guys fuck up on all the time. Mm -hmm. Do you know how much gold that Lego set was? It's I like a 100,000 <laughs> piece set. It was a good one. Very, very sad. But uh, it's like a hundred Lego Death Stars. It's also uh, being it's um, old Only Valyria, the king right? Can afford that? such a treasure. I believe it's old Valyria. Yeah. <laughs> and so destroying it feels very symbolic of the destruction of House Targaryen in general, rather than just yep. uh, specifically the family who he belongs to with the series, which also happens to be Targaryen. But you know, it's it's good shit. It's multi layered. I like it a lot. Um, yeah, and Aemond notices that the. Uh, the entryway and exit was through the study that he was actually in as well. A little bit. Uh, it's like, you know, yeah, well, I mean, it's just like if the hours were different, if certain things had gone just slightly different, then uh, very different results could have taken place. Uh, there's, there's, there's plenty, I think, of str like strong scenes in this. It's just the when what Fringy was highlighting is there's a there's a goated one because I saw someone saying like one good scene does not make a good episode. It's like no, I don't think that's what was meant by it. But it's really good, okay? Because yeah. this mm -hmm. um, we got a starter one here with uh, Allison and Otto, which is always they're always really good scenes between these two. Cause it's, it's just they're always kept very consistent as to the nature of their relationship, right? She's talking about how she's losing her shit after this. Obviously, she would be. And she even tries to make focus that it's, like, about what her daughter's going to have to go through as a result of all of this. And um, Otto puts his hands on her, and she turns away from him. The amount of times they've showed us that in this family, none of them do well with, like, any kind of... Family, yeah. Just, just taking care of each other emotionally. Mm-hmm. Um, always rejected, and Otto tries an angle of, like, we will punish who did this, as opposed to, you know, how are you feeling and how are you going to be able to get through this? What should we, how should we deal with, like, you know, Helena? What should we say? What should we do? Because that's what this world is. It's like, we're going to fucking find the person who did this. We're going to torture them indefinitely. That's the sort of, like, in immediate thought. Um, and she says, uh, what if the hand that did this isn't the one to be punished? And she implies that it's her fuck ups is why like this is happening. The gods have punished her. And uh, Otto says, "For what sin?" And of course, uh, she's not going to make that clear just yet. Um, but he says, "Some good may come of this," which is a bit strange to say in the initial minutes of 
a little boy getting his head chopped off. But that's, uh, yep. that's, that's a very for you. Ottawa thing to say. Otto it's, High it's Tower's, very Otto thing. Otto High Tower's coping mechanism is <laughs> opportunism. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is, you let him do his shit, how, and it'll be true. <laughs> how like, can I make? How can I make some lemonade? Essentially, is yep. how he copes with things going wrong. Yeah, I think even early on, I think their relationship or his relationship with um, Alicent is soured by the fact that she knows, since a kid, she's been used by him as a political pawn. Mm. Like that's that scene where he sends her off to to make a connection with uh, King Viserys. Like, you, you might wear mo one of your mother's dresses. Like, that's such a sinister scene, like, heartbreak, like, stomach-sinking scene, where it's just, like, you realize er that early on, like, there's no real... Well, I guess, not that there's no love there, but it's just, like, she is a primarily a political pawn to him. The, and the... it's just her mother. Her mother isn't there to fight in her court, and just like reminded of that fact with the line of "You might wear one of your mother's dresses." Like mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's so, so sad. I think one would argue that all of the effort, which has actually led to some pretty effective results, like Otto knows what he's doing in relation to politics and sort of social dynamics to get people where he wants them, has overthrown and completely ignored like the emotional support and development that everyone in his family needs, probably including himself. Uh, and it's had drastic repercussions that we've seen. Almost all of them are complete fuck-ups. None of them know how to handle anything emotional that happens to them. They've all, in one way or another, essentially been abused uh, in that format, and now they project it onto other people, or they force other people into that sort of upbringing through not having any of the tools taught to them of how to deal with any of it. And they're not about to start now. Uh, we see several examples of opportunities that they see the tumbling of other family members. And instead of doing something about it, they'll usually comment on another family member or with another family member about how, yeah, that one, we're going to have to look after that one. We're going to have to see about that one. You know what I mean? It's like tactically. I think episode four has the biggest uh, example of that that we'll get to. Well, whenever we get to it. Mm -hmm. so. it's, it's, it's so sad to see that it's never seen as a loved one needs help. It's always seen as the political pawn is fucking up and we need to get him in place. Yeah. Um, but you do see glimmers. Like, I, I do think that in that scene with Otto and Allison, he, he sees she's in immense pain and he does try to put a hand on her back and she, like, backs off from it, which just goes to show that it's not something they do. She's not used to that. She doesn't mm -hmm. want it. And it's like, well, that's that, I suppose. Um, yeah. So, we get the Green Council, and they're trying to figure out what to do about this horrible event. Uh, Cole makes it clear he was abed, having ordered the King's Guard, which, to be honest with you, I'd probably be more furious in his, at, at him for that than usual because of the fact that they have so few King's Guard active. You know, it probably should be everyone's on duty until you get replacements. Uh, it's just, you know, but the, Aegon is furious anyway. He's just completely acting out about all this. Obviously, he would be. And he says, uh, who would do this other than the bitch queen of bastards? And because it's visual language, when he says that, the camera cuts over to Laris entering the room. That's pretty interesting, is it not? Hmm. I wonder if that's going to mean anything going forward, because uh, for the record, in the first four episodes, we got nothing that says he did anything. But having a line like that and then showing Laris entering is very sus. He's always up to something. He's always scheming. He is. And yeah, this is what He's they say. He's a schemer. Uh, it says they caught a man fleeing the gates with a sack containing the head of the prince. So more than likely, he was connected to it. <laughs> We've, uh, he might seems... have something to do with it, unless he thought, oh, hey, this is neat. I found I this found outside, this I swear it wasn't me. <laughs> looked like it was a good sack. But yeah, I well, home. haven't even looked inside it. What's in there? I mean, this show, I think it, it is written well, despite a few hiccups here and there, but it is also a very well-directed show and uh, probably really well storyboarded. And oh, so, sure, like, yeah. when, when, when it cuts to a certain person over top a certain line, you know that it's probably intentional and there's, there, it's like a setup for something. It's another thing the Acolyte utterly fails at. <laughs> where no it's kidding. just like there's no discipline in the direction and the blocking. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
So uh, they warn Aegon he's not going to want to kill the guy straight away because they can get information as to whether or not it was Rhaenyra or if it was, as they describe, a serpent nestled closer to our bosom. And um, Otto says, in a way, it doesn't even matter because they're going to be blaming Rhaenyra whether or not it was her. Um, and Aegon's actually against this because he said it'll make me seem weak. Then Otto's like, you're already seen as weak, Aegon, which is like, hmm. <laughs> a bit aggressive there, you know. It's, it's, yeah, it's probably not going to have the best results. To say that. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll still see where that leads. His attitude on his uh, thoughts on Aegon, um, but I think it just goes to show a lot of people just don't like they don't like they don't fear him as king. No, but which is is just kind of weird because people took the shit Viserys said very seriously. Viserys would put his foot down, and you knew not to fuck with him when he did, but. When it comes to Aegon, it's like, you know, for all the bluster and his, you know, attitude, people don't really take him. They just don't take him seriously. Yeah, and he has a line where he says, um, I'm not going to let my little son's body be dragged through the streets, which uh, is another like, aw. Because even though he's kind of a, a horrible dick in a lot of ways, you, you're going to give him some room on this one since his son just got his head chopped off, you know? A lot of people will probably be pretty yep, mad 100%. about that. Um, yep, it's probably all we get of him caring about the kids, like in both seasons. Well, that's what I was saying about the 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 work has been done to add other layers to this character, yeah. and uh, it's it's struck quite a few people. There's a great, interesting. I don't know if it's irony, but it's it's certainly an interesting look at how the world seems to hate Kristen Cole. There's all kinds of memes and posts about how he's the worst person <laughs> ever and needs to die. Aegon, on the other hand, gets several posts being like, you know, I kind of like him. And when you compare the things those two have done, you'd be yeah, like, how the hell did this happen? They ain't even close. How is how's Kristen not winning that? <laughs> you know, like I said, we'll go over it the more Kristen content we get to. But uh yeah, Otto says not dragged through the streets, honored to be burned in the dragon pit as a Targaryen prince. And obviously it's very tactical as a as an advantage. And there's this little moment where Aegon sort of reaches out to Allison and says, Mother, like 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 as a what are we doing here? And she basically just says, Yeah, Otto is right. And uh he uh, he he suggests as well that it would be the queen and the queen dowager with the body to best express through the gentle souls the sorrow that the the kingdom has to face that sort of thing. Very um morbid, but uh, I mean, what would you guys say if you're on this council? I feel like I probably, especially in this world, would be like, yeah, that's probably a good move, I guess. Um, I, it's pretty I feel cynical like... and gross, but he's right. Mm -hmm. there is an element of you can spin this into a good thing and there is an element of earnest sympathy gathering here in a way if those three words could be together but um yeah i probably would too especially when you need as much support as you possibly can with the political tensions that are happening can't blame them it's um it's interesting how it works right because you'd be like well there's reason to do it in a caring and loving way and it's like uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. We could do it for that reason too. <laughs> but I'm mainly talking about the practical reasons, all right? Because uh, that's, I guess, Otto's job, which again helps explain like his his practicality and how good he is at that side of the job explains why he's so shit at the other side of the job of being a father, a, f a familial leader as well. But yeah, um, Allison explains to Elena that they need to do this, and um, she says. Uh, she doesn't want to, and uh, it's uh, it's interesting as Alicent said, it, it it draws the public closer to us to do something like that, and she says, I don't want them closer, I don't even know them, which um, is probably some of the most realistic and genuinely innocent. That's, that's why people feel pretty bad mm -hmm. for this character, she doesn't belong here. Like it's, she's just a normal person, even though she's the least normal, arguably, in a sense of how her brain works, but... Uh, Definitely not trying to fuck everyone over to benefit herself in any way, shape, or form. His very simple values. Yeah. Very normal, just person. Oh, and um, the sort of funeral um, material she's sewing for Jaehaerys, uh, as people have pointed out, she started sewing it in episode one before the event even took place, presumably to do with her uh, broken up foresight somewhat. She, um... And it's kind of spooky and scary that that's something that you could just do almost automatically without even realizing it. But mm -hmm. um, 
One thing I was going to ask yeah, everybody well. is, what do you think of, I forget her name, but the actress playing um, Elena and the choices they've made with her for expressing emotion? She, I like it because I think um, it kind of sets her apart from the rest in this kind of earnestness um, that she expresses. Her, she, she's distant in this odd kind of way. Like there's something else that's constantly preoccupying her. But you can still, but she's still a person who's present in the sense that, you know, when one of her kids is killed, it clearly affects her and she has opinions on it. But she's a little bit, I don't want to say scatterbrained, but it feels like almost like her thoughts are preoccupied with something else constantly. Um, and I think it's, I think it's interesting. She does that well. She presents that idea well, and I can believe it. Yeah, I haven't looked at the performance closely enough, but it didn't stick out to me as bad at all. Like, it's it was quite something of a good. discussion that was happening. My impression was essentially the same as uh, Rags. I got from what she was choosing to do slash directed to do that they were telling me she is not conventional in terms of how her mind deals with almost everything, not just grief. And so it was expected that we'd see her deliver something of a complicated performance in terms of how she's going to accept and process this all of these events and i do think she's doing a great job i feel she's very consistent on that sort of impression i don't uh, a lot of people felt that she was just underplaying everything and not bringing in more emotion but i i do think it's a uh she's trying to portray a particular uh yeah variable. i mean that's obviously deliberate well absolutely she stands out there she stands out in a way that is intentional I would argue it's very deliberate considering she clearly has the, uh, like I said, it's referred to as a dreamer, but like they don't, you don't even need a name for it. They've been showing her throughout season one and two. That she, yeah, she's, she's different. She's not the same as everybody else. So the idea that she would have a different kind of performance in relation to grief makes, you know, it's, it makes a lot of sense. But I would give the people a bit of room and say that they probably saying even with that, they feel like her performance isn't enough, which is like, I guess at that point. Um, I think it's just, yeah, I just disagree with that. I yeah. I don't think it should be. I think it's appropriately subtle and appropriately um not subtle, uh obvious. Uh but yeah, I I'm a, I'm a fan of it. I like it. The I uh, think it's been effective in an intentional way. When they're conducting the the event, you have um Allison has her hand on her leg and she won't take her hand. I thought that was another just they they very consistently keep showing all of the little ways that the how much love is lost between the um the family members so uh laris has blood captured and he lays out tools and it immediately blood starts confessing everything that damon paid them that he did it with along with a rat catcher but he doesn't know his actual name and uh then he says he's not going to hurt him but he can't speak for aegon who i think we're supposed to believe essentially kills him straight away um the one thing I find curious about this the play. is that uh, Aegon will go on to capture and kill all the rat catchers. I would have thought you'd want to keep this guy alive just so he can pick the face out, you know? Um, yeah, he, he, like once he comes into that room, he kills him, essentially, um, which I get. Like I said, I mean, in a way, that's like super lucky for that guy that nothing far worse was done. But yeah, I think it's a tactical blunder to not use him. I think he's just totally running on emotion. You'd think yeah, that uh, Laris... a tactical blunder from Aegon to me. Uh, I think that's fair. That. Uh, I would have thought Laris might have suggested, like, if we if we keep him alive just a little bit longer, we can definitively have... Because the thing is, I mm -hmm. would have thought they'd say to Aegon, you don't want to just beat this guy in the head and hang the other one. I assume you want to drag this out. They killed your son. Like, I assume you want to do more to him than that. Which I would have thought Aegon would be completely on board with, but... Um, there is a there is totally a, a viable thing if he just wanted to kill the fuck out of this guy as soon as he saw him. I get that. I'm just saying that uh, would have solved their problem right, yeah. a little bit. Um, also, yeah, uh, as uh, Gary had mentioned as well, it's like I was really hoping this scene wouldn't end the way of having the boy's head come off because of how much rocking and difficulty the uh, carriage was having. Yeah, I was worried about that too. I'd be like, Ugh, that would have been would have been rough. Uh, <laughs> that would have been an image. I, th I think it's plenty just to have, yeah. like, the way the body sort of vibrates in response to the carriage rumbling over the stones. Like, the way the head subtly moves, like, you can tell it's detached to a degree. 
like I thought that was plenty. Like that that would have been Oh yeah, props to the yeah, actor. He prop. really pulled it off super well. And at that age, really, really <laughs> Well it's funny you say that. I'm not sure if that was the actor or not, because I think they had a doll prop. for the uh the scene he pops up in. No, right. It was a three D scan and it, it's yeah. all like a it's a mold. Ah. It's it's not a real thing. Well that would have been my guess is what I was saying. Because when you see he pops up with Rhaenyra in the in the dream, if you remember as well. It's just like, oh, they yeah, yeah. At that point, I was like, oh, they had the thing for both of them because that's kind of useful. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, they got these no, uh, the VFX, the uh, special effects. They have these three D scanner guns now. They just go over actors' faces <laughs> until they get a full yep model. Kojima's got like a new Hollywood actor on his Twitter or Instagram like every week because he's just scanning someone else in for the new Death Stranding. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, back over to uh, the Blacks having a council for this event, figuring out what the hell's going on. And um, they essentially, she realizes her whole council thinks she actually did it when she's like, why the fuck would I ever do that? Which... You know what? Typically speaking, isn't the greatest response to an accusation. Like, why would I do it? Because it's like, well, probably best get to the point of saying it was impossible for you to do it, because otherwise they'll just start explaining all of their reasons for why they clearly think you'd do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I think it's it's a reasonable response that someone, yeah, the, the first thing it. someone would say would be like, character reason why. She doesn't think about the logistics. Oh, she yeah, thinks actually, about like, my character as such, yeah. Quite like what she says, you know, the, uh, why would I do to Helena what happened to me when she's completely innocent. But, like, I think a lot of them don't understand that as reasoning. You know, they're, they're kind of just like, I mean, because you're mad. <laughs> like, you're mad. You just made a mistake. I, don't know. I think one of them says, right, like, he's, uh, you know, you, you got really upset, and, and that's something you might have done. Um, and then she, she does not take that very no, well. No. like, you uh, fucker. Yeah, he um he says a lot of things that gets him in a bit of trouble. That that lad. Uh, yes, and they have not. Um, yeah, so so there's ravens going around the whole kingdom saying she did it, and she said, you know, we'll then send bonus ravens to fucking tell him I didn't, and we'll use our ravens to fight their ravens. Misinformation fight. Uh, yeah, and during Fake news. the conversation, it's it's the closest you get to comedy in a show like this. Uh. They're all speculating on who could have done it, and Rainice looks over at Damon, and he notices she's looking at him. And it's not quite a smile, but it's definitely a, what? Yeah, I did it. <laughs> of course I fucking did it. Who gives a shit? I get it. I did it. And then uh, R Rhaenyra realizes that too. And we get what would have probably been the goat scene for the episode, if not for another one. But uh, to be honest with you, it really depends, because a lot of people think this one is as well. He's, uh, is, is Rhaenyra and Damon having a bit of a squabble? Um, squibbly squabbly. Yeah, I don't know. His, Damon is a character, right? Like, he's, he's such a chaotic asshole in a lot of ways, the, having them all figuring out what's happening while he's just sitting there knowing what happened. It's, it's, um, it's, it's a weird kind of amusing. Yeah, it is. Anyway, uh... There's a lot that gets discussed in this scene, so I guess we'll take it piece by piece. Uh, he makes clear that he gave specific orders and what's happened isn't really exactly what he was gunning for. But he does name drop Masaria as being the reason he knew, um, which I thought the second he would have said that, she's going to want to speak to her now. But I, t I would have thought she would have spoken to her anyway, because that's a pretty interesting well, because person. because of who she is, yeah. and yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. She is very unique. Well, and you want to make sure we, we know what we're doing with someone like that, you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, we, you want to be on the same page. Like, so are we killing her? Are we not? Are we using her for a while? What, what Are we promising, promising her something? What's going on exactly? Um, This, though, uh, scenes like this, it's just, I don't know, Matt Smith, man, he's fucking great. Uh, loads of subtle performance things. Do, do you remember uh, season, well, the, the best episode of season one, episode eight, where he's... Right. he He's... His, the, the performance he gives when, when he first goes in the room with Viserys, uh, when he's at his worst, essentially, health-wise. Yes, and he just, like, can't bear to look at him, like, holy fuck, look at this there's guy. There's that, and oh, there's... Man, it hurts he's, so much. Uh, 
Uh, he's stuttering his sentences here and there. It's it, I remember being so struck by the performance. I was like, God damn it, he's so good. Like he, I completely believe right now that he can't look at his brother because it not only represents someone he loves falling apart, but also just the weakness of House Targaryen, which is the complete opposite of anything that he believes in. Um, this scene, you've got a lot of nuance, I would argue, in his performance of trying to deal with the fact that he himself has not actually figured out exactly what he wants to do. Um, he's Which, uh, chaos incarnate. Much more apparent as as uh, time goes on, that he's in, he actually is not very. Uh, yeah, he doesn't he doesn't know what uh what his goals are really. And so she says to him, "What were your instructions if they failed to find Aemond?" And he face palms. And she says, "You you know you said you're gonna spill High Tower blood. If not Aemond, anyone would do." And then he says, "No." And she says, you've wounded me, weakened my claim, my standing among my own council, my ability to raise an army. And his response to that is, I said no. Like, I think he... It's, it's unclear exactly, because uh, a son for a son, any son would do. It's, it's, we didn't get that explicitly from the scene. Is that what he said? But, like, you'd think, with everything we know, the fact that they were going to deliver the head of Jaehaerys to him to get paid, surely he did? Like, why would they do it unless he had made that clear that that was going to be something he'd reward them for? Yeah, mm. why would you carry that around? Um, but this is why it's a complicated bit of dialogue that I love thinking about. Is he saying no to the fact that he would have ordered that, or no to the idea that she's talking about how much he's weakened everything to do with her, and that, um, you know, like, like, like whether or not she is believes it from him. his. Yeah, is it from his perspective he thinks this makes her seem more fierce and uh, worthy of respect and, like, more vicious? Um, and that, to him, is a good thing. That's something he craves, in a sense, and so she should be happy that people think this of her in his own twisted way? Or uh, is it something else? Just to be ultimately clear, I think the scene goes, uh, Cheese says, what if we can't find Eamon, and then they cut after uh, Damon giving a bit of an expression. I think the show wants to be ambiguous on what he said about that because he doesn't confirm it either. As in, like... This would be the chance for him to do that, yeah. Well, like, like the the thing that's super interesting about it is we have to run the, uh, the Aemond sort of stuff. How much does Damon want to admit to, you know? Because this is a fuck-up, right? And if you remember from season one, he absolutely hates being registered as a failure. That's, like... It's, it's like, the worst thing for him. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, he's it, asked the scenario. So how much would he admit to at any time in terms of the truth? It's hard to say. Um, but she makes a pretty big statement that's been a long time coming, saying she basically can't trust him, and she never really could, and that she always wanted to, but that he's always kind of just been out for himself. And he says he's faithfully served her. And then she says, yeah, that, or you've used me as a tool to try and grasp at your stolen inheritance, which makes him very fucking mad. And it's kind of fun for us, because this is something that they've never really talked about properly, despite always being there. Yep. If, you know, he, she is, she got the, she got in front of him in the line, because of Viserys. Mm -hmm. uh, and he says, like, you know, I put the crown on your head. And then she says, yeah, and what were you doing when I was essentially, like, you know, laboring in, a, uh, in episode 10 of season 1? He was essentially trying to organize the war. Which, you can argue, this is why this is complicated. That doesn't mean he's, like, traitoring her or anything. He's just trying to move the war forward. But on the other hand, maybe he is kind of just like, listen, I'm in charge, okay? Just let me let me be the king. Yep. This, uh, which I think is actually the, the reality. He's not even 100% sure of exactly what it all means. Um... And he says, you know, the reason he was doing it because he didn't want to give up his brother's throne to the traitorous lies of Otto, Otto Hightower. And what, what's great about the line, like, the complaint, she says, my throne, my throne, David. And it's like, oh, shit, yeah. Like, like referring to it as Viserys is. Which, you know, at the time, you could say is more accurate than it is right now. It's just that it's not necessarily something he's fully accepted, that the Iron Throne belongs to Rhaenyra. Which mm -hmm. I think is uh, supported mm -hmm. in his future hallucinations slash vision slash whatever is happening at well just the Adam choice Hall. he even made you know the choices that he made of going there in the first place and uh yeah she says she thinks he likes to indulge the darkness you sheathe within you like a blade which is 
You get some fun flowery language in the lines in this. I always like it. The, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, old speak, where they 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 have poetry in the way that they talk to each other. <gasps> fun. Fun on the There are fun. no skibbity words. I don't know what they mean. Yeah, and and and, and you know you love a bit of skibbity to be thrown in, but you know what? Maybe it's maybe it's for the best that we don't have that. Maybe it's for the best it's we don't have people saying the Jedi take some L's. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> Power is powerful metaphorical visual language that makes the point clear. Like there's actual utility in it, you know, to convey a certain idea from one character to another. It's not just flowery, you know, um, visually heavy for no reason, you know. Mm -hmm. Comes across as just educated something. and meaningful, yeah. The way that you speak is what we've talked, to, talked about in terms of like opportunities. It's not just what people say, it's how they say it, how they express themselves. And it's a way to contrast people who speak very well and who appear to be very learned to people who are maybe they got other things to do in their lives. Maybe people who are like, commoners and whatnot. They're not going to have the same kind of way of speaking as someone who's kind of trained to speak and who's more educated and well-read. I want to. So. I, I want to reassure people before we start getting fucking mass suicides. No, there wasn't an actual line in in Acolyte where they said the Jedi took some L's. It was in an interview. Uh, Leslie Hemingway. <laughs> <having gone. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine? Mother Anasaya, I want to be part of the Jedi. You can't. The Jedi have taken some big L's lately. <laughs> yeah, we saw that same soul explaining the thing to the Council. I took a big L that day. I took a big L. Uh, they're gonna take some L's, no cap, for real, for real. No, no more L's on my watch. <laughs> no cap, for real. So, uh, anyway, David says, uh, do you think me a monster? And, and she says, uh, I know not what you are or who you serve. And he's genuinely upset by this shit, and I find it super interesting. He says, am I not on my way even now to raise an army at Harrenhal in your name? Um, like, I do believe that he thinks... That in his in himself he's got the conflict of whether or not he actually wants her to be queen, but his actions on the surface do match someone that was supporting her, and he's not being treated that way. Mm -hmm. And so it's like this really interesting bit of conflict where he's arguing for a position that I don't know that he's fully on board with, but does thinks he deserves to be seen as. He can um, meaningfully raise down in someone who doesn't believe him based on his track record. Yes. And so she says, Do you accept me as your queen and ruler? Or do you cling even now to what you think you've lost? Which is a pretty big question. And you, you see in Matt Smith's face the frustration seep in when she uses the specific word and he repeats it back. He says, what I think I've lost? It's like, yeah, oh. if, you, if you look at him from season one to two, it's like, he thinks it was fucking ripped from him. Thinks he lost. That's an interesting way to put it. And she says, uh, you gave it away because you only ever thought of your own glory and not of my father in his grief who needed you. Which is like, oh shit, now we're getting to some really deep stuff. Um, these guys have issues. They've not properly sorted them out. Family, no, you know? They have not. And there is it's a lot. A, uh, it's been a long time since they actually assessed where they stand with respect to one another, it seems. Yes. Uh, yeah, and he says, your father was a coward who knew I was the stronger son and he was afraid to be seen in my shadow. Which, Ooh. as someone who's seen the events unfold, Damon, bro, <laughs> no, you need to, you need, to, you need to take a. <laughs> this is a big L for you, Damon. That's it's such you, a. Because, because Damon's it's the thing. taking it's, some big L's this episode. So. It's a unique POV that we have. Uh, I got, I got nothing but love for the series. I would happily admit if he had flaws in certain ways, but it's like he was not afraid of you. Uh, the sad thing is when you watch over the episodes. He loved the shit out of Damon. He just wanted him to be normal. That's, he was, was disappointed yeah. in Damon. He's like, why can't you just be normal? Yeah. Why can't you be what I know you can be? Why can't you harness all of this aggression and everything to something that's productive and good? I've given you so many chances. I've set you up for success in so many places. And you just keep being yourself. Yeah. Literally just like, just help me out here, dude, kind of. You know? Throw the, me the, a fucking bone. The one that kills me the most is, um, I want to say it's episode seven, or it could be six. It's just, it's whenever the, um, the series is on like a seat and Damon is just too far away to speak to and he keeps looking over at him and they both recognize clearly that the series keeps looking at him, but he won't come to him. And then 
I think it's like 20 minutes into the episode, he has to walk over to him himself and be like, how are things? It's like, oh, <laughs> the poor fucking yeah. guy. He just wants to be happy with you, man. I think he even says, um, uh, the gods have been kind to you or something, and David says they've not been kind to you. And it's just a, a moment of just like, yep, that, that, that was something you needed <laughs> to say. Anyway, like, let's talk about something else. Thanks, bro. I think he knows. Um... And, uh, yeah, uh, he eventually says to, uh, sh sorry, she says, is that what you understand of your own brother? And he says, do you believe he made you heir because of your great wisdom and your virtue? Um, or did he merely use you as a tool to put me in my place because he was afraid of me because he knew your legacy, unlike mine, would never outshine his own? Which is, like, damn, dude. Ultra harsh. It's so harsh, because that's not at all what the series even cared about. I think if Viserys found out that ultimately Rhaenyra's reputation would be far beyond his own, he'd be happy about that, probably. Like, good for you. I don't think you would care as much as Damon believes he would about, like, you know... I wonder he, how much Damon even believes that. Yeah, it could be said to just in anger and also to, uh... He's very frustrated right now. Like, if you asked him honestly in a more, you know, in a calmer well, moment. Repeating the whole fear thing uh, is, is why it's it's a little great moment for Rhaenyra, because she sort of gets pretty mad about it and says, he was not afraid of you, he couldn't trust you. And it's like, that's it. <laughs> that's the one. Yeah. That's the one you were looking for. Uh, and she says, any more than I can trust you. Um, to which Damon says, he was a fool who sought greatness but shrank from spilling blood to achieve it, and I see you will suffer the same fate. And it's a really strong line, because there's a lot of truth to a lot of the things that it would apply to, but she responds pretty quick with, you killed a kid. Like, is, is, <laughs> that, is that in and, the uh... fucking requirements of being great, like killing children? And um, it hits so hard, he just, all he says back is, it was a mistake. Which uh, I really love as a line, because I keep thinking about whether or not he's saying... The whole operation was a mistake, or it was a mistake that Jaharis died, or it was a mistake to not be more specific. Like, or the, what? Where exactly does that start and end? And you can clearly tell it's affecting him, even though he tries to play it cool. The killing that kid was obviously fucked yeah. up. Um, yeah, and she says you're pathetic, which you know, not a great, uh, mm, not a great conversation for them too. Well, the and not even he knows where the line is drawn. Like yeah. he doesn't even know how to answer that question. It's just like I don't like the way it turned out, but I don't know where ex what I should have done different exactly. I mean, a lot of shit's getting discussed here. That's super complicated and has an insane amount of history. I think uh, both actors did a phenomenal job, and I find it kind of fascinating to think about because. Um, I don't know where Damon's brain sits right now. It's part of what's making him such an interesting character to see, literally speak in any scene. Just see what he gets up to. Um, but yes. Not in a great position, either of them. Certainly not with each other. No. And, uh, yeah, I think, like I said, that would probably go for the top-tier goated scene, but it'll have, um, it'll have some competition coming Bit up. Of competition, yeah. So, moving on from there, we have um, this is By the, the way, moment. Just, oh, go ahead. Just because it's it's kind of just occur occurring to me. If if people haven't noticed already, um, a lot of stuff happens in these episodes. This is an hour that is jam packed with things happening, conversations taking place, pieces being moved around. These episodes are thick with stuff occurring. There's never a dull moment, really. Something's always getting done. Uh, in contrast to other shows we've been watching lately. I won't name names, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but uh, it's really nice oh, yeah, to get you're that. right. There's several angles to consider, lots of history, and then lots of nuanced subtext and little micro-expressions that can tell you it's, everything. It's vaguely theatrical, this scene, and it's set up. Like, I love the way they sort of chase each other around the room as, like, yes, it's yeah. the tempo of the conversation. Like, who is... Oh, he, the, um, like, he outright resists choking her at one point. Yeah, uh, well, it's like that old Hollywood thing where, like, the distance and dynamic in terms of blocking between the actors is telling its own story. 
Yeah, exactly. Like if this was if this was muted, you could almost get a sense of what's what the dynamic of the argument is, like who's winning, who's losing mm -hmm. in any given moment. Well, and uh, it feels like it's come across probably the best time because this would be something of a deal breaker to go and assassinate a baby, essentially. Um, and so, yeah, you need to figure out exactly how this happened. Because uh, it's just been mentioned in chat, I just thought it said, someone said that uh, it's, it's kind of proven the point, though, that um, you can't handle the realities of war and that some plenty of kids will ultimately die. And I would argue that you can go that direction with it, but I also think the opposite is being, being proven. That the need for action to take place has its uh, downfall compared to not taking action, which is you get innocent kids killed, or rather uh, people killed who shouldn't be killed that are going to cause loads more people to be killed. Like this yeah, was a huge spiral blunder. out of control. As well, we said, get this in tactically, episode... this was a mistake, not just for the fact that an innocent person died, but all the repercussions that will come from this. Yeah, we'll get, um, as is mentioned very specifically later on by the Lord of Harrenhal, this element of, like, yeah, this, can't even remember where it started, but it's just blood happens, blood happens, killing, killing, it just keeps going and going, and it just might never end. Because it got out of hand once, long ago. Yes, and they show um, Damon doesn't give any time to Bela here, there's a little scene for it. Uh, that would be one of his daughters. I'm not sure if that's going to go somewhere specific, but it feels like they don't show us anything that's not going to go somewhere, so we'll see. Um, mm -hmm. Rhaenyra tells Baylor that she's going to need her to essentially keep an eye on King's Landing, make sure. Uh, things are Nothing surprising is happening. Have a look around, see if anyone's moving around, armies and such. That'll be uh, important for later. And then Damon and Caraxes leave for Harrenhal, which... We'll see more next episode. <gasps> the, another sad scene coming up that is uh, just compounding the problem of the Greens and family life. Uh, Aegon crosses paths with Helena, and it's really sad to see them both see each other and stop for a moment, recognizing there's probably something they should do, and then Aegon leaves. Yep. And so it doesn't Doesn't happen. do anything. Pretty rough. I have no fucking idea how to handle it. Yeah, and she just runs off, and you feel nothing but sadness for this entire tragic family uh, who have no idea how to support each other. But hey, yeah, what happens, I suppose. And then another well, sad I mean, it scene. Contrasts pretty, it contrasts pretty sharply with uh, Rhaenyra and Jace, where mm. he's attempting to conduct his uh, duties stoically while breaking down because he's obviously very upset, and then Rhaenyra actually comforts him like a real person would. It's, uh, yeah, there is a big difference in terms of the, the nature of the interpersonal relationships uh, between these two families. Yeah. And so we get a scene of Kristen Cole watching them dismantle uh, Jaehaerys' bed, uh, complete with a mattress filled with blood, and uh, he's not looking happy, probably because he blames himself for this one, which would be fair. Uh... Kind of indulging not only in the sullying of his white cloak from a perspective simply of the operation, but now consequence of a highly significant order beyond, you know, losing your honor even now. Actually, someone yep, may have lived dead. had you not been doing that. So he's got a lot of weight on him right now, not feeling too good. Um, And you see Rhaenyra playing with her children. I think the point of this scene is going to be that uh, they're not exactly safe considering what's happened recently and what repercussions could come, which will have her deciding to make certain decisions in the future. Uh, but over to Cole again with good old Alicent, who's having herself a nice bath. Uh, she says something that, at first, when I heard it, uh, watching this episode, I was like, what a dumb question. Then I thought about it. So she's about to close her door, and she sees Cole, and she says, have you told anyone? Probably in reference to any of what they're trying to keep secret, right? Like, that's essentially what she's referring to. And he says, what do you take me for? And then she says, one who seeks absolution. Which is, you'll catch a lot of this throughout the whole show, but that is projection. She's, uh, <laughs> she is so close to telling someone what she's done, she's now worried that Cole would be too, because that would come across as a natural thing to her now. And, um, 
What a Kristen Cole response to her saying seeking absolution. He says there is none for what I've done. <laughs> yeah, he uh, he knows he knows who he is. He just like <laughs> as far as he's concerned, my soul is fucked. Like there's nothing I can do. It's over. Um, it's it's really like. I don't know, to me it's really engaging, both of them. They're both just fucking spiraling. They, uh, as far as they're both concerned, they've failed completely in all of their duties. And they don't know yeah, what to do. Definitely. It's the recognition of it that really seals what makes them such interesting as a pair. Because in a lot of other shows that are poorly written, they wouldn't even recognize it in themselves. But being able to recognize that they are what they are and having the projection elements and having them be aware of what's happening, it makes it far more interesting because there's that spark inside of them that you see that was like, hey, if they're recognizing what they've become and they're ashamed of it and they hate it about themselves, they're not in a way like truly monstrous to the bone. There's that recognition mm -hmm. that can only come from is someone who understands what they've done. In the case of uh, Allison, the impression you get is it's starting to catch up with her. Um, like, it's her, she is lagging behind her recognition of who she is, yes. you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like it manifests in subconscious ways, like when she was, you know, brushing herself harder to, you know, to clean herself, right, yeah, metaphorically. Spot, kinda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. very much, like, that comes across to me much more as, um, subconsciously, you are you're like closer to recognizing who you are than consciously um it feels like she's always a little bit further behind where she uh needs to be in a sense in terms of understanding who she is it's almost interesting to me with Kristen because it's like once the cloak is sullied he's sort of given up on it and the idea mm -hmm. it represents yeah, even though exactly. he still affirms it like he still affirms it but he's given up on it for himself so yeah. you have to wonder like he hasn't He's not trying to reconcile that within himself, I guess. No, where she it is. It feels like he can't be no. forgiven. Yeah. Well, it's certainly I interesting how his character like, said uh... he essentially he can't be saved from his own perspective. Yeah. Yep. Which somehow means then the principle that he was trying to uphold is not worth his time to try and continue to uphold. I think that's, that's kind the reason of like why he, Boogie he's... did the crypto scam. Just, yeah, I'm already a villain. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> <laughs> in, a, in a sense, like, it's the Kristen Cole, he, it, it, it's not like a slippery slope, he just sort of, like, jumped off, like, next to the water slide as soon as he, it's like, it was already over for him, in his yep. view, because his, uh, it's got, like, a very clear and rigid system of honor, um, that he had, that had a very obvious breach, and it's like, well, kind of like, fuck it, right, like, that's his attitude afterward, fuck it. Yeah, um, I guess the honor system knowledge. doesn't matter anymore, which quite yeah. me leaves you to wonder about what it meant to him in the first place. I think yes. it's, um, I think an element here is that he probably feels like I was trying to be good once and do the right thing, but I was, I felt taken advantage of in the first season when Rhaenyra is on the ship with him and she says, Hey, I'm going to marry Lanar, but you know, we could still like fucking everything. We've got an understanding. He's gay. Um, and, yeah, he's and and he wanted he wanted her to let's run away let's be together let's be mm. happy let's leave leave all of this behind and then he's indignant that Rhaenyra said yeah, he, uh, from his perspective like, you want me to be your your whore you know you're just you're you're not like he feels super burned because he wanted to do what he considered at the time the honorable thing like yeah we you know we did that stuff we should have done it but I do have a feeling for you and we can go out and we can be happy we can leave all this behind and be normal. Um, and you know, she declined that. So I bet that is like that was like his that's his big breaking point in a way. I it think was for her him, not doing that. He saw the only way out of uh, or to retain honor by being an oath breaker is if he broke his oath for true love. Where and then she took that away from him. He's like, Oh, so I'm I I'm just fucked, suck. Yeah. I'm just an asshole. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think in a way there, yeah, it's that element of well, it's not like there, there's different ways to break one's oath and I can be earnest about this and we can go out and we can be happy and is that, you know, that is that so bad of a thing? Yeah, and, I, but, and, and well, there's all these stages of breaking him down and, and uh, Jaehaerys having died because of this. It's, it's such a strict causal and effect thing, as in, like, he sees exactly what the repercussions of breaking all of his honorable vows are. There's nothing, there's no... Uh, there's no interpretations to be made. There's no analysis. That's hence why he just said, "Yeah, I'm just fucked." And uh, having that kind of weight on you 
is super important to establish, not just for his future actions, but for the interest of analyzing him, which, as you can tell, the, the fact that we spent some time on him, we all, I imagine, find him pretty interesting. So as I said... I'm very interested in Kristen. Well, I think we made that clear on any of the streams people would have seen about us with Season 1, that we actually were quite fond of him as an idea. It was just the weird shit they made him do. Like, killing someone by sitting them down. That was like, what... Do that. It's the episode nine bubble. It's like oh, mm -hmm. episode nine kind of fucked around with you. What's up with that? Well, that I remember plus him, his um, diplomatic immunity. <laughs> well, and him threatening Harold Westling was cringe as well. Yeah, it's like nah, I I don't like him threatening his own Lord Commander. That's like that goes against I think the way you've characterized him. He would never hold a sword up to his fucking boss in that way. And you didn't need to have that happen for that scene. It was completely unnecessary. We have issues with episode 9. I don't know if you guys have picked that up. Maybe. Episode 9 is, uh, it lingers in the back of my mind. But, I do like the work they've been doing with Kristen so far. Let's see if they yes, can do. maybe keep it up. Uh, the scene closes with a visual of Alicent sinking below the water and, uh, kind of looking like she's, you know, it's, it's the same sort of visual as drowning. I wonder what it means. I couldn't possibly speculate. Couldn't possibly. I don't know. Mm. Maybe she just, maybe she likes swimming. Yeah, I think it's supposed to mean that's that it. water it. will fill the entire red keep. That's what's going to happen. I think that I think that's very particular shot of her losing her grip on the side of the tub. It's yes. like it's to show that she's losing her grip on the side of the tub. <laughs> <laughs> she's got listen, she's, she's got slippery hands. It's the soap, you know. Yeah. So, uh we then get Cole speaking to Eric about his dirty cloak which Ah, uh, it's just so juicy as storytelling, you know? It's it's beautiful. I love this scene so much. Captain yeah. Captain Projection. It's it's yeah. just it's yeah. it's great. So um something that you you notice as well is when he walks up to him, he's just staring directly at him. And when he sees his head slowly turn, he then immediately looks down at the cloak, because that's gonna be his cover for this scene, so to speak, right? But he's just pouring all of his hatred for himself into this man. It's the only way he could deal with himself right now, because he's got to have some form of an outlet. And uh, he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll replace it. He's like, no, do it now. And he's like, oh, okay, geez. And he's like, you would defy my authority, would you? The white cloak is a symbol of purity, fidelity, king's god, or sacred trust. Would you so easily sully our ancient honor? It's like, bro, you've, <laughs> you've got some mm -hmm. issues, yeah. man. You keep talking, all right? Tell me he's all He's got to get it, it off his right? chest somehow, you know? I mean, you're just watching this is it. the way he chose. And because of how well they've built all of this up at this point, nobody's confused as to what hap is happening here. Um, you could almost say it's not subtle, but it absolutely is. You know, it's, it's how you do normal storytelling. Ooh. It's just so clear. He has yeah. put a little Kristen Cole mask on Eric, and he is now beating like, him up, berating it. He is big mad, as mm -hmm. the kids say. And uh, it must be of a uh, fam family guy where Brian pins that squirrel down and goes on this unhinged rant. The squirrel's like, This isn't about me, is it? <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, and yeah. it kind of has the same ending as well. I don't remember how that ends. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's That's true, right. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Kills the, uh, he kills the squirrel because nobody can know. Nobody can like, know. Kills... <laughs> I think so. I think that's the ending of that joke. Um, but Cole's kind of like, he does fumble a lot in this conversation, because he's like, where were you when Jaehaerys died? And he's like, you know, the king. I was, was kind of with the king. I was, I'm the king's king's god. Yeah, like, good answer. <laughs> and then he's like, well, <laughs> you could have gone upstairs, and if you had, you would have... And then he's like, where were you? And he's, he's like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> why, why? This wasn't about me. Um, and yeah, and he says, why wasn't Helena given a sworn protector? Which is kind of a fail on his part. Uh, and so he tries the whole, your brother is a thief and a traitor to the crown. And it's like, yeah. And he says, how do we know that you aren't one of those things? How do we know that you don't share <sighs> that perspective? How do we know that you aren't secretly planning to completely fuck us over? And of course he says he denounced him. And he doesn't, he, he pains him that he would share the twinhood with such a being. However, yeah. you know, all, all the usual Your stuff. twins, how different can you be? And he says, you hey, know... don't let the Acolyte Riders hear you. <laughs> he says, you've brought disgrace upon our ranks, and you must restore it. And he says, how? And he's like, gonna go to Dragonstone, assassinate Rhaenyra. It's gonna be great. You'll pretend to be the twin. It's, it's, it's so... It's, it's, it's just, yeah, let's do it. 
Great. And he says, that sounds insane. He's like, uh, he says, you'd send me to my death. And he's like, or to triumph and glory. Or must I Ooh. question your loyalty to the king? <gasps> and he says, okie dokie, I'll do it. Which, uh, man, what a bad day. You just get put yeah, on a you... suicide mission, you know? It's like, oh, great. <laughs> Rough. Yeah, of the jobs he could get, that was probably the bottom of the list that he was hoping for. Mm-hmm. Ruin my day. It is funny, though. The, the, the evil twin just shit from Acolyte, and then the twin storyline in this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's they kinda, bizarre, yeah. Did they both kind of use the two souls in one body line? Um, I think something like that is said in this show. Very, I think it's very near the end, yeah. Uh, no, I think it's actually, isn't it in this scene that he says it? He, Might he be. says it to Chris. He's like, we're two souls I thought he in says one it body, to his yes, other but twin. I, I thought he uses it as a reason to explain that, like, we don't agree on the succession. Like, that doesn't mean we agree on this. And that sucks, but, you know, we, we, we do what we do. I mean, I'd have to check. I, I'm 100% sure. I'm pretty sure the twins say it to each other uh, later on. Uh... Then we have Bela and Jaceris talking about fathers. How uh, she's not sure exactly what her relationship with Damon is, which, to be fair, neither do we, because I feel like we've had maybe three scenes in total that they've shared together, and it hasn't been that detailed. So there's not a lot to say on that. I'm not sure what they want to do with it. We'll have to find out. Yeah. And... um. They very casually discuss Harwin Strong, which I thought was interesting, but also believable that she would know who his actual dad is, you know? This, uh... Because Harwin, we got him for, I think, one episode, and he seemed pretty chill, you know? He seemed like a cool guy. He seemed yeah. like an alright dude. Yes, uh, Mr. Breakbones. That was, his, that was his good old nickname. It's a good nickname to have, a strong nickname, Breakbones. Well, what do you uh, think the nickname means? I think it's something it to do with, bones. Uh... Wait, really? Well, yeah, he just goes around breaking bones. That could be it, I guess. He's a bone breaker. He's just known yeah, for maybe. breaking bones. Oh, he's like, careful. oh, bones. Uh, he's either a bone lover or he's a bone hater. You don't know which. I'm not able to show much of this coming up scene because it's, uh, it's a nudity scene and YouTube hates that. So we'll have to be Woo! careful. Um, yeah, we go to, to naked place with naked people doing naked Yum. things. And, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, this uh so this is an Amon this this scene essentially reveals that Amon gets up to seeing I think her name is Sylvie, uh every well not every night probably Sylvie. but a lot of nights. Um and she's the one that a a Aegon introduced him to when he was like 13, I think. That's what they say in the first season. Um and so he's been with her a lot and you get a strong sense that he is here not for sex, but for connection on a more emotional level. Um, that's something that's pretty well achieved by the scene. However, I was not a fan of the dialogue in this scene. Did anyone else feel the same? Uh, yeah, like it was too on the nose, too, too blunt? They, way too explicit. They confirm about I, four I different think... things that I think we already knew very well. It, it felt like a scene that was there for... Just, just in case you didn't get it, it's like in case no, the I did, dicks but... are distracting you. Here's what's <laughs> happening here. I, I would have cut Eamon's last line. Um, I would have cut a lot of them. So a lot of... I would have cut a lot. Yeah, I think the only value I'm drawing out of it, that, as opposed to because I already knew all this information, was telling me that he is telling this to Sylvie. I like, I appreciate that. That's interesting. But you don't need four different significantly, you know, substantive lines to get that across. Um, and so instead, what I took from it was, it's a little bit of overcompensation from the writers being like, you, you understand this is how he feels. And I'm like, yeah, I, I got it. I saw the scenes, uh -huh. I saw his face, I've seen what he's said since, I, I got it. So to be clear, he says, um, Damon sent them to kill me, but I was out. And she says, you were with me. And he says, in truth, I'm proud that he considers me such a foe, that he seeks to murder me in my bed, that he's afraid of me. Um... And then he says, I do regret that business with Luke, though. I lost my temper that day, and I'm sorry for it. Uh, they used to tease me because I was different. It's, it's so very just... Yep. It's a bit yeah, too openly therapy-ish. Um, we also kind of I like that. 
We saw I, I all think of it. Just we saw this, show all of it. Is, this show is better than that. You don't need to have yeah. your characters declare their motivations and the things that upset them in such plain terms. You're better than that. I was. You're not acolyte. Particularly surprised <laughs> that they had him say they used to tease me because I was different. It's like, wow, that's really. Uh... Is, is that his perspective on things? Is that how he honestly feels? Is or that something he, he would ever say? He feels. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, it feels like too much. I mean, I can accept it to a degree because it's some it's somebody that he's clearly vulnerable with and confiding in. But it's, yeah. it feels I like get an he's kind of opened dump. up, but still, yeah. Like, would he? Like, there are things I wouldn't probably ever tell my therapist. <laughs> well, supposedly. What about your it, prostitute? It's specifically oh, aimed oh, at yeah, himself. Like I said, anything. I love the angle that he comes to a prostitute not for sex but for connection because he has none of it with his family and no love is there at all and so he wants to feel it but you did you, you had an opportunity to give us all kinds of dialogue and you chose to tell me a bunch of stuff we already knew it's, it's very odd for you guys meaning the rise of the show they don't usually do that um but hey you know it's um well so i'll say this now i guess because there's no reason not to i'll probably mention it again when we get there but there is a second scene of uh Aemond in wherever that is, uh, that I think achieves the thing I thought we got out of this one, uh, making this one almost completely redundant. It, it achieves that and more. I think the second scene is way better. Uh, I'm talking about the episode three one, if you guys remember. Yes, I agree. I think that's the yeah. only scene you need because you don't... Yeah. We can conclude from him being there that he goes there to talk to her. Um, I think that's something that you can just conclude with subtext, and then you can wonder, it's like, well, I wonder what things he said. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't need the scene of him conveying all of the things that he says in the plainest terms possible. Yeah, just seems like it's the optimal choice. Yeah, I'm fine with what they're saying is the case for his character, I just, uh, I just thought that it wasn't, it's not their usual, I usually do better than this. No. Um, so, <laughs> then we get the uh, let's see if I could get there safely. Yeah, here we go. This is the most out-of-place scene in the four episodes, and I think most of you will know I what know I mean. What talking about, yeah. It is a scene where yeah. Hugh, Hugh's, I assume, wife and Hugh's daughter are talking about the state of the city they live in. And you might be thinking, well, Hugh did it! Well, you'd be like, Hugh, Hugh is Hugh. <laughs> if like, well. Hugh is Hugh? <laughs> and, uh, this is the thing. This scene is so weird because most people would have forgotten this is the character that was speaking to Aegon in the previous episode. He, he, he was there for very briefly. He was talking about how they need um, more money in advance for making uh, things with iron and stuff. Now, even if you do remember... It's just a scene that comes across as a little like, oh, okay, um, uh, sure. And and the information we get is that things are tough right now for the people of King's Landing. They're getting resources and people are starting to look out for themselves only. It's a stretch on all kinds of stuff, which I appreciate. It's just it's just strange. Like, okay, uh, I don't know. I, I'm guessing this is going to come up later. Again, it, it, they do the same with the guy, um, was it Alan? It's like, you guys, um, you might want to... Uh, maybe I don't know what the perfect formula would be, but we were saying like when you introduce a, a brand new character that's going to be important, um, you can do a POV scene. I think that's totally fine, especially in early episodes. But um, a, a way to sneak them in sort of is to have them as part of other characters' scenes at first, until we yeah. recognize them and then they sort of go on their own. But this scene, because a lot of people were saying it at the time, it's like it comes out of nowhere. It's just like a you you should care about this. You're like why? It's like we'll tell <laughs> you later. You're like okay. I'm sorry, who? All right, who did this? Okie dokie. But yes, like I said, it's just uh, things are tough for Hugh and his family. I, I assume that is going to be motivation later for something that's going to happen. Thumbs up. And then... Who is Hugh? Hugh is you! <laughs> He's the everyman. We get another scene just like that. We come to see POV for, for Alan now. So, you know, like, before he was a part mm -hmm. of a callless scene, which makes a little more sense to me as, like, getting information to us. But now it's Alan and his brother. And you're like, who the fuck is Alan? You're like, we'll tell you later. It'll make sense. <laughs> You're like, okay, fine. All right, think. yeah. Um, yeah, and, and they're trying to beat around the bush of what gets revealed, I would argue, in episode four, which is that um, Alan is, I guess I can't say certainly, but no, I think I can, right? I can say he's, he, from the show, he's uh, Corliss's bastard, right? That's, that's like the... Yeah, that's the implication yeah. that's given. Yeah. And so his brother is saying, you should, you deserve more things, you should push for more things, you saved his life. And then the guy's like, I don't, I don't want those things. And so 
I mean, this is genuine speculation because I have no idea where this is going, and I assume you guys would have similar speculation, but Paulus is I having... I will not say. Oh, okay. For anyone who's read the book, you don't get to speculate, but I assume this yeah, is going to come up with Corliss because he's having succession issues, and if he legitimizes this dude, then uh, that might correct it. As certainly, with how familiar he is with the fleets, how good he is as a worker, and the fact that he has Corliss's blood, to me that would match... Paulus' desires, quite specifically. And the fact that Rhaenys in episode 4 gives the okay, essentially, and now that she's died, I could totally see Corliss doing that. Um, mm -hmm. The other dude, I don't know if we've had it yet, but he has a scene where he um, he spots sea smoke. So I don't know if that's going to be how these two characters are, are like connected to the story, is that they're brothers, one of them could be legitimized, and the other one will have access to sea smoke. So that would make them both incredibly useful to Corliss, to Driftmark and ultimately to Team uh, Black. So, you know, that, that that's my assumption. I don't know if there's anything else to gain from it because the scenes themselves don't have much else in them. So I assume that's what we're supposed to take from it. I will neither confirm nor deny. It seems like they're just trying to broaden the scope to introduce more elements. But it's a little bit hand-handed, like, hand perhaps. Do you see what I mean with what I am saying... There's nothing else I can really say with the information they've given us. Yeah, we're still yeah. we're on a wait and see kind of thing right now. I don't know what else you would speculate other than I guess they're gonna be around. They're gonna be doing things. But we'll see. Um then we have Viz Viranis and Corliss speculating on what Damon's up to. Because it could be all kinds of things. He's a chaotic little guy. And they're talking about how, you know. He, he would he uh, take over, and uh, Rainey's doesn't think so. So um, we'll have to see what happens with Harren Hall. It's it's kind of a, I think, building up them too because they've not got many scenes left. At least together. That's uh, that's called foreshadowing in the business. <gasps> <laughs> Let's see. Oh, and she says. Um, uh, uh, Rainey says, in the meantime, um, I'm here, so is Maylise, and we're not going to let the Queen falter. I wonder if that line is supposed to mean that without her and the most powerful dragon, that it might mean that, you know, Team Black might start to fall apart a bit, but um, to be honest with you, they could take this in any direction. I'm expecting something of a Team Black win soon, like in Episode 5 or 6 or whatever, because of how much of a loss they just took at the end of Episode 4. It was, yeah, depending on what the results of episode four are going to be, it's yeah. just how much that's going to, the implications are such that it could be anything from a, oh, this might work out incidentally to be a win, but likely it's, you can't be, you can't be trading like that, which we got to see what the implications are. A lot of things could happen. So, we get a Missaria scene. You excited? Yeah. I mentioned that. I'm, I'm always excited to see Missaria. She's, she's uh, great. So, Rhaenyra's like, you're aware of what happened? She says yes. And she's like, what, what, what did you have to do with the unfolding of that plan? And Missaria says she had nothing to do with it. Which is kind of like, eh, you already know that she know facilitated that. it, so... You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. And what's she gonna do? Say like, well, yeah, but I wanted my freedom. It's like, woman. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> well, did you now? Oh. Um, and so Rhaenyra, all's forgiven. Radira says, "I know you're entwined with the usurpers. You aided them in denying my birthright." And her response, which is the same problem with the Damon scene, IMO, she says, "I took profit from an inevitability, something I now regret." Like, yeah, of course, I bet you, you do. Fucking do. I bet you regret it now. And that's what Rhaenyra says, become, by the way. Uh, in, a different, in a different timeline where Otto is like, hey, this person's really useful. Maybe we could keep an eye on her and keep using her for stuff. I bet you wouldn't have regretted it then if it was that timeline. Her yeah. son might still be alive had the White Worm taken different actions. Ex this, this is what I don't like about how people talk to her. She, she gets so much deference for no reason at all. It's a pass. All. Yeah. It's, um, when she says, I regret taking any you know, participation in Otto Hightower's Awful schemes. It's like what that means nothing to me. You've been captured the by the that other you team. Helped? Yeah. Exactly. It's like what? Oh, okay then. Um, 
And then she says, who are you? And her response is, a prisoner. And I love Radira's reaction of just, motherfucker, you know what I'm saying, idiot. Like, why would you say a prisoner? It's like, yes, <laughs> other than that. And uh, she said, I gave Damon two names. That's the extent of it. I did not wish to do that much. He said it was the price of my freedom. Does he say otherwise? That was a really important line. That's the story she's given Rhaenyra. Damon is not available, nor will he be in the next like, couple of hours, so to speak. So there's no way for Rhaenyra to confirm any of this. She has no idea if Masaria, the person who sold her out to Otto Hightower, is lying to her right now. I feel like that's worth keeping in your pocket, considering everything going forward. Yeah. So, uh, and the fact that she said, does he say otherwise? Why would you ask that? Is it because you think that your stories wouldn't match up? Is it, are you are you trying? Because let's pretend for a second yeah. that she knew full well what Damon's plan was and facilitated it perfectly with him. Finding out how the results went, why wouldn't she say, "Hey, man, I had as little involvement as possible with the information you know that I was involved." Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Like this is this is exactly what a liar would tell you. Yeah. Yeah. And then to, for, for her to end all of it with, did he tell you anything different? It's such, like, why would you say that? <laughs> <laughs> you need to get Damon on the phone to confirm, you um, Anyway, she says, yeah, Damon does, uh, you know, fuck off randomly, doesn't he? Um, and she says, you remember me now? I was the one that he was going to marry randomly in uh, episode three, I think it was. Or two. Um, I think it might have been two. It was when he stole the egg. Um... And so Rhaenyra says, you trade in secrets of the Red Keep, your web runs unseen through King's Landing, and now when my enemy coils himself to strike, uh, you know, implying that there's things that she could do, and she says, I can do nothing now but ask you to honor your husband's words. So, this was me when I was watching, I was like, if I'm Rhaenyra, yeah. this lady ain't ever leaving Dragonstone, that's not happening. Um, yeah. Whether she stays alive is something that we could probably discuss. But the fact that I just laid out how she could help me, and then she says, "Let me go." Like, hmm. After everything else you said as well, I think uh, I, th I think we got a little. Uh, I think we got a little rat in the in Dragonstone. We got to deal with it. You're. Uh, it it's like doesn't every... make her come across as someone that you want to have any confidence in to do anything at all. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't come across as someone who I would expect to be far more shrewd, given mm -hmm. what her past is. Now, what's... She'd need to be more shrewd than this. What's so interesting to me is that uh, Rhaenyra actually says what we're talking about next. Her next line is... Uh, it would not serve me to set you free. At best, I lose an asset to my cause. At worst, you betray me in some foul way. Like, that is so true, Rhaenyra. You are yeah, well, that's, a, that's a, an interesting thought you've got there. And her response is, I have no interest in betraying you. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> oh, you oh, so. All right, <laughs> well, all right then. Thanks, yeah, if you man. say so, then. That's all, all right. I needed to hear. Like, unironically trash. <laughs> of, yeah, of... I, don't, I don't know what the fuck... <laughs> I just don't know, man. Like, it's, it's so, like, crap. And she says, um, you know, I was brought to Westeros with nothing. I toiled in service. I stole. I sold my body for bread, and I had to collect confidences, made myself valuable to powerful people bit by bit, made my living, and uh, then they all set it aflame. And she says, who did? And her response is, the high towers, I can only assume. She doesn't even know if the High Towers were the ones that did what the the remember Missaria later wants nothing but revenge on the High Towers. She doesn't know if it was Otto that got what done what 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 happened. Um, like in reality, it was Laris, by the way. When you when you broker between powerful houses, as it turns out, you make powerful enemies. So you don't exactly have any real position to be like, oh, and then they all burned it down for their well, perfectly legitimate grievances with me. I hate to remind everybody of the scene, but what I'm referencing, of course, is when Laris makes Alicent aware that her primary handmaiden works for the White Worm, who is a spy master, and then she says, as she's getting her feet out, can you deal with this White Worm? And Laris is like, probably, and then she takes her socks off and he's like, yes, yes, I can. <laughs> And so, <laughs> point being, it had nothing to do yeah. with Otto. Otto did, and you'd be like, yeah, but it's the High Towers. It's like, yeah, but you got to be, you're just my problem here. Like, she doesn't know like what someone, happened Someone to on that general team. Yes. 
So, uh, she should probably hate how strong, if she wants to be specific, but yes, you could hate at the high towers, I suppose, but the funny thing is, if you find out someone had you killed because you were stealing secrets from their family, which is precisely what Damon and Rhaenyra were considering killing her for, do you understand what I'm saying? I don't like Missaria. I think she's a fucking moron. And she doesn't, like, look at the situation in any way that, for lack of a better term, is objective. She just sees herself as a victim constantly and is allowed to do anything. And the story, unfortunately, uh, kind of rewards her for that. Yes. Which I don't yeah, like. that, that's the problem, is that the show seems to not understand... It, well, it's like the show needs to find ways to justify keeping her around, and so it just relies on characters momentarily forgetting reality. The reality of their world, the reality of the actions that have been uh, taken. Mm -hmm. Let's um, say something nice. She's pretty. <laughs> yeah, pretty what? Yeah, attractive. Oh, yeah, she's an attractive lady. That's nice. That's um, nice. So yeah, uh, we'll get more on this later because Rainier asked her how she got his scar, and she doesn't want to give away how it happened. So, like I said, Adam spots sea smoke, which will likely come up later. Uh, we'll have to see what happens with that. And then we find out the rat catchers have been booped. For lack of a better term. They've all been killed. Them. Hanged. Look at them oh go. Oh my goodness. Wait, wait, all of them? But well, them. wait a second. All the ones, uh, I think they say all the ones that ever had to employ with the, the king, which is probably a lot of them. In oh, the King's oh yeah, that's right. Like all the rat catchers in the kingdom. <laughs> all the rat catchers in Westeros. They like, execute Jesus. order 66. <laughs> the rat catchers oh my God. trying to take over the Senate. This was all a ploy by Big Rat. And uh, <laughs> or big cat, Obviously I guess. Big rat, yeah. <laughs> big cat. Oh yeah. They, <laughs> big cat is big like, cat. stop That's killing all the fucking rats. We want to get them. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, yes, the actual one responsible did get caught up in the selection. So there's that. And the dog mm -hmm. looks very sad that his master is dead. But everyone was like, no, doggo, no. No, you understand. He's been... <laughs> you have a bright future ahead of you. Yes, you'll be fine. You won't be. Put Let's into a soup days later. Find a, yeah, I'll find a, a different rat catcher who appreciates my talents. Yeah. I'm always showing up to work on time. I don't complain. I don't even I don't eat, I don't even care that I don't get paid. <laughs> you know, what, I just like the company. His owner. It's a sad shot. Yeah. Um and so we get the goat scene. Here it comes. Yeah. Rushing in. The goat we got uh they're clearing away the pieces of the, the board. It's entirely been removed now. Um the series is Lego set, which is really sad, but whatever, Aegon. You know, it's the thing that would make you hate Aegon the most, honestly, out of everything he could do. And, uh, yes, Otto is uh, displeased, one could say. <laughs> yeah. I love the, um, what have you done? And that he's like, hmm? He goes, the rat catchers. <laughs> he's like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, his performance in this scene is nothing but fucking wonderful. He does. Stellar. Yeah. It this is brain yeah. crack. This yes. is what this is acting crack. He does everything you could want, um, and he shows some stuff we've never seen before in terms of his perspectives that you could have assumed were a thing, but now know for sure are a thing because he almost has no reason to express them pragmatically. He is this emotionally frustrated, which we haven't seen many, very many times at all, because uh, he's quite a smart boy, but he's uh, at his wit's end with Aegon here because he's done immense damage to uh, his plans by just simply not listening to him. Um, well, I think what you see uh, spill through is that he... what the, the choice he made in terms of the public, you know, memorial, that was something that he... that, that upset him. Like, that was not... In, in an ideal world, that's something that he didn't want to do, but then he did it, bore the emotional mm -hmm. repercussions for it, and then he undermines it. Yeah, I mean, you Which could argue like it's not only a gross thing to do for himself to actually actually conduct, but to accept, like, this is not something my daughter and my granddaughter are going to endure well. Nobody would. So, but I think that does matter to him, it. even if he's a bit of a cold yeah. father, you know? But we're gonna get something from it. Yes. And then, and then he, he undermines it completely. It's like, so all of that yep. was, all of that suffering was for nothing. You've, you've destroyed it. And, and he's furious. And it's interesting to see that from Otto. You know, like, he's got feelings, you know? 
Oh, and by <laughs> the way, yeah, as um, as Gogo's just highlighted, it's like the they've recognized here how important it is that they've killed this set of rat catchers, but they failed to recognize how important it was to kill all those innocent people in episode nine. It's so strange because this is on point. This scene as consequence, um, he says uh, he he you know he had them all hanged because uh, the guy could not say for certain which of the rat catch catchers it was. He's like, idiot! And then he says, beware how you speak to the king. My gra he's, he says, my king is the grandson, and my grandson is a fool! Um, and he Because <laughs> he says, uh, you've, you've murdered innocent men, there are fathers, brothers, and sons that you've killed, and their wives and children gather to, at the gates to weep. It's just so on point. Yeah. Yes, it is. And this yeah. is one of those quotes that, uh, it's one of those things that um, you can take in tandem with a lot of things that Otto have said, where it's easy to view him cynically as he just wants to get power. Um, I think that you have to you have to accept that there is a real strong possibility that he is genuinely concerned with the stability and welfare of the kingdom as a whole. Yes, I actually think um, this is a scene where you get you get more let you get less emotion out of someone like a Tywin because of he would be thinking almost solely about the pragmatism of it. But I think Otto is yeah. genuinely upset because of the sort of gross yeah. nature of this decision. The senselessness well, of it. All. The whole bunch mm -hmm. of innocent people are dead and yeah. and their you know, their families suffer and it's like, why did you do this? Why would you why would you make such a rash decision that would have these consequences? It's because you don't care about the consequences and that's driving him mad. That seems to I it informs Otto's clashes with Damon back in the day as well, because yeah. uh, Otto, everything has to have a point. It's, if if something is done, there has to be a reason for it. That yeah, and informs... ego isn't acceptable yeah. as a reason. Yeah, ego and because I felt like it, or just anything that is random or senseless in this way, he just can't abide it. He, he, it doesn't fit into his worldview in any way, that this is how people can behave. Well, and uh, all of Aegon's lines relate to his insecurity about how powerful he is seen as, right? He says that, uh, you know, because he said you, you've hanged innocent men. He says, yes, but one guilty one. This like, <laughs> and then he <laughs> says, um, <laughs> not wrong. Uh, the plot against the king and I'll pay it back a hundred. He's just cut off by Otto saying, you fucking idiot. Like, what, what have you done? Like, he's <laughs> trying to do his, his version of compensation for his essentially impotence as king. He doesn't know how to do this. He doesn't know how to feel powerful, but this made him feel powerful. This made him feel like he'd done action that, that uh, you know, accounted for what had happened. He's feeling good about it. And then the fucking hand of the king is just ripping into it, which is taking away a lot of how he felt about it, which obviously will explain why, he, at least partly why he makes the decision that he does at the end of this scene. But um, once, he, once he says the thing about the fathers and sons and the wives and uh, daughters and children and everything weeping you do get a bit of a, a sigh from Aegon like a hmm, like he is considering it somewhat but the I would argue the mistake that's made in this scene by Otto is that he actually lets his emotions get the better of him because mm -hmm. uh, obviously Otto is super pragmatic but had he handled this better he likely would still have a job at the end of this scene Aegon yeah, does, I think he, he uh... does not like being antagonized mm -hmm. quite simply Firing people is something he is willing to, yeah, do. He does want the kingdom to thrive, which you really respect him for. Like, even if he does, he stoops to, like, using his daughter as a political pawn in sort of a creepy way. Like, he does, he, he wants uh, appropriate leadership. Um, and also, on, on another level, I'm very happy that Risa Fons found a long-term project that is worthy of his talent yes i always yeah. like the guy and he, he's not in a lot of things i don't think no you're um, absolutely right this is a perfect role for him great yeah yeah he's always uh for me he's always just popped up in stuff and done a good job and that was that sort of thing i've never had Character a actor. role specifically to point to and been like this is the one that everyone needs to see to know how great of an actor he is in a I guess what you'd call pretty mainstream thing, but what's cool is, is if he gets a few more scenes like this, I think everyone's going to remember him from now on. Has anyone seen that so. Keanu Reeves football movie he was in? Where he's the, the soccer player, or a European football player who becomes the kicker of the team? I don't think I've he's seen really that. that. <laughs> but I've seen... So yeah, The Replacements, that's what it's called. It's a good movie. 
I think the first thing I saw him in was Kevin and Perry go large, <laughs> which is not <laughs> a you, great movie. Anyone who's seen Little Nicky? Yeah. I know of that movie. Haven't seen it. He's fucking great in that film. It's not a really good film, but <laughs> like he's uh he's the son of the devil and he plays it up a lot and he's great as uh kind of crazy to watch now because he's so much younger. But um and he's like he, the Reese fans are just in general is very punk in the way that he likes to approach a lot of characters. So it was always weird seeing him like this anyway for for me. He's not familiar at all, but he fucking nailed it. Absolutely captures yeah. the 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 character he's clearly meant to be playing. But anyway, um, he says, "With your children's blood, we bought their approval. With your mother's tears, we made a bitter uh, deal against the." I think he says the deprivations to come, and you've thrown all of it away. After all, I've done for you, thoughtless, feckless, self-indulgent. Like he's actually what he's saying. These insults, you can tell he's running out of everything. He's just so done. Mm -hmm. Because uh, what else is there to say in terms of just how much this is a fuck up? There's, there's not much. Um, mm -hmm. There's no way of recovering it either. Yeah, these are lives. You can't just unkill them. And he said, no um, "Token gesture will change what happened." He said, uh, "News of Rhaenyra's monstrous crime spreads through the realm. The great houses falter. They cannot but come to our side." It was. It's like he's saying, "It was so perfect. I put everything in place." We had a place. good thing, you son of a bitch. <laughs> We had dead Jaharis. <laughs> and you ruined everything. Um, You've done your job and known your place. And yes, there's this moment that everybody was fucking memeing on, which is, uh, he says, we have to act. I wish to spill blood, not ink. Kristen Cole has acted. And he has this, like, pause, fucking turns his face, and he's like, and what? <laughs> I was like, has Kristen Cole done? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Chris is like fuck. Yeah, you can tell. Uh, even uh, Cole is very awkward in this scene in terms of like because he recognizes how intimidated the hand can be. This but, he's uh, out of his element. Cole is like, I'm not. This ain't. This ain't my. <laughs> this ain't my deal. All right. Yeah. Your talkie talkies is it? No. That this ain't. No. And uh, of course, Aegon thinks the pretending to be your twin plan is brilliant. I I really love his delivery of it. He's pretending to be his own twin. Brilliant. It's like, <laughs> and fucking Otto is just like, dear God, like, what, what stupid fucking plan is that? He, he immediately jumps to his instinct reaction when he hears a plan. It's just like, oh yeah, that sounds good. Let's do it. Oh. And he kind of executes one in the fourth episode, but it was his own and it was bad. Yeah, he says, God help us all. Um, and you get another classic Cole line. He says, it's time for the bitch queen to pay a price. Just uh, he always comes out with those every once in a while. He's very he's very he mad about Radira. Yeah. <laughs> you, you got her, Cole. You, you got her. You know? Yeah, like, even even like, Aegon is stupid. like, you what, mate? <laughs> what, what was that? Like, <laughs> clearly very bad. Um, yeah, and he says that you acceded to this prank without consulting me or the council. Instead of judgment, you display impetuousness and diminish us. That's the the way he delivers yeah. that. It's so fucking great. Yeah, yeah. Calls yeah. it a prank. <laughs> a prank. <laughs> like this isn't a real plan. <laughs> Just like this is a, this is a prank that you're pulling. The political assassination love... of the enemy queen. I love throughout this chunk of episodes that we see basically every non Targaryen character constantly coming to terms with just who they're on the side of, yeah. like who they're working with. Fucking insane Targaryens. Um, yeah, and so he does the he does that the, the ill considered trifling that has this pause, and you get some of the realest Otto we have ever gotten, where he just says, "Do you never think of your father, his forbearance, his judiciousness, his dignity?" He like, yeah, well, it's, it's, um, it's the part of mm -hmm. it's the part that elevated the scene so much for me because getting Otto. To really to to get Otto's perspective on Viserys in this very um, in a way we haven't really ever seen before was it just solidified how not just how good Viserys was and how respected it was but insight into Otto in his goals and what he thought of this guy he served for so long especially now that he's he's lost and he's he's gone Viserys is dead now so you have to deal with the world without him mm -hmm. now that 
on it puts into perspective just how good of a job he really did keeping everything uh together yeah and, and i think there's an element here of he's actually coming to realize Aegon never really cared about his dad as much as he may recognize or may not the uh, how good of a father Viserys was he says like do you never think of him it's like the answer is no Aegon really doesn't and, it, and it's such a sad realization yeah. because if he copied anything from Viserys it would likely help in this scenario but the reality is there's nothing none of it has passed over and the fact yeah, that yeah I feel like that for his... most of his life Aegon thinks of him as just the old sick man yep in many ways, with the performance, it feels like Otto himself coming to realize just how much he appreciated what Viserys was, mm -hmm. even yeah. for all of his faults. I like how his anger subsides, and it's all of a sudden like he's punched in the stomach when he just realizes, like, God, what a waste. Yeah. What a terrible waste this is. Let's be honest, the world would be better if Viserys had not gotten fantasy leprosy, whatever that was. Uh, <laughs> everybody would be better off, even though everyone had nothing but criticisms for him. It's, you start to sort of realize, like, oh, fuck. If only he was still here. Um, yeah, and the fact... He, he says this line, and it's very, like... You could argue it's probably the most vulnerable um, Otto's ever let himself be. He sounds destroyed. And he's talking about how much yeah. he actually appreciates him. And fucking... The last line is saying, his dignity. And then Aegon says back, fuck dignity, I want revenge. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> Not what you want to hear from That's the That's where we are, right? And uh, he says, my father is dead. And Otto says he is, and we're the poorer for it, which is like, where, where, was, yeah, was, what, are you, what are you trying to say there? And he turns around, and he has the fucking ultimate look of just pure disgust, which has to be uh, brought on not just by the bad decision making, but yeah, all of the dead innocent people. It has to be just, and I think a sort of realization from Otto that there's no real need to keep hiding how he feels, which again, I still think is a mistake, which is in line with what I think is one of his, I don't know if I want to call it a character flaw, it's complicated, because it's not, certainly not a moral one. Like he, um, he often oversteps where he doesn't, he probably shouldn't. Uh, he does it in season mm -hmm. one a couple of times, and he's definitely doing it here, which is totally in line. He's fucking annoyed. But look at this face he makes. He's just like, good God, I hate you right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, what could yeah. that face mean? And he's uh, yeah. he's, he's about he's correct, too, because he says uh, he was right about you. And then Aegon's like, he made me king. And then Otto laughs and <laughs> says, is that what you think? And that line is super important because that means that Otto never believed Allison at all. He was just like, whatever, we'll take it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and yeah. it's, it's, it's almost more meaningful than that because it means that Otto would have assumed that not only from what he knew about Viserys, but what he knows about Aegon. It's like, why the fuck would Viserys want you to be king? Like, I'll never believe that and you shouldn't either. And he's laughing at the notion. It's just like, oh, fuck, that's so satisfying. <laughs> Uh, but that is a, a seed from which um, that's uh, that sows the seeds of Aegon's destruction. I would say, I think starting so, to realize yeah. that that um, he was not like he's been placed here by other people. Yep, and gradually realizing that he's incredibly incompetent. They all think he's incompetent and prefer it if he just shut up. Yeah, he is finding out that he is in a way he is a pawn. Yes, he, yeah, even though he sits on the, even though he's the king, it's like, yeah, he's in the big chair, but yeah. no one respects him. Like, he's, he's, if, if it was this like, this, you know, this choice, right? Of like, yeah, you know, Kristen Cole, you can be my hand. It's like, you, it, what a bad decision. Well, it's motivated <laughs> purely by spite. Yep. Uh, yeah. Well, and there's, there's something else, right? So when Otto says, you wouldn't dare, when he says, take it off, he says, I have did, and I find it quite stimulating. And uh, I think the point that's being made there is like, I'm having way more fun, you know, doing silly schemes with Kristen Cole that involves actual deaths of people, which <laughs> makes me feel like progress is being made, than I've ever had with you writing letters, you know, procession funerals. <laughs> Fuck that shit. It's boring. And he's like, yeah, give it to Cole. More fun. And it's just, it's, it's such a bad fucking move in so many different ways. And as you just highlight, like, it's so much fun to watch Cole sort of. Doing his normal actions, right? Because part of why he sent, he did the fucking twin job is his own huge amount of guilt that has nothing to do with Aegon and his crazy plans, or even a pragmatic approach to uh, nailing this war. More about trying to make up for all of his failures. And so to have him be like, "You're hand of the king now," by the way, it's just like, "You fucking what? 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 <laughs> what? Sorry, this is not the promotion that I was looking for." 
You want? I think uh, when he he says give it to Cole, you have uh, Cole deliver the most meek your grace. <laughs> like, <ever. laughs> like, why would you do that? Why would anyone do that? <laughs> why would you do this to me? Um, yeah, and he says, in this hour, you've proven yourself of more worth than a hundred old men. My new hand will be a steel fist, which I quite enjoy as a line because it's it sums up yeah, Aegon pretty well. Line. It's in the book too. Mm -hmm. It is such a bad move, but it is such a satisfying slap in the face for him. Yeah, to to do this to Otto, like he's just. Because he is very impulsive, Aegon. He's just loving this moment. Just how dare you insult me like that? He's Fuck like, haha, I fire you, haha. Yeah, yeah, and he, uh, uh, we is later described by Alicent as uh, Aegon banished Otto. Because he says you're dismissed here. I don't know if that means the same thing or if he did it later, but uh, you could tell Otto feels pretty fucking ruined by this. Because uh, as much as he was completely right, and just absolutely banging in this scene. It's, uh, it has cost him. <laughs> Whether or not he thinks that was ultimately the best move or not is uh, to be figured out. But yeah, we'll talk a bit more about Otto soon. But um, what a banger scene. Just excellent shit. This is uh, what, I guess what Otto, I'm here for. Like, Otto likely left because if he, uh, if he didn't have a position at court anymore, he probably should be at the high tower. Well, so there's plenty of pragmatic reasons for it. I guess I'm saying that um, I wonder if he regrets this whole scene because of the power and influence he had is now lost, uh, at least somewhat, right, of what he had before. Probably. As for whether or not he'd stay I after it, no, I, I agree. I don't think he would. He doesn't. I don't think he wants to stay just for the fact that it, it's fucking humiliating to stay. Yeah. yeah. Um, what and is he's, he going to do there? You, you, you're right. He has more use in uh, Old Town. Or, as Alicent suggests, I think he might go visit the oh, yeah, uh, High Garden. Right. I think he's... He's going to tutor someone, isn't he? He's going to specifically go and be the tutor of well, so he, a character. He said he'd like to go and see Dayron, uh, who is a book character that has not been given much yet in the show at all, other than, I think, two mentions, maybe three. Uh, he said mm -hmm. he'll be more willing to listen to him, and that his dragon is close to fighting age is something someone said at some point. So I think either a season, end of season two character introduction, or probably season three, who knows, we'll see. But uh, yeah, Otto wants to go and get influence from that fella slash go to, I think, like I said, go to see the Tyrells in High Garden was something uh, Alicent mentioned. Anyway, after that, we get a comparably much worse scene, unfortunately. Um, after everything that we've gone over with Miss Arya slash Rhaenyra and what decision should be mm. made, uh, Rhaenyra says, I don't know if I can trust you, and I sense this danger in you. But I will keep the word of my house. If you say it was given, you may go. Uh, why? That okay. makes <laughs> less than no sense. One of the most nonsense fucking lines ever. There's no. This was this was a moment I think when I was watching it at the, for the first time. It was like there's gonna be consequences for this, and what I mean by that is there's a reason they fucked up this much. Like she's gonna oh, be. Oh, Molly, there will be consequences. Don't you worry. Well, just to be clear, what I mean is like th this won't just be a markdown in terms of poor writing for saving Missaria's life slash not drawing all the information out of her. Those are consequences, but clearly the writers need something to happen. Don't know what it is yet because I don't know yeah, where this, this story's is going. Set up. But I was this like, is a setup thing. It's a reliable thing we've talked about on EFAP many times. Whenever something really fucking noticeably odd happens, it's like, this is to facilitate something. Don't know what it is, but something is going to happen. And uh, yeah, she says there's a ship for you waiting. It's bound for Mia through Pentos and that she's uh, going to be given passage. And she ends this whole thing with, I am not so unworldly as to let you fly free. It's like, um, so you're going to send one night... And what, he's going to be with her for the rest of her life? Or do you think it's going like, to be hard is... for her to slip this night in Pentos? Like, what? What are you talking the about, woman? Some master intelligences. I don't understand what well, the fuck I she th thought she was saying. They they have, the Targaryens have friends in Pentos that would be taking care of her, though. They're ultimately where um, other Viserys and Daenerys go. This is, well, like that's, to that's be fair, you're talking about um, the guy who met, they met in season one, right? I mean, like, it would be his ancestor, I'm sure. Like, it so, would be people of the same group. 
we're talking about possibly several boat rides, like stopping in all kinds of particular places. That knight has got to make sure oh, yes. he n never leaves his sight, and that she can never speak to anybody that would have influence to... F My point is the uh, Rhaenyra said... Oh, the journey would be treacherous, for sure, especially with their cargo. Rhaenyra said that there's valuable for the, the, the best version of letting her go is that she loses an asset. The worst version is she loses someone who is going to actively plot against her with her enemies. There's no way sending one knight with her prevents that. That's insane. Why would you ever even think yeah, it? Fair enough. And that um, in this world, like the, the, there's a couple of criticisms of Rhaenyra that I tend to defend on her behalf, so to speak. I'm like, oh, no, I, I can see why she did that or that, and she, should, she shouldn't be rated as a shite queen or one that doesn't do anything because of this. But this is one I can't defend in any way, shape, or form. I think it's rough. This is a toughie. But I would have understood her executing Missaria. I'd have been like, yeah, I mean... Unfortunately, she's very dangerous to be left, uh, especially with her history of selling your house out consistently and causing you nothing but damage under the justification that she's hungry, which turns out humans get hungry semi-regularly, so there's no reason to think she wouldn't just do it again. And I don't think her <laughs> telling you, uh, no, I'd never do it again, is uh, it's acceptable. I don't think that's really that useful, IMO, that, when she's look, in your fucking you prison. See, the thing is, like, so, so I... I I know what lies are. Yeah, right? yeah, that one. So this this really gets in the way of a lot of the stuff involving this side plot line. Like I I know what lies are, and you're probably doing one of them. And for the record, like I said, I wouldn't kill her. I would get every last piece of information out of it, and I probably would be interested in trying to get her to work for me. Um, I would never. You've shown let the her... capacity yeah. to get in the that position, so like that's valuable to me. I just have to be like, look, I need to make sure that you're on my team to the point where we wanna... once we're like squared away, yeah. I want to give you a job, but we're going to have to work to get to that point. Understand? Yeah. Give me some accomplished objectives because of your information. And you want to bring that, in a little that whiteboard. That would be a better way to make your case. You know the, you know the fuck around find out whiteboard meme? A little whiteboard? You need the not like not fucking fucking with and uh, getting rewards, you know, thing and be like, see if you fuck with me in a good way. I mean. You got one on the on the on the board. If you do it twice, ooh, that's even better. And then three times, oh man, that's a pattern. That's what that's what we call that. And then like four times, you'll have you'll have graduated from I won't torture you to or much to I won't torture you to I'll keep you in a nice cell to I'll keep you you know you can walk around yeah, you can to room. yeah you can elevate to maybe a member of my council. Wouldn't that be crazy? But I'm gonna yeah. need a lot of benefits first. You must understand that because you have been a thorn in my family's side for some time. But we didn't even get that. We just got her saying, "Yeah, I'll let you go." Oh, okay. Nah. Yeah. What a pity. Because the thing is, uh, where all this goes, I think you could have done that storyline, and it would have worked way better than what they do. What they do I here is so. a fast track. Yeah, it would have given us a long progress on her doing things and being an asset for, you know, Team Black, and you can mm -hmm. use her at different intervals for facilitating events. And she doesn't even do a thing of like, okay, you're letting me go, so because of that, I want to let you know something as a as a thing of like, thank you. She doesn't even do that, she just lets it go. So, um, I guess we'll... Yeah, we see the repercussions of that immediately. It's not even, like, later, you know? <laughs> it's like, now that that has happened, like this will happen. Later. Yeah, uh, in-universe, but for us it's instant. In universe. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, Sir Eric, the the one that's conducting the twin plot, I don't know at this point if I should just describe all of the events and then we... Uh... Yeah, do it. <laughs> we do it that way. We're gonna go through it all and then we'll go through it all, so... This will be the quick version. She's going down the beach and she spots Eric in his King's Guard uh, outfit. He's he's moving on up in the armor and he goes in and tricks the front doorsmans into thinking he's Sir Eric. Goes into the castle and carefully avoids spot being spotted at the same time as his twin. Gets into Rhaenyra's room after figuring out who's on guard and trying to get them out of the room. He um unfortunately is unable to. Uh, complete his assassination because his brother comes into the room, which I think we're supposed to believe it's because Missaria has tipped him off. She managed to get the information back before uh, he would have completed the assassination. They fight, and uh, Sir, I want to say Sir Eric kills no, Sir Eric kills Sir Eric and then kills himself. And uh, Rhaenyra makes it out, though not unscathed. I think she hurts her hand. Mm -hmm. So. 
We can talk about the good and the bad, you know, because there's plenty. Well, so the bad um, already is like, oh, you're just walking out and he's there in his king's, like, his his full set of armor. And, yeah. Oh, wait, hold on. That's a bit sus. Yeah, it is. It's so sus. Why would he do that? That's big sussers. <laughs> that's uh, that's to, what we call a stupid thing to do. So, yeah, you, you gotta bear in mind here. This is a very odd choice from him because boats coming in and out on Dragonstone, there's not a lot, and I wouldn't be surprised if the harbor has people who are familiar with the state of who's in and out of the place in general. What I'm saying is you gotta be a little careful because what things can give you away pretty easily. Now, number one thing that might give you away is wearing incredibly special armor. You might think, well, he's just gonna tell everybody that he's Sir Eric. Like, yeah, that's not gonna work great if everyone knows that Sir Eric is here right now. You're gonna be like, mm -hmm. what do you mean? Yeah, you never I, left. Right. What, yeah, what's the deal? And then he'll be like, where did you go? And he's gonna be like, you know, I, I, I went to... I went fishing, or I went... <laughs> Whatever thing he comes up with, they're gonna be like, that's really weird, bro. And I don't believe you. Bro, like, what did yeah, you say? Well, what did you say, bro? I guess he's just gonna have oh, to um, brute force it uh, and hope that nobody is is at the dock slash the harbor. Nobody sees him along the way. That's just like, why are you here? What are you doing? What are your orders? Why aren't you up there where I know that you should be? There's, what I'm trying to say is, he's a bit of a moron. He should have packed up his armor in a big old sack. He should have made himself look completely commoner been like, oh, geez, oh, I'm visiting Dragonstone to help with, you know, blah, blah, blah. Just one of these guys. See, there's <laughs> lots of these old people here just doing their thing. Just some guy. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he can manipulate his hair in any way, shape, or form that he wants quite long. Put it in front. Put it around. Make some, you know, do the layer hair, you know? It'll really distract people if he does that. He wouldn't, they, he won't look at all like uh, the person he's going to be impersonating. <clears throat> and so what you would do then is when you get up to the entrance to the castle, go behind a rock and just change into your actual uniform and then pop out and be like, hey fellas, how you doing? I'm who I am. And uh, at that point, the risk of the plan is as expected. You know, I, I get at that point it's still risky, but that is the plan, is to hopefully trick people into thinking you're the twin for as long as you can get a kill on Rhaenyra. Now we bring all of this up because it would have been clever of him, or rather normal of him, to have made these choices. Because he didn't, Missaria obviously spots a king's guard that looks kind of like Sir uh, Arik. I mean, fucking, I'm going to confuse this now. Basically, the one that should be where she just was, because she was just speaking to him. So that doesn't make sense logistically. And then she, unfortunately, is one of the only people on this fucking planet, and I'm not kidding when I say that, who has unique information to know he's actually one of a twin. So instead of what a, when a normal person sees a person in one place and then sees them in a place they'd almost think was impossible, what the brain will do is tell them, yeah, but oh no, what do you <laughs> yeah. what do you expect? They didn't teleport, so they must be them. And you're like, yeah, okay. But she has unique information, so she can be like, wait a minute, that could be the twin, and if it is the twin, he's loyal to the other family. Oh my god, an assassination attempt is about to be conducted. And she does nothing. What? Man, lucky, huh, that she saw that. Yeah, if you haven't grasped what we're trying to get lucky at here, this is incredibly lucky. Lucky that she was let go, lucky that she was walking past, lucky he was wearing his armor instead of a better disguise. Hmm. Not amazing. I mean, realistically, you think you're, you're all... Initially, to defend against this, too, you should probably just immediately tell Sir Eric to shave his head once he joins the plaques. Like, just be like, hey, we gotta have you not looking exactly like your brother. No beard, either. Or you're you're really not wrong about that, but I would... Mustache. I will at least have allowed them that. Um, but this was way too far. Especially because, as we know, um, if not for this, he would have killed Rhaenyra. I would say it's like a 99% chance he would have done it. And that is what we call consequence. Which I was very sad to see, uh, because I knew something was going to happen as a result of the bad writing with the white worm. And I was like, oh shit, this is what it is. She prevents an assassination. Damn. <sighs> and I think this is what everyone was referring to at the beginning of assessing this episode. That there are some high highs. But does this low low beat out all of the lows from the previous episode? Uh... Um... Man, this slow is really bad. Auto, the scene with Otto is really good. <laughs> it really is. It's, I it's agree. one of my favorite. Really, question is: Is this the lowest think, low? I think two achieves like a slight place above one off the basis of its highs, and 
Hmm. I'm thinking about it more now because man, I hate this ending. I do too because there's there's so many reasons you can get around this. It's it's you just got to be a bit more creative with with how we approach it, and we can fix almost everything. Um, but this was fucking lazy, man. Uh, it feels like it. It it's really not difficult for it to not go this horribly. Uh, just to make sure everyone is clear, episode three, I want to say, confirms that it was Missaria uh, raising the alarm that saved Rhaenyra. It wasn't. It wasn't a coincidence. It wasn't. She saw him, but didn't actually do anything about it. She not only is the one that raises the alarm, which saves her. She actually gets a job thanks to that, which mm. is another fucking consequence that annoys me. In any case, he's in. And uh, he does move through pretty carefully. I'm, I'm relatively satisfied with that. I think that works. And uh, I quite like that he looks in on Rhaenyra's room and he spots that on the other end of the room there's a doorway with a king's guard. He moves around to there first after locking the other side. Takes him off duty. And then goes in himself. Kind of planned out perfectly. And he would have got her too if it wasn't for that rascally white worm and her pet dog. Um, who, who fucked everything up. Anyway, it, well, is it okay if I, I gotta say as well, by the way, like the fight with the whole like, I seriously was wondering. It's like, are you actually going to do the which one do I shoot meme? <laughs> like, are you serious? They <laughs> almost <laughs> kinda did. Almost kinda. They almost. They did, did it in a like, way that made sense. Or like, um, there's um, like, well, the the guy comes in and he's like, oh shit, like where he's kind of like stunned and weird to see a guy fighting himself, but then it would be cleared up very quickly because one of them has information the other doesn't have. But that yeah. initial like, oh shit, what kind of moment is as I, far as you could get with I, it, I, as far as it should probably go. I think it's, um, no, like I, I think genuinely, so what happened was at first I was like, oh, thank God, it looks like they're not going to do that. But then as the fight started happening, I'm like, dude, this is yeah, like, you know, it's like in Family Guy when, uh, you remember Evil Stewie? Yeah. You remember how like they had a clone of Evil Stewie and then Stewie and Evil Stewie had a fight and like throughout the fight they were basically making it harder and harder to ascertain who was the uh <laughs> who was regular Stewie and Evil Stewie. And it's like this felt like the same thing as the fight's going on and they're getting cuts and bruises and stuff and they're switching places. You're like, oh shit, are you seriously gonna do like the which one do I shoot? <laughs> Where you don't yeah, know bro, who it's, it's Brian literally says that. It's like, oh god, not this thing. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a meme. It's a meme. It's a meme that I remember it was in um I because my I think my favorite version of the joke was uh I don't know if any of you remember Ed's World. Do you remember Ed does anybody here watch Ed's World? The no, like flash it? animation? It, watch some of it. Um so there was a Santa Claus, so it was like evil Santa, and oh, there was okay, an yeah, episode yeah, where they, they went to the North Pole, because um, Santa Claus had, had like, captured Santa Claus, and they, they get into, like, his evil base, and Santa, you gotta bear in mind, he's like a, he's like a kind of grayish green skeleton man, and Santa is Santa, he's a big fat, you know, just big old plump Santa. And then he, he says, like, well, you know, how can you stop me if you can't recognize and he just swaps their hats. <laughs> so, like, it's obvious, <laughs> it's, it's obvious who they are. And then Tom's like, oh, no, which one do I shoot? He's just got a gun for no reason out of nowhere. <laughs> it's like, that's, that rem that's what I always think of when I think of which one do I shoot, because it's such a, it's um, such a trope. Like, it's such a, I, such a meme. Yeah. Okay. I also think Sir Eric totally had the ability to just be like, Rhaenyra, you were wearing a purple dress yesterday. Gotta, like, <laughs> gotta mention this. We're not gonna talk about it from beyond a few a minute, maybe, but apparently it is true, so I just checked. An assassination attempt just got conducted on Trump. Mm -hmm. Oh, shit. Uh, uh, yeah, I saw something about what? that. Holy sure. shit. That's not good. Um, Damn. Maybe he's okay, yeah, no. but he's, like, there's blood on his face when he comes back up. Holy shit. shit. Not Holy violence, crap. not good, everybody, really? no matter what your political allegiances are. No, of course friends, not. Uh, that's crazy. And we did will get back to talking it? about our nerdy fantasy show, but I don't, I'm just saying that like, it would be impossible not to acknowledge that that just fucking happened. Damn. Yeah, we're going to be hearing about that. Well, uh, yeah, like I said, probably not going to talk about it, just acknowledging it, because chat was wondering if we knew. So that's uh, terrible. And we'll we'll just uh, we'll carry on talking about the the funny twin fight. Even though I was actually going to say this fight, this part is actually kind of good uh, of this whole thing. What the yeah. which, which portion of the fight, like the fight itself, and the ending? Um. Well, so I was going to say the 
uh, I think, Rags, did you say at one point you kind of wish there was more for the twins when this sort of completed uh, the yes. story? Yes. I think the twin stuff should have lasted a bit longer as the conflict grew on. Um, and I wish that we got more of them doing their things at their respective places and wondering about, you know, the conflict that led them to be, you know, enemies. And I feel like we could have just done more with this concept of, you know, the two twins one in the fighting for different sides. I, I, I'm inclined to agree that the... Like, I, the way I see it is, like, good God, the potential here is enormous. The fact that they, you know, grew up and trained together to become King's God, that would have that would have been meant everything to them and their family, right? And then they split based on their allegiances of what I think is actually pretty justified, that one of them stays with what they believe is their duty to the royal family, and the other one moves out because he believes, morally speaking, it's wrong to stick with the people who he thinks are morally depraved, right? The, the Greens at that point, certainly Aegon. And so having them have this conflict over it, it's like, I think there was there was loads to mine out of this if they wanted to. It's but thematically still... potent, you know. Well, so I was going to yeah, get into that. Thematical... Like, it's brother against, yeah. it's the ultimate, like, Civil War tragedy. You know, the yeah. idea that, you know, brothers have to, you know, uh, families can be split, brothers have to fight brothers. The mm -hmm. payoff here is still pretty good, and of course I think it should be seen as, we're doing stuff with all the main characters, so this is us doing something... Uh, with the secondaries, and, and it's still pretty potent, I would argue, but I could totally understand wanting more for him. What I was going to say is that the fight itself is pretty good in the sense that the way they get injured respects the way their armor should work, so that's fun. Like, they they get each other on parts that isn't armored or between, uh, like, uh, both of the kill shots are underneath the plate of, of their chest, so. Yeah. You, li you like to see that instead of it just the armor doesn't work. Uh, obviously, Game of Thrones, as part of its deterioration, the armor stopped working at certain points, which was a little bit annoying. Especially because Game of Thrones Season 1 has a fight where, specifically because of how armor works, it allows a character who is at least, you'd think maybe he wasn't going to win uh, otherwise. Like, his armor gets him the upper hand in a fight. Which, they never fucking do that in these things. Like, rarely ever does the armor mean they win. But it was no, fun. When it's, it's right there. It's just like determining, kind of yeah. just there to be like, well, yeah, people in medieval times wear armor for a reason. <laughs> it's like, yeah, why? It's a why? Un yeah. I don't <laughs> like it when it's 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 one of my biggest problems with Star Wars. It's like it's it's armor. It's not they, they treat it like it's a uniform, to, to, so I can tell what side you're on. But no, it's like it's supposed to be armor. Yeah, because people are talking about it. it's uh, Jorah Mormont's fighting a Dothraki, and he shoves the arrack into his side but he just locks it in because it hits his armor and it's just at that point he's helpless and he just hits him with the sword into his face it's uh it's the kind of shit like i said you could create so many payoffs from it but they rarely ever when i say they i just mean storytellers they rarely ever use the armor to do stuff like that but uh this Armor's fight very important like i said sort of respects it and as the fight goes on the injuries get worse and worse and worse and you get um some back and forth like the, I think he says, uh, we were born together, and he says, you parted us, I still love you, brother. And it's like, oh, this is sad. <laughs> this is, uh, there's nothing else to be done here. They're both, what are the, it's like an immovable object meets unstoppable force sort of thing. So, uh, big sad. Yeah, and... Um, well, yeah, thematically, it was already mentioned, but thematically, this is, it's just, this shouldn't be happening. The only reason that this is happening is because of a variety of societal uh, pressures that have forced a confrontation between two people who don't want to fight each other. Um, but they, they, now they, they have to. And mm -hmm. the result is that they both end up dead as a consequence, which feels like, uh, I mean, that's the point, right, of the show, is that ultimately the fight will destroy the, the family. Um, will destroy mm -hmm. the family completely. Yeah, uh, even a victory can be counted as a loss. Thematically appropriate in microcosm, and everyone recognizes how awful it is, but it can't be stopped. It's it's like it's already done. Yeah, and so he kills. The... Uh, I think I, I think there was some confusion of which one was victorious, and I think a lot of people would have assumed that's something they'd want to work with. Uh, I, I saw it discussed at one point that um, whoever remained could be motivated to kill themselves anyway, no matter if it was the one loyal to Rhaenyra or not. But um, he does refer to her as Your Grace, so I assume... Yeah, that was what I thought as well. I thought it was um, whichever one was hers. Yeah. It's Eric, right? Eric. I think Eric, yeah. Yeah, I thought so too. So, yeah, that's the assumption that he kills himself, which is fucking rough. In, uh, a, in a sense, that, that was the thing that recovered from, seriously, like, 
that that was the opposite of what I thought was going to happen in terms of the whole which one do I shoot deal. Yes. That it's like, it just ends anyway that they're both dead. It's like, oh, I was not expecting that. Good job. You you got me seriously worried. Like, you were actually going to have it be like, oh, who knows? Maybe he's the infiltrator and maybe he'll be working <laughs> behind the scenes to subvert them. It's like, no, 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 no. That's... <laughs> You can't be doing that, okay? Uh, like, considering, that, considering that, what if you might each have to twin just kill him anyways, uh, just to be safe? I have a better idea. Each twin was simultaneously given a secret mission to pretend to be the other. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so each train, twin arrives at the other place and is instantly discovered because they aren't supposed to be. Yeah. There. <laughs> Both sides, they just say to them, "Ah, you're returning from your mission." Yeah, yeah. that he's like, <laughs> yes. It went yeah. well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It went well. Uh, and they both say, oh, it turns out my twin uh, died in an accident, so I can't possibly, uh, you know, I can't pretend to be oh, yeah, them. They, I, you know. Well, they both say, I was successful, I killed my twin, and I'm back. And then it's like, how long can I keep this going? <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be funny if it, it did that beat at the end of Thriller, where he just looks into the camera and he's got yellow eyes. <laughs> can I talk about oh, how... I was actually thinking about it different meme i was thinking like it could be because obviously the mission you know it's like oh shit you're in a lot of trouble at this point he's like i need to go to the bathroom and it's like in the simpsons when crusty toes a uh, fat tony he needs to go to the bathroom runs away and you can hear the sound <laughs> of the airplane <laughs> taking off <laughs> <laughs> do they do a he's bunch of it's like it's like they do car and then all the they taxi, do opening yeah. the door and then closing the door then getting in a car then driving to the airport and then the plane take it off and then i think it, i think it's it cuts to like nighttime off. Oh wait, or am I mixing that up with the McBain one? I can't remember. But yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, I'm trying of, to remember too. Bunch of sounds. Um, I think I remember yeah. saying him saying something to the effect of like, "Let's wait a little longer just to be sure." Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, I was gonna ask though. Can I can I talk a bit about how this scene goes down in the book, or do you guys not want to know? No, you, I think that's fine. Yeah, you, you, I'm sure yeah. you know what things not to say in case it regards anything. Yeah, like I, I, I'm only going to be talking about the brother versus brother fight. Mm -hmm. So uh, the interesting thing about it is it's this is one of the facts that's disputed by two of the different sources. And um, one, I think it was the the Sept, no, sorry, the Maester, that uh, his account says that it went down pretty much the way that it did here, except they just both kind of stab each other at the same time, like right away. And and but all the things that they said are like line for line almost. And in Mushroom's version, and Mushroom's like the jester dude, the little dwarf guy, he he says that they were like brother, like I will kill. It's like the total opposite, where they were like this was the the fateful battle between brothers who hated each other, and like one was gonna live, one was gonna die, and they both ended up dying. I always mm. thought that was kind of funny. Well, so um, that's the thing about what everyone has said. It's uh, the continuity isn't necessarily changed or broken because there are accounts of events. I do find that interesting, um, and Gary was saying it's it's way he way prefers this format for storytelling. I think uh, Ryan has said the same, but because uh, I, I mean I don't know if we've come across anything that we would have this perspective on in terms of like movies we covered on EFAP, but having a person telling the story and thus it means that none of it is concrete; it's just from poor memory can be pretty frustrating to get invested in, I guess. Yeah, like, is ever am I supposed to doubt everything that happens? Like, that's fun for a few things, but when it's everything, it kind of wears out its welcome. I, I think most of the events in Fire and Blood are are pretty clearly set in stone. The thing that's really up in the air is like the motivations and how how it exactly happened down to like the you know the events and dialogue and things like that. Yeah, um, you know, it's it's, it's an interesting comparison. It's just. Uh... It's not quite the same as like the Game of Thrones books, I guess, in comparison. What I was going to say, though, is uh, as much as we've been laughing a little bit, uh, it is a very fucking traumatic scene. Uh, really quite sad. Yeah, and... yeah it is. Oh, yeah, it's, tragic. Tragic. It's, an, it's, it's a fucking tragedy. Absolutely. Um, once again, watching both of them kill each other and then Rhaenyra's reaction, just utter dis fucking despondent dismay, sorrow, just this, why has any of this happened? There's plenty um, going on with this fight, like rampaging around in Rhaenyra's personal space, ostensibly, while yeah. she's helpless to do anything but watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so because the, the back door is the whirlwind, uh, sort of uh, back door's locked, and so they just have to watch and wait for one of them to be victorious. Because as the uh, as the other king's god said, he d he just doesn't know which one's which, so he can't really help. Mm -hmm. 
Which is <sighs> like, geez, what a <sighs> shitty position to be in if you're that guy, you know? Like, fuck me. Like, your job is to protect her, and there's these two guys fighting, and one's trying to kill her, and one's trying to stop it, and you're like, what do I- shit! Which gives us the Alicent and Otto scene, uh, next up. Which, uh, he says, it's ignorance and vanity, you know as well as I do, that Aegon needs to be kept in check, as does Sir Kristen, the two of them together. And then she says, uh, Kristen's devotion can't be questioned. But if it does come to war, and he says he's insured it, which um, I imagine he's obviously talking about the twin thing here because that's just a guarantee, which I think is interesting comparing his choice to do it uh, at the end of season one, a similar plan, but I have to imagine it's because he doesn't believe this will work. While it would have worked maybe before because it would have been complete surprise, right? They didn't even know that Viserys had died. Um so it's an interesting comparison that Otto would think this is retarded because all it will do is sort of add to their side of the, of the war, if you know what I mean. Like, they can claim, like, they sent an assassin in the night to kill me. Because um, mm -hmm. he just doesn't believe they would be successful. So that it's just like, yeah, the, the war is, is all but started. It just needs some kind of official push. Um, and he says, they wish now not for the good of the realm, but for petty satisfaction of vengeance. Which, uh... Yeah, it's just an interesting carving out of exactly what kind of character Otto is. Um, he says, so he's going to go to Old Town or we'll, we'll do, he'll be doing something in, um, I think, where the uh, the Tyrells in High Garden. I can't remember if that's called the Reach. Or is that the... Is it, how's your geography on this, Mark, Theo? Where, where, where are they at? I forget. There's all the, the Oh, I, I really fucked I up no my idea. geography earlier in the episode, so I'm too, I'm too afraid to say. I might be really wrong. Chat will help me out eventually, I'm sure of it. Um, but yeah, that's likely where he's going to be heading. And Otto doesn't show up in episodes three or four. It's, it's horrifying. It's, it's like, sad. You? why are we here? Um, yes, it is the reach. There you go. So um, yeah, he actually, um, uh, she, uh, Alicent says while he's gone, she's going to speak sense to Aegon. His blood will cool. And in time, Otto may yet be able to return. Like, clearly showing how much she's going to try and get this to work. She's invested in him and stuff, which I think he takes really well. And um, he takes her hand and says, The younger peacocks, all shrieking in feathers, but we will yet prevail and bring forth peace. I believe it, as long as you and I hold fast. And it's such a nice moment for them, but uh, something else happens. This, is, this has had a lot of discussion as to what exactly it means. She's, she like sort of tries to take a breath and chokes on it and says she's sinned and then he says i don't i do not wish to hear of it and uh she has a distinctly sad mm. reaction to that and leaves the room so what do you guys think of that uh i just, hmm hmm i got a few thoughts i suppose <laughs> it's like it's it's conflicting is that a case of it's it feels like this is a uh, for for as much as it was trying to be the, the both of them kind of mutually building each other up, that there's still that fundamental disconnect, right? Of of like she can't she, she can't talk to, to him. Yeah, she wants to confide in him. She wants to talk to and him. He won't let her. That... Maybe there is an element of it doesn't matter what bad you've done; it doesn't change anything. We still have to do what we need to do. So that... it almost Go seems ahead. to me, Otto, like misconstruing what she means there almost to me like she wants like absolution in essence but I, I, i'm not sure if that's the way he interpreted what she meant um so uh, the two big takes on this were one um he's once again in a moment where they've connected more than ever almost on the strategy and the assessing the situation and the fact that she's saying she's going to do what she can to get him back and that they're a team and that she feels comfortable enough to start expressing to him what she's failed to do as she, you know he is her father and he fails miserably and says nah i don't want to be doing that shit uh, I've, I've got enough on my mind the other interpretation is that she comes to him with this and he's saying to her by saying what he said whatever it is it doesn't matter there is no sin that makes it so that we shouldn't conduct the jobs that we're doing and that in a in a sense that is him reassuring her that you shouldn't you know take this to be what it is. I value the perspective. I think it's interesting, the second one, but I don't believe it for a fucking second. Um, 
there's two reasons. One, because of how I feel about Otto as a character and everything they've told us about him so far and the family dynamic that we have. But two, you guys remember what happens next? Um, specifically... Like the next scene. No, it... Um, the next scene is her going to Cole. The next... Well, yes. There's one scene in between, which is she goes oh. to Aegon's room where he's crying his eyes out and she does nothing. She just leaves. Oh, yeah. That, yep. That's... Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. So... Well, she does worse than nothing. Or, I mean... Yeah, I get, yeah you're right. I'm, I'm mixing it with some results. Yep, yep. You're right. So my... Uh, point of view on that means that yeah, that they had a really strong moment here and Otto could provide her desperately what she needs emotionally, but um, my take is that he's like, for fuck's sake just stop, I don't want to hear about how you've done stuff that's wrong just stuff it down and get on with your job, because ultimately we're pretty sure that he knows as well um, he, he picked up like hints and shit, and it's just like I don't want to know that my daughter is fucking up just, just get get shit done. You don't. We don't need to talk about it. Which to me lines mm -hmm. up perfectly with his parenting approach. Uh, you know, we just, we just don't, we don't do that shit. And then, of course, to show that scene right after, to me, is the 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 storytellers showing me that the consequences of his choice of parenting with Allison is now reflected down into who is the most powerful person on the fucking in the world. Which is that he, Aegon's actions are arguably a direct result of his inability to control his emotional state. He's not been shown level support in the serious aspects that he needs to be. And this is a perfect example. She is currently tumbling. She was not given help by her father. She sees her son crying his eyes out over the loss of his son. And she decides after a little bit of time to just... I can't deal with this. I don't know how to. I've got my own shit. I'm gonna go fuck Cole to feel better about my life. As we all would. Well, that's the thing. Um, I, I, I actually think it's kind of brilliant. Um, but I, I think I, so too. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't believe the interpretation that, that Otto was like, don't worry, you're okay. I, I don't even get that from what her reaction was. I feel like she was really upset with his choice to not help her out. And then to show her just doing it, the same thing to her son and then indulging with Cole. Because that's what this is, right? It's a vice. It's trying to escape from the reality that both of them fucking suck. Both Cole and Allison are doing this to feel better about their lives, even for a split second. They, um... Yeah, they both want to escape, and they both see relief in each other, just to just, get out of what It's just the feeling. peak of unhealthy. She's, like, hitting yeah. him. Yeah. <laughs> it's, so it's, it's so toxic. It's so toxic. It's It's like a... They hate fucking each other. <laughs> You're like, guys, yeah. maybe, uh... Maybe it's time for a change. I don't know. Um... He's got an addiction, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and of course... <laughs> This way of dealing with her uh, trauma, I guess, Allison, if it had come out in the sense of being able to discuss this with her father and him to uh, assure about the person that she is, this is just something that doesn't get offered between them. And like I said, it's been supported throughout all the stuff we've seen. Every scene that they share, it's never really a loving scene. It's always tactical. Mm -hmm. um, and then meanwhile, almost every scene with Rhaenyra and uh, her children, especially Jaceris, it's always very loving. There'll be mm -hmm. work to do, but there's always a sense of you know, respect. She really them. does care about them a lot, and she's willing to yes. take time out of her day to in ensure that. Which Especially when she... Episode 2. Carry on. I was just going to say that's the end of episode right. 2. <laughs> I, think I, I, think, I think episode 2 I like more than episode 1. I mean, yeah. I would say that I... The two scenes, the Rhaenyra Damon one and the Otto Aegon one, are fantastic. Um, hard to ignore, you know. I think I think it is better enough enough of the time. Yeah, same. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like slightly above, I guess. But uh, yeah. are they both are they both ranking as solid, or would you want to go up or down on that? I don't know. How does quite good compare to solid? Mm. <laughs> you know what? I don't know. I just made... Do, do I, I have definitions for I have tears? a bunch of positive and negative descriptors in my head, and I don't know how they relate to each other, you know? I don't know what would be up from solid or down from solid. Well, I'd say... It's bad is down from solid, but... I'd say that it's... Uh, when I say solid, I guess what I'm thinking about in my head is that these are absolutely... The, the kind that I was looking for could be better, for sure, but I'm happy. Um, yeah. 
the primary issues I took with both episode one and two, and we'll get to the the the, the kind in three. They're all like logistical fuck ups, and then there's one I would argue in Masaria. She's like a a character that's a fuck up almost entirely. The thing is, yeah, there's not much to lose the there because I've never liked her. I've always just been like, that's that's who she is, and now I don't like her because of how much the show is bending over backwards to take care of her. Yep, just uh, makes her more frustrating to keep around. I didn't yeah, get a so, chance to point it out, but someone in the chat said Rhaenyra kept her around because her plot armor could be valuable in the war. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, you're quite protected by the universe. If you could be on my team, that would probably be pretty useful. It's um, a shame about the twin getting discovered thing, because it, it feels like the writers were unnecessarily focused on having that, I guess, poetic beat of uh, Rhaenyra leading to her own um or like like she lets the girl go specifically so she can spot the guy and then that's what like ends up stopping it like this beat of Rhaenyra inadvertently protecting herself I don't think that was necessary to have and like the way like if they if the writers want to have it so the assassination gets stopped there's a lot of different ways you can do that and a lot of better ways like you can set up anything yeah potentially. um you have all the pieces that you need it's how they've been moved and interacted with one another that it it's disappointing you know they could do but you know they could do better so it's a, how did this kind of you almost want to say slip through the cracks if it weren't so prominent what the issues are you know how is this the way so yeah it strikes me similarly to Andor in that respect, where just from time to time, there's just a lack of concern for plot logistics. Logistics yeah. that a lot of people seem willing to say don't matter that much, but they're pretty important. You know, the, pot, the plot is a chain of cause and effect. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, a good... Start. The reason I'm saying it like this is because, I'm sorry chat, but I've come to realize that this took a little longer than expected, as does every single <laughs> fucking time we do anything. Doesn't it every yeah, single, yeah, yeah, every, every single, single time. time. I, Talking well, about genuinely. I mean, how long, do we, how long do we talk about Arcane collectively, like, all up, across those three streams? Was it like 30 oh, hours? <laughs> <laughs> that was a very, very, very long time. I don't know why, like, I delude myself all the fucking time. When I was writing the notes for this, I was like, you know... I think I think we'll probably get through. There's some scenes here that I don't even have much to say <laughs> I, about. So. Yeah, I... <laughs> yeah, that was like 20, 29 hours or so on Arcane, if you count the... 29? The Marcus one. Good I Lord. wasn't on those episodes, but I have spent a lot of time trying to talk people into watching Arcane, because I did love oh, it Oh, we also. loved it. Um, so, uh, this makes some sense, because it's the anti-Rings of Power, if you remember, and those we had, I want to say, that was two per episode, right? Rings two of Power? per episode, yeah. yes. And that's that probably going to happen episode. when that starts back mm -hmm. up as well. But, I, it was funny, this kind of presents an issue for me, because we've got so many episodes to do, and we're about to hit the anniversary, it's like, we've got to get them all out of the way, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> because yeah, next week is already booked, so, episode. it's like, when are you going to do the next two episodes of, uh... Uh, how's the dragon? It's like we'll figure it out. Uh, hopefully, obviously, we can get this this team back because I've I've thoroughly enjoyed talking this through. Um, we do a midweek pre-record, but I guess if everyone wants to be in chat, then we shouldn't. Oh yeah, they're gonna be mad if we suggest doing anything offline, right? Is, is that the idea to do it in the middle of the week? Before? Oh, so uh, like, well, yeah, first of all, because people are saying like, why not carry on? So Rags has got to go. Um, and then I do. We've... Yes, I've got a I've got to head out. I got family in town and stuff is happening, so I I. I need to, to go. And then, of course, we have uh, Mark is going to need to go yeah. relatively. Like, he won't be able to get through episode three. And let's be honest, all of us are probably going to want to discuss episode four. If, if, if I one have of to go to Toronto discussed. to meet a friend yeah. from Montreal. So uh, they, they, I, I would feel really bad if I was like, yeah, I'm not going to come. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, he drove like five hours. And so with that in mind, uh, it feels to me like it's just more appropriate to uh, pace them out. And someone just said, do the boogie one offline. As if... As if You'd forgive us if we did the boogie one offline. You say that, but you would be unhappy. <laughs> you would be you so would. mad at us for that. <laughs> you, you'd post all the Mola Rage emotes. You'd be you'd be doing that all day, every day. So, like, do not do not fret. You will get more hot D in future because I uh, it's there's only four <laughs> episodes out right now. So in theory, by the time we get around to the next set, 
we we we're slowly catching up. We can catch <laughs> in, up. In we theory. can catch up. Yes. In, yes. In theory, a game theory. Yeah. But yeah, we can. Um, I'll figure it out. I swear. But like I said, next week, which I'll be working on throughout the week now, is making a fucking compilation for us to. Res the, I was about to say respond to, but we also react to. Uh, with a whole team of boogie experts, they're going to be making a return. <laughs> boogie, bo <laughs> boogologists. <laughs> boogologists. <laughs> um, going to be very, very fun, I'm sure of it. But if you want to see, uh, you know, up-to-date coverage of Hot D, Gary is doing weekly streams in which I participate. Sometimes with a Shad, sometimes with a Frongo. Sometimes with, I'm not sure if other people are jumping on at some point, they very well may be, but also Ryan, we typically go for three hours and we just talk about the episode, so if you want to know what I consider to be the pros and cons of this stuff as it's coming out, you can check it out there, but for now, uh, you'll have to you know be satisfied with the first two and we'll do more in future, like I said, hopefully with this team if they're up for it. But for now, I we're feel probably... like episode four is going to be a long one like for discussion. Probably. I would imagine. Well, mm -hmm. and who knows by the time they hit five, six, seven, I imagine eight might. They've crushed a season of 10 into eight. So, you know, it, in theory, it would be more dense with um, events. But who can say? Um, uh, as per usual, really appreciate the, uh, you know, joining us for this long. Obviously, everyone yes, here. Thanks very chat. much, guys. And for sending us mm -hmm. the kind donations, we are getting to them. Me, Fringy, and Rise, you don't understand how we are, the we sheer are catching amount. up. Absolutely. Like, if I could try and explain briefly, uh, I'm doing with Fringy the, the Acolyte episodes, which in and of themselves just eat out two days of every week themselves to mm -hmm. get them done as fast as we do them. Um, so then, if you, you add that on top of, uh, I'm trying to work on getting us prepared for these EFAP episodes, which, depending on if it's a breakdown of, like, a TV show, it could be really long if they're hour-long episodes. Um, and then the organization for just launching all of these different things, as well as I'm, I, I missed when I was supposed to put out uh, uh, the latest EFAP movies. That will... <laughs> I said, this is so me. If Goga manages to remind me while I'm awake, I will get it out on time this time, this Wednesday. <laughs> um, you hear that, Goga? Your fault. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's uh, I think Season of the Witch is the next one with uh, I want to say which one's the one after that. It was in the trailer. You guys know, I'm sure. Um, it was. It's. It's, it's going to be Wednesday, and then yeah, we're trying to get the catch ups done. We've got. Another EFAP episode recorded uh, that was a really long recording, and it's a fun idea, I think, but I can't, I don't want to tell you about it until it's sorted out in editing so that I make sure. I literally say at the beginning, we don't even know if this will release. So that's another thing I'm working on. It's, it, what I'm trying to say is there's lots of stuff happening. We're trying to get to everything, it's all in a big queue, but for now, hopefully, you enjoyed a bit of, um, bit of celebration, a bit of positive coverage of, of media. Because, you know, yeah. you do it enough. Good stuff. Because we're, we're hot D enjoyers. Yes, we Liking definitely are. Yeah. Uh, we love hot D. Good D. <laughs> but before we go, uh, hey, John, do you want to tell people what you're up to, where they can find you? Uh, John Graham on YouTube, RB and the Chief, Heart Justice, my Halo Reach show. Um, yeah, I've been taking a break for a while, but I'm going to get started up pretty soon again. Mm. You've been uh, jumping onto some streams here and there, though, at least, right? Chatting with metal about things, mm -hmm. I would assume. Did you get to, did you just jump on the blade ones at all? Oh n no, I didn't do blade. Damn. They did oh, blade yeah, two. Are they going to do blade trinity? Blade. I'd imagine you you guys will. We are going to do blade trinity. I, <laughs> I'm I'm not looking forward to it for the same reasons. Hey, it's probably okay. <laughs> it's I probably, mean, that, that might be kind of interesting. It, it might been be a, a seat you like about it. it. Comic book movies have gotten pretty bad, so maybe maybe it'll be like Spider-Man 3, where you watch back and it's like, well, it's not great, but it's also better than a lot of stuff that's come out. Yeah, lately. bad <laughs> bad in the 2000s yeah. is a different kind of bad mm -hmm. to now. Different beast. Different yeah. beast. Yeah. But, uh, Blade 1 and 2 are awesome, though. I strongly recommend going back and watching those. They're great. They're both, yeah. they're both a lot of fun. But yes, a huge library to check out on uh, John CJG on YouTube. Mark, what are you up to lately? Where can people find you? I'm uh, chipping away at uh, the Radon fight because tomorrow uh. I'll be talking about Shadow of the Earth Tree on Metal's Forge oh, with Metal boy. and Theo. And I think we have another guest now, but I've not met him and I don't want to misremember his name and get it wrong. But um, Or her, actually. I've only seen text. But yeah, so that that's kind of the next thing I'm doing. I'm also working on a video of Hades 1 and 2, which are very good games that you should play. Oh, and um, you might find my voice in the first episode of the Hard Justice reboot. Oh, mm. 
as well, well, well as on this. Wow, <laughs> he did a really good job right. on that, by the way. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. I really appreciate yeah, that. Both oh, it was a great time. Mm-hmm. I uh, I was going to say as well that that might end up being one of, if not the most controversial Forge episode in history with uh, <laughs> the hot takes that are going to be dropping. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> It'd be interesting to well, check out. Are you going to bring on an Elden Ring lover? Is like, that gonna be happy to watch that from a distance. Oh yeah, <laughs> the fireworks. Um, you get, you're gonna you're gonna grab uh, an Elden Ring apologist, a, a dirty shill, someone who says, oh, "I like video games." It's like <laughs> loser liking. Gosh, get some taste of my things right. terribly. Which actually transitions so easily into saying, "Hey Theo, what are you up to?" Hey, you know me. Um, working on professionally hating Shadow of the Earth Tree. Um, <laughs> catch me tomorrow doing some of that on Metal's Forge. Excited to do that. That'll be cool. Wait. You're gonna you're gonna come in nice and that. calm, right? Nice and you'll be like, yeah. This oh. time I'm gonna I'm gonna be very clinical about it. Yes. Or at least I'm gonna try to be. Maybe I'll get annoyed, but you know what happens happens. All right. For the Elden sure. Ring fans in the chat, I'll likely be more positive. But uh, Theo is also not not wrong about much. <laughs> <laughs> when you say I'm gonna be more yeah. positive, I just picture Theo with the sus eyes. Like, yeah, you gonna? What well, are we gonna do? Is, uh, most really of my, my most of my defense is gonna be based in subjective experience more than what the actual game design is like, because I, I don't really disagree with Theo on any of it. I have some I have some cool ideas from the now almost completed script to demo in the in the forge tomorrow, so that might oh be my. fun. Well then, that all sounds very nice. fun. Plenty to check out while EFAP is not currently live, you see, because that is what trumps everything. But for now, I guess I'll say, uh, Rags, Fringy, anything you guys wanted to mention before we wrap up? No, I'm uh, just slowly working on some things in the back, um, and I really appreciate everyone being here to listen to us talk about stuff we actually really like. Yeah. It's always good, to, always good to do that. I guess you guys can look forward to the Acolyte finale this week. Woo! <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The EFAP TV Acolyte episode. Um, Fringy will be free. It's over so soon. Done. It's it's well, from, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we're far away from House of the Dragon somewhat. <laughs> um, uh. Yeah. Well, alrighty then. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for hanging out. And, um, well, well, we'll see you for the next thing, whatever it may be. But for now, bye-bye. Yeah, we'll bye. see you later, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye. 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 Oh, God.